You are looking at the world's most rockets and Orion spacecraft live on launch pad 39B. Artemis 1 embodies the hard work of thousands across the world determined to explore for the benefit of all. Welcome, and thank you for joining us live at Kennedy Space Center, where the energy here is palpable as we attempt to make history today. I'm Megan Cruz, and this is NASA astronaut Kayla Barron. Kayla, great to have you here again. So awesome to be here tonight. <laughs> well, uh, some of you may know this, but Kayla served as a mission specialist for NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 mission. It launched to the International Space Station in November of last year, and she lived and worked there for about six months. Today, I am thrilled to have her here with me to talk about this rocket behind us us illuminating beautifully the night sky here in Florida. Yeah, it's so awesome to be here tonight. When I first walked up and saw the view from the desk here, I was just blown away by how close it is and what an <laughs> awesome view it's going to be when we get to launch time. Yeah, it's a magnificent view, and I know you're especially excited about this because if we launch today, this will be the first launch that you actually see from the ground. Exactly. I, I've i never been able to come see a launch in person, <laughs> except for my own, of course, but that's a little bit different perspective. Very different, yeah. Um, but to be here for the world's most powerful rocket and the first test flight of Orion and SLS is just amazing. Yeah, so our two hour launch window opens at 104 a.m. Eastern time. So Kayla, tell everyone why are we returning to the moon? We are returning to the moon to learn more about it. The moon is a perfect place to learn more about our solar system, how the moon formed, but also how the Earth and the rest of our solar system formed. And we know so little about it. There's a yeah. lot to learn by returning there and doing some awesome geology work, but it's also the perfect proving ground for our continuation, exploring further into our solar system and eventually going to Mars. Right. We need to test all the operations concepts, all the equipment, habitats, rovers, suits, all of these things. And so it's the perfect place to test all of those things out and learn the things we need to do to do something that's almost hard to wrap your head around going oh. all the way to another planet. Absolutely. Really ambitious goals. And it all starts here with Artemis 1. So Artemis 1 is the f is the first flight test of NASA's brand new space launch system or SLS rocket. It's the world's most powerful rocket and will send an uncrewed Orion spacecraft farther around the moon than any of the Apollo missions before it. Artemis 2 will be the first crewed mission around the moon. And then Artemis 3 will use a brand new human landing system to bring astronauts to the surface of the moon. Future Artemis missions will dock to Gateway, NASA's lunar orbiting space station, before descending to the moon. So Kayla, what must we demonstrate with Artemis 1 before we put astronauts on board for those future crewed missions? This is our first integrated test flight of the rocket, the Space Launch System rocket, and Orion, the capsule that crew will fly in on Artemis II. And so it's really important for us to put all of those systems together and actually send them to do a mission, <laughs> test all those systems in real time, in concert together. We do a lot of testing before we get to this moment, before sure. we get to launch day, but it's not integrated and we're not actually putting the systems under all of the real world stresses they're gonna see. Right. So we wanna see the rocket perform, we wanna see Orion make it around the moon, uh, go super deep into space, and then come home and successfully re-enter. Re so sure. the, the heat shield that actually has to withstand the fastest and hottest re-entry we've ever seen in human spaceflight. So that's a big thing we want to see the heat shield perform successfully, and then of course recover the vehicle, right. test all of that. So it's a lot, but it's the important first step before we put crew on the vehicle. Yeah, lots of eyes on this one for sure. So tanking of the rocket began at 4.30 this afternoon. NASA's Daryl Nail is inside with the launch team and has some information about an issue they're currently working. Right, Megan, uh, the launch director gave the go for tanking shortly after 3 p.m. this afternoon. But as of right now, there is a red crew, as they are named, a specifically, specially trained team of individuals out at the pad, making an unplanned uh, change to uh, a replenish valve on the liquid hydrogen side. There are two technicians and a safety representative that are uh, right now uh, working inside the mobile launcher. It's in an open air area that uh, has a replenish valve that goes to the liquid hydrogen side of the core stage. Now this happened roughly or, uh, early earlier this evening, probably about an hour ago, uh, when uh, a leak was detective, uh, detected at the core stage liquid hydrogen valve by the launch team here inside firing room one at the launch control center. Uh, 
Unfortunately, the team here was unable to uh, remedy the leak remotely, and so it became necessary to send a crew of individuals, called the Red Crew, out to the launch pad to make a hands-on uh, fix, so to speak, to that valve. What they're doing is they're torquing down bolts that are on the valve. They believe that uh, by torquing these bolts down, uh, they'll get a better seal on that replenished valve, and that should remedy the leak. The leak was detected by uh, the hazardous operations team here inside the launch control when the percentage of hydrogen went above 1%. Now that's significant for this particular area because it is an open air uh, location, uh, the skid valve that runs uh, the uh, liquid hydrogen uh, uh, into the core stage. And um, we had reached replenish when this leak was detected. Over on the liquid hydrogen side, of course there's two tanks on the core stage, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Um, both had been uh, topped and gotten into replenish uh, when this leak was detected. Currently, liquid oxygen is topped off and stable in replenish, but the liquid hydrogen is in stop flow at the moment, which will prevent them from proceeding forward with a launch um, until that leak is remedied. Again, this red crew is uh, inside the area inside the blast danger area, working inside the mobile launcher, torquing down those nuts um, that are associated with the replenish valve for the liquid hydrogen side of the core stage. Of course, we'll keep you updated on uh, the operation. In the meantime, I'll send it back to Megan. Thank you for that update, Daryl. And yes, we uh, are looking forward to your next uh, uh, update as to what happened with the red team out there on the pad. Now today will be our third opportunity to launch Artemis 1. The launch team called off the first two attempts due to issues while loading propellant into the rocket. The team addressed those issues and planned to try again in September, but then Hurricane Ian made landfall here in Florida as a strong Category 4 storm. Satellite imagery there shows us the storm went right by launch pad 39B. Thankfully, the rocket was safe inside the vehicle assembly building at the time. The team rolled the rocket back to the pad two weeks ago and it stayed there through Hurricane Nicole, which made landfall last week as a Category 1 just south of Kennedy Space Center. Teams inspected everything after the storm and confirmed they were ready to try and launch today. Now, Daryl is one of a team of people helping to bring you today's uncrewed flight test. We have Jasmine Hopkins nearby, also inside with the launch team, who will interview some key players in our return to the moon. We also have Leah Cheshire inside Mission Control at Johnson Space Center. Dan Hewitt with a new tool we're excited to show you. Leo Martin at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. And finally, Brian Sizik with the U.S. Space Force Monitoring Weather. With one hour, 54 minutes until liftoff. How are we looking, Brian? And you showed we had certainly had some interesting weather here in East Central Florida over the last several months, but I'm happy to report we're not looking at any type of satellite imagery like the ones you just showed. Overall, weather is looking quite favorable as we head throughout the countdown and into the launch window. So here's what we're looking at right now, really just one area of concern. That's these upper level clouds that are moving in. So there's a cold front in the Gulf of Mexico right now. That's producing some showers in the Gulf, but those are not expected to get to us uh, by the launch window. But they are, the upper level winds are bringing in some cirrus clouds that are moving in. Now they're high enough and thin enough where they're really not going to be a concern. For it to be a thick cloud layers rule violation, they'd have to be a lot thicker and a little bit lower in the atmosphere in order to hold a charge. So that's what we're looking for uh, in these lightning launch commit criteria, not just natural lightning, but rocket triggered lightning potential as some of these clouds can hold a charge. A rocket can actually induce a lightning strike in an in a atmosphere that's not strong enough to produce a nat natural lightning strike. So that's really what we're watching. But right now, weather is go. These clouds, as I said, are high enough and thin enough where they're really not going to be much of concern. But we are going to be watching it. My colleagues, Melody Lovin, Mark Berger, and the rest of the launch weather team will be watching this very closely as we head closer to T0. So let's take a look at the graphic. Uh, the latest briefing at 90% go. Really the only concern being the thick cloud layers rule and a very small concern for the cumulus cloud rule. But overall, the weather is looking favorable. As I said, right now, weather is go. Those clouds are high enough and thin enough where we do not expect them 
to be a concern. So I'm happy to report a very favorable launch forecast as we head closer to T0. Megan, back to you. Don't you just love hearing 90%, you know? That's wonderful, it's especially here odds. in Florida. You know what I mean? Weather can really be uh, tricky <laughs> here in Florida. So 90% is perfect. Now, Florida Space Coast has been the primary launch site for NASA's crewed missions for the last six decades. First Apollo, then shuttle, the commercial crew program, which Kayla flew up as a part of, and soon Artemis. Let's go now to NASA's Jasmine Hopkins. Thank you so much, Megan. We're here in the Launch Control Center amid all the excitement in Firing Room 2, and I'm so glad right now to be joined by our Kennedy Space Center Director, Janet Petro, and our Deputy Director as well, Kelvin Manning. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. We are so glad to have you. This team has overcome a lot to get to today. Uh, we are no stranger to storms on the Space Coast. We overcame Ian, and then Nicole, Janet, how did we embrace the challenge? <laughs> That's my line, Jasmine. Yeah. <laughs> I gotta say, I couldn't be more proud of the team out here here, everything we did to get to this point, and then to have those uh, two storms thrown at us uh, at the last minute, uh, Nicole, all the um, evacuations. As you know, uh, one time we remained um, uh, at the pad, and the other time we had to roll back to the VAB. But I got to tell you, across the workforce, whether it was our program people, um, across the agency, our institutional support organizations, they all came together and worked as a team. And so here we are tonight, looking forward to a great launch. Right, we're a very strong team, and we have been at this for, for years, for decades. We started off during the Apollo program, but now we've evolved into what we're calling a multi-user spaceport. Kelvin, what does that mean? So when we were getting ready to retire the space shuttle, a lot of people thought we were going out of business, literally shutting down. But our leadership team, we had a vision to create what we called a multi-user spaceport to become the world's premier government and commercial spaceport. And so that's happened over the last 10 or so years, probably a lot faster than um, we thought it would. But right, if you would say, uh, you ask us, well, what's the future look like? I'll tell you, we're just getting started. Right, the future is very bright for us. And this is a really big day for NASA. I mean, Artemis launched, but an even bigger year for Kennedy Space Center, the Diamond Anniversary, our 60th anniversary. Janet, how have we commemorated that big milestone? Oh, we've had a whole bunch of celebrations all along this year. As you know, Kennedy became a center back in 1962. As you said, we've been celebrating all year long. And I can't think of a better way of culminating our Diamond Anniversary with a launch of the Artemis for the Artemis generation uh, later this evening. Right, that is so exciting. And what does it mean for both of you to be leading the center at one of our busiest cadences we've ever seen? We've had over 40 launches this year alone. What has that been like? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna get past 50 tonight, I think. Uh, uh, but for me, it's a, I'm incredible, incredibly honored to be leading this team. It really is all about the team and the workforce. We have such a highly skilled, a highly dedicated, a highly motivated workforce. We have an incredible mission, and we all come together and embrace the challenge and make things happen. Right. Yeah, it is a privilege to work here, and it's not about us. Like Janet said, it's about the people. It really is. It's about this great team. Janet, Kelvin, thank you both so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Jasmine. Go thank Artemis. You. Yes, go Artemis. go Artemis. Absolutely. Megan, back to you. Great to hear from them. So one hour and 48 minutes and counting uh, till our two hour launch window opens. We heard uh, Dale report out that there is a team at the pad working an issue. So why don't we go back to him now to see if he has an update for us? Yeah, Megan, now uh, continuing to track the red cre crew's work at the launch pad. This is a specially trained team of three individuals, two technicians, one safety representative who are currently right now inside the mobile launcher at the base of the launch pad. They are doing work on a replenish valve, currently torquing down the bolts in order to remedy a leak in that replenish valve that was detected a little over an hour ago. Now this is significant because currently with a leak, they have had to go into what's called stop flow on the liquid hydrogen tank of the core stage. Normally under replenish, they continue to flow liquid hydrogen into the tank as it boils off in order to maintain a level of around 100%, but that has uh, been in stop flow. And so at this moment we are slowly losing liquid hydrogen in the core stage hydrogen tank. The red crew went in and is currently working a little longer than expected on the issue. It was estimated that it would take 15 minutes to do the work, but as we're now finding out, uh, the red crew is torquing down the bolts 
and then backing out of the area and allowing the launch team to cycle the valves to test to see if they've got that leak fixed. So as they do this, it will, we understand they will cycle this work, um, go in, cycle the valves, torque them down again if it continues to leak, and then back out and test the work. And this may continue until they have it fixed. The red crew going on, onto the launch pad isn't uh, a totally uncommon uh, occurrence, certainly new with the Artemis program, but uh, uh, work like this was done in previous space programs. The red crew is specially trained for this work. They are accustomed to working around in hazardous operation. Uh, especially a fully tanked rocket. Again, we are tracking Red Crew's operation out at the pad. Uh, it's expected that this will eat into the launch window, which currently we have liftoff at 1.04 a.m. Eastern Time, but the window runs two hours to 3.04 a.m. Eastern Time. Again, monitoring the Red Crew's work. We'll have more updates for you a little later on. For now, back to you, Megan. Thank you, Daryl. Some quick programming notes. For the first time ever, we are broadcasting a launch in 4K. You can watch it on NASA's YouTube channel or check your local provider to see if you have NASA's UHD channel. The audio of our broadcast is also available on the local amateur VHF and UHF radio frequencies you see at the bottom of your screen. So if you're here along the Space Coast and interested in that, make note of those frequencies now. Or you can watch today's launch with live commentary in Spanish. That broadcast starts at midnight on NASA es in Espanol's YouTube page, which we're showing you now at the bottom of your screen. Now, Kayla, why did NASA choose the name Artemis for our return to the moon? Well, in Greek mythology, Artemis is the twin sister of Apollo. So it's really a connection back to the Apollo era, the amazing things we did as part of the Apollo program. But we wanted to give a nod to the future. You know, sure. it's, a, it's a new set of missions. We're here with new objectives. Um, so it's a connection to the past with an eye towards what we might do as part of the Artemis generation. Yeah, let's talk about what those uh, future ambitions might be. I mean, landing the first woman and first person of color on the lunar surface, that is a worthwhile ambition. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think we've come a long way since Apollo in so many ways in the space program, but one of the ways we've evolved is our astronaut corps more closely reflects the nation it represents now. Sure. So those crews will be more diverse. Um, and we think those diverse perspectives, not only in our astronaut corps, but our larger team only make us a stronger one. Yeah, all right. Well, coming up, uh, we are going to hear from some of the Apollo astronauts uh, and learn more about what we will accomplish for humanity by going back to the moon. We'll meet some of the women shattering glass ceilings to bring Artemis to life, including NASA's first female launch director. We'll also show you the space launch system up close and what happens when the cutest group of visitors gets the surprise <laughs> of a lifetime. Plus, we'll take you around the world to show you how people are marking this historic mission. And Kayla and I will also take your questions live. You can send those our way by using the hashtag Artemis. Uh, we already have some questions from some celebrities. I know you're going to love these <laughs> questions. So you're going to have to keep watching to find out who sent those in. And we also invite you to share your moon-inspired content using the hashtag NASA Moonsnap. Here's a sample of some that's already been sent in. This one's beautiful. The flower in the foreground there, um, the, the uh, moon in the background illuminated so beautifully. Here's an awesome one. It looks like we have an eagle here flying over the moon. That just beautiful. It's been really cool to see all these artistic submissions. Oh yeah, really creative. And we're going to compile as many as we can and, and show them later on the broadcast. Now let's check back in with Daryl. We do like to check in with him as much as possible to see if we can get any updates from the launch team. Go ahead, Daryl. Yeah, Megan, we just saw um, the red team give a thumbs up to the camera. Um, as they are doing their work out at the launch pad. Currently, they are torquing down some bolts to the specification uh, required in order to try and stop uh, what has been described as an intermittent hydrogen leak in the area. It went above the 1% threshold, and so that is a uh, violation uh, of the has gas limit in that area. Uh, the team continuing to work as you look at the rocket on the pad. Uh, they were called out to the pad about a half hour ago, and uh, they appeared to be making their way, um, at least have stepped back, back from the area of work uh, the way that the 
workflow has been going is they uh, torque down the bolts, step back a little bit, the launch team then cycles the valves to check to see if the leak is still there, and then they come back in, and this has happened a couple of times, and start torquing the bolts again. The rocket was uh, nearly fully tanked. The core stage was in replenish for both hydrogen and uh, oxygen. The upper stage had nearly been finished when the leak was detected, and the countdown, though it is continuing, the rocket, uh, the leak had to be uh, addressed in order for uh, the launch to proceed. The replenish puts the hydrogen back into the tank after it boils off, and so currently we're in a stop flow uh, which uh, no long longer allows a replenishment of the hydrogen tank, and that would uh, not allow us to have uh, a launch uh, without uh, those tanks being in total replenish and also in a vented configuration, which has also uh, been put on hold. I'm sorry, not a vented configuration, but rather an engine bleed um, has been stopped. And so that would need to continue as well in order to get the engines conditioned for launch. That's the latest uh, here from uh, Firing Room 1 at the Launch Control Center. Megan, we'll send it back to you. Thank you, Daryl. One hour, 41 minutes until, again, the uh, planned start of the uh, two-hour launch window. Uh, right now, let's head over to the Apollo Saturn V Center at Kennedy Space Center's Visitor Complex, where NASA's Dan Hewitt is just inside in front of a Saturn V rocket, which is the only vehicle to date to carry humans beyond low Earth orbit. He's going to show us what... Uh, he has behind us there the moon board. It's an interactive tool. Yeah, thanks, Megan, and welcome everybody. We're in the Saturn V Center, fitting that the rocket that carried astronauts to the moon of Apollo is just over our shoulder as we meet the rocket that's going to do it with the next generation under Artemis. So SLS, the Space Launch System, is out on the pad right now. It's on the mobile launcher. Before we jump into that, just to give you some perspective, so that valve that Daryl's been talking about is in the base section of this mobile launcher down here. That's different from the areas we were focused on in August and September in these 33-foot-tall uh, tail service mast umbilicals that are delivering the hydrogen and oxygen to the uh, core stage of SLS. But let's jump right in. A couple of key components to SLS. We're going to start here on the sides with the solid rocket boosters. If they look familiar, they're derived from those that flew the space shuttle. In fact, some of the segments of these boosters today were flown on previous space shuttle missions. We call them solids because of the type of propellant inside. If you were able to look in, you would see a mix of ammonium perchlorate, aluminum powder, and a binding agent called polybutadiene acrylonitrile. That's your expert vocabulary word for the day. Now, as these are firing, they're providing more than 90% of the steering and 75% of the thrust as SLS makes its way uphill. And those are attached to the core stage. 212 feet tall, five major sections. We're going to start at the fun part down here on the bottom, four RS-25 engines, again, derived from those that flew the space shuttle. In addition, we have this core engine section here where we have all of their necessary plumbing, also the connection points where we're feeding uh, the propellants into the core stage itself. And as these are firing, each one providing up to half a million pounds of thrust during operation, consuming 1,500 gallons of propellant every second as they go uphill. Now, these are liquid rocket engines, which means you need a fuel, about half a million gallons of liquid hydrogen, and an oxidizer, about 200,000 of liquid oxygen up here. That hydrogen gets fed through feed lines down at the bottom of the tank here. The oxygen coming from these two feed lines you see running down out of this, the intertank section. The inner tank also has the upper attachment points for the solid rocket boosters. The bottom attacks, attaches down here at the engine block. Now all the way up top, we have the forward skirt, it's where you have your core avionics, your brains for flying SLS, as well as connections to the mobile launcher uh, and some antennas. And if we zoom in, why does it look all bumpy? We have a spray-on insulation on the core stage. These propellants are stored at cryogenic temperatures, hundreds of degrees below zero Fahrenheit. And so we have to try and keep them as cold as possible. Now, underneath this upper skirt, we have the second stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. This is a modified upper stage from the Delta IV family of rockets from United Launch Alliance. Single RL-10B-2 engine, 
also propelled by liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. This is used for our in-space propulsion maneuvers. Critically, that translunar injection, which is going to give us the energy to go beyond low Earth orbit and head out to the moon. Altogether, that's the space launch system. It's going to be making its first flight, hopefully today. It's going to be a heck of a show. Let's get back to the countdown. I'll send it over to you, Megan. Thanks, Dan. One hour, 37 minutes and counting until our two-hour launch window opens tonight. The Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft together standing just taller than the Statue of Liberty at Launch Pad 39B. It's the culmination of years of development and thousands of tests. Here's a look at its path to the pad. The Space Launch that had enough energy to make sense to do the mission that we've been asked to do. We're moving from low Earth orbit, like um, you see in the International Space Station today, to moving beyond that, to taking the next step in exploration. It's 322 feet tall. It's got 700,000 gallons of cryogenic propellant in the core stage alone. It can produce 8.8 .8 million pounds of vacuum thrust. The Space Launch System is really a national rocket, a national asset too. We have worked with contractors as well as with our NASA experts, our science and engineering department, our safety and mission assurance team. To get the Space Launch System designed, developed, and produced, it has taken thousands of companies across the country. It comes together by train, it comes together by plane, it comes together by barges. So all of that culminates at the Kennedy Space Center for the launch of the first Artemis mission. Everybody has worked together to ensure that we have a safe and reliable rocket. At NASA, safety and testing is extremely important because ultimately this rocket isn't meant just to carry cargo, it's meant to carry people. It takes all types of education, all types of backgrounds, all types of diversity to do the things we do, and it'll be great to see a diverse crew land on the moon. Where the Space Launch System comes in is providing that reliable transportation so that we can start flying these rockets on a routine basis to take people and to take payload to that outpost, the moon, and also the gateway system. We have a generation who've never seen deep space exploration, and this will give them an opportunity to see that this is something that they can potentially do themselves. It's going to be a paradigm shift for NASA. We're going to be back to looking at things that nobody's ever done before. A lot to look forward to, and it all begins with launch. Afterwards, our friends at Johnson Space Center in Houston will control Orion once it's on its way to the moon. Let's get an update of operations there with NASA's Leah Cheshire. 
Thanks, Megan, and welcome to Mission Control Houston, home of the red, white, and blue flight control rooms. But today we're in the white flight control room, which is just across the hall from where you usually see us in the International Space Station flight control room, like this morning when we uh, conducted a spacewalk outside the space station. Now, this white flight control room has been used before during some space station missions, plus commanding Boeing Starliner. Previously, this room was used for space shuttle missions and was renovated in 2014 to support our use with the Artemis program. Today's flight director is Judd Freeling, a flight director of 11 years who will lead the team through the ascent portion of the mission. After Freeling's shift today, flight director Rick LeBrode will lead the team through the rest of the mission all the way to entry and splashdown when Freeling will step in again. Other console members will be monitoring the various systems on Orion like propulsion, solar arrays, and trajectory, and they arrived on console about five hours ago. And you might also be surprised to learn that there is indeed a Capcom or capsule communicator on console today as well. While there are no crew on board, Jay Marshke and other capsule caps Capsule communicators will be training throughout the mission in preparation for Artemis II and beyond. The Capcom is the single person in the room who speaks with the crew, gathering info from mission control team and keeping streamlined communication with the astronauts in space. We're counting down to liftoff when teams here will really jump into action and monitor the first Artemis flight, sending Orion further than any crew-rated spacecraft has gone before. But for now, Megan and Kayla will send it back to you at Kennedy Space Center to keep walking us through the events of the day. Well, you just heard Leah remind us that no one is inside Orion today. Again, it's because Artemis 1 is a flight test to prove we can safely return crew from lunar orbit on Artemis 2. And when we launch the first crewed mission, NASA has a very diverse and talented core to choose from, including Kayla here. Uh, we're looking at video now of some of your friends who got to go to the pad. That looks fun. Yeah, it's always so exciting to see the rocket on the pad because you know you're getting close to launch. Um, so we're all just really excited to see how this test goes today. I wish I could have gone out there with them. You <laughs> and me, what happened? We didn't get our invite. <laughs> and I thought this was fun too. Uh, some of your friends also got to fly over the pad in T-38s. Here's video of that now, incredible video. So these flyovers were common during shuttle, right? Yeah, and we still try to do them whenever we can. We actually use the T-38 jet as a training platform. It's mm. a chance for us to practice making real world decisions in a high risk environment, practice working as a team in a good analog for space flight. Okay. But we also like to fly by the pad when we can, when we have a rocket out there. It's a way of saluting and thanking the team for all the work oh. it took to get to this moment. That's great, yeah, a worthwhile thing to do because yes, the team has worked so hard to get to this moment. And you spoke about training. Has training already started for Artemis II? for you guys? We're, we've been developing the training, but the uh, crews aren't assigned yet. Mm -hmm. So they're not in dedicated training flows yet. But our team at Johnson Space Center, where we train for human spaceflight, are working on all of the things that we're going to need to teach the crew and the best ways to go about that. Once we get that crew assigned, they'll be straight into training right up until launch day. Awesome, cool, cool, cool. All right, I can't wait to hear who gets assigned. And the absence of crew today doesn't mean Orion is empty. There are plenty of other interesting things flying on Artemis One, including several technology demonstrations and science investigations we're gonna show you throughout the broadcast. There are also some mementos like these seeds that we have right here, right Kayla? Yeah, we have an example of the moon seeds that will be flying as part of this mission today. And the idea actually comes from an Apollo 14 astronaut, Stuart Rusa, who flew seeds with him to the moon, hundreds of them, and then brought them back to Earth. And then they were planted all over the country and the world, and they're called moon trees. And so we're kind of carrying on with that idea on Orion for this launch. Yeah, I love that. And the, the seeds that are flying on Artemis 1, it's going to come back and they're going to distribute it uh, to a number of organizations through NASA's STEM program. So it's really a neat idea. And so these moon seeds are part of what's inside Artemis 1's official flight kit, along with more than 10,000 other mementos, like this Artemis, this Apollo 8 commemorative medal you see here, a nod to 1968 when humans first orbited the moon, and a bolt from Apollo Apollo 11, 1969, when humans first landed on the moon. Those items are on loan to us from the National Air and Space Museum and once back on Earth, will be exhibited there so you can check them out. There are also a variety of flags, pins, and patches like these Artemis 1 patches that will be distributed to people who contributed to this flight. Now, NASA spacecraft, both crewed and uncrewed, have carried mementos like these since the 1960s. Astronauts are also allowed their own personal flight kit. So I was wondering, what did you bring with you for your Crew 3 mission? 
Um, I actually brought a couple of examples to show you. The moon seeds inspired me to share that I actually brought some vegetable oh, seeds with awesome. me. Oh, that's awesome. So these are kind of fun. I, they're dragon themed. So I got dragon carrots and dragon beans. Oh, that's Since awesome. I went up on a SpaceX crew dragon vehicle. Sure. Um, and then of course, I think the most important, meaningful thing to all of us is usually pictures of our family and friends. So yeah. um, have oh, like a picture family. of- Yeah, me and my family at my sister's wedding. Um, friends backpacking in Alberta, um, Canada, and then my my in-laws <laughs> um, <Right side up. laughs> together on a family vacation. And I also brought some flags, some American flags, and then United States Navy flags since I'm a Naval officer. So things like that, I, I think it's just so human to want to bring yes. stuff with you, right? Souvenirs, who doesn't yeah. love that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think for most of us, yeah, pictures of our family and friends, things that connect us back home are the most important. Yeah, you know, six months might not sound like a long time for people, but it, it is, right? Wouldn't you say and you're also so far it's nice to have those tangible things that remind you of home. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, really important for us. Cool, cool. Thank you for bringing those. It was really fun to look at. All right, one hour, 27 minutes and counting until uh, launch. And we have our first questions from social media. So let's take a look at the clip here. Kayla, you're going to notice a familiar, um, handsome face. <laughs> hey there, I'm Chris Evans, and I play Buzz Lightyear in Pixar's Lightyear movie. I was wondering, when we fly future Artemis missions with astronauts, how many people can fly on board the Orion capsule at once? My nephew's probably asleep, but he's a big Bud Slayer fan, oh. so he's probably going to enjoy watching that question tomorrow. But oh. we, we can get four astronauts in the Orion space capsule. Um, it's about it's a little bit bigger than the Apollo capsule, about 30% more habitable volume. And oh. so instead of supporting three crew for about two weeks, Orion can support four crew for about 21 days. Okay, good, good first question. Let's take a second question now. Can a microbiologist be an astronaut? Absolutely, <laughs> and we already have microbiologists who are astronauts, like my training classmate, Zena Cardman. Um, so yeah, we, we hire people from all sorts of different backgrounds. All you have to do is have a STEM degree. Hmm. Beyond that, you, you can come from any pathway. So some of us are military astronauts like me, either aviation or I'm a submariner, but we have a ton of people from different scientific and engineering communities, including hmm. microbiologists. Yeah, I love that it's so diverse because I, I think diversity really adds to, to what you guys can do. Yeah, and those unique perspectives, I think, make us stronger as a team whenever we're tackling a new problem. Having people who, with different, not only academic backgrounds, but the all of these scientists, a lot of them have different field experience. Mm -hmm. So like Zena worked in some really extreme environments in Antarctica, in caves, doing a lot of her research. So it's not that different than what we're hoping to do at the South Pole of the Moon. So th Very these true. perspectives are really important for us to form the best team that we can. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, I think we have time for one more question, so why don't we pull one up. What is the coolest part about Artemis to you? I mean, I think I can't even quite get my <laughs> head around the, how it might feel for the crew to orbit the moon on Artemis 2 and see it up close. And then of course on Artemis 3 to actually land on the moon and conduct a moonwalk. It's just going to be incredible to have that view back of our home planet. And so just the thought of human, sending human beings back to the moon, it's just super exciting for all of us. I honestly didn't know how you're going to answer that because there is so many things to look forward to, to pinpoint, you know, the thing that you're most excited about. I thought that was going to be a hard question actually. <laughs> All right, so great questions. Keep them coming using hashtag Artemis wherever you're watching this broadcast and keep sending those moon inspired content too. Uh, again, that's hashtag NASA moon snap and we're going to show some of them later in the broadcast. Okay, one hour, 24 minutes and counting until hopefully liftoff of Artemis 1 and it's time for another update with NASA's Daryl Nail who's with the launch team as they were monitoring a leak. Yeah, that's right, Megan. We're inside uh, the firing room number one here at the Launch Control Center at the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, currently we have an update on that red crew, which went out to the pad to torque down some bolts on a leaky hydrogen replenish valve for the core stage. And that update is that the red crew has departed the blast danger area. They have completed their work. They got the go at 10 p.m. this evening, 10 p.m. Eastern time to go out and uh, conduct work that uh, took roughly uh, an hour from the time they were given the go till the time they left the blast danger area. The uh, technicians, two technicians and one safety representative uh, did the work out at the pad on the replenish valve. And uh, now that they are on their way back, 
the team is now examining uh, the work and whether or not that uh, leak is uh, still there. What we do know is, uh, you may have heard me mention that uh, this put the liquid hydrogen tank into stop flow and as a result also stopped a required 90 minute engine bleed for the liquid hydrogen side. Teams have come to the conclusion that only a 45 minute bleed is required at this point. They can resume the bleed at the point that they left off and it'll be um, enough to meet that requirement for launch. You're looking now at a graphic where we're tracking the core stage fill rate. We did this earlier this evening. Uh, took about four hours and 20 minutes to fill the core stage. You can see on the left that the core stage liquid oxygen is at 100%. That's the same for the upper stage and both are in stable replenish. As you can look to the right though, you can see that we're at 97% for liquid hydrogen. The reason for that is because when we went into stop flow, that means that the replenish was no longer uh, refilling the tank and that liquid hydrogen was boiling off and uh, draining some of the capacity out of uh, that particular tank. So we've lost some liquid hydrogen. The plan is to resume, of course, uh, the filling of liquid hydrogen, which goes into that uh, into the liquid hydrogen tank on the core stage and then vents out on that flare stack that you see the right where uh, excess hydrogen is burned off. That's the latest here from Fire Room 1. Megan, we'll send it back to you. Thank you, Daryl. All right, let's go back inside our Apollo Saturn 5 Center now with NASA's Dan Hewitt. We last sent humans to the moon using the rocket behind you. Can you show us how we're going back now with Artemis? Absolutely, thanks Megan. So Artemis 1 is going to take us from planet Earth around the moon and all the way back and I'm going to show you every step of the way. Like every great space mission, it starts with a launch. In this case, four RS-25 engines, two solid rocket boosters ignite, sending SLS and Orion into the sky. On the way uphill, we'll have a number of jettison events, things coming off the rocket. One of the most visible, these two large solid rocket boosters a little over two minutes into the flight will break away. We'll also have the launch abort system come off once we're high enough, and then three fairings, which are protecting Orion's capsule and service module during the flight through the thicker parts of the atmosphere. Now, after the core stage has consumed its propellants, we'll hear Miko main engine cut off. Those four engines will cut off, the core stage will drop away, handing over propulsion duties to this, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. Its first job is a perigee raise maneuver. Perigee just means the lowest point of your orbit. This will give us a nice circular path for Orion around our planet. While it's there, we can really check the spacecraft out, make sure everything from electrical systems, guidance, navigation and control, communications are all functioning before we commit it to heading to the moon. And we do that with this the translunar injection. This will be about an 18 minute firing on today's timeline. And this is done to give us enough energy to get out of low Earth orbit and make our way to the moon. Shortly after that, the ICPS will separate. It'll do a disposal burn, sending it around the moon and into an orbit around the sun. But from there on out, propulsion duties get handed over to the European service module. It's gonna make a couple of outbound trajectory correction burns on the way out critically testing that orbital maneuvering system engine, that large one on the very bottom, that's gonna be needed when we start making our maneuvers around the moon to get into what's known as distant retrograde orbit or DRO. To do that, we're gonna do the outbound powered flyby, dipping in about 70 or 80 miles off the lunar surface, really pushing with that large engine. That's gonna slingshot us around. We're gonna do a final orbit insertion maneuver, and then we will be in DRO, distant retrograde orbit, this dotted line right here. Distant, we're about 40,000 miles off the lunar surface and retrograde because the moon orbits the Earth in a counterclockwise fashion. We're gonna be going clockwise opposite retrograde. It's a very stable orbit, doesn't require a lot of energy to maintain your space there, really lets us put Orion through the paces, learn about using this spacecraft in, in deep space. But eventually it'll be time to come home. We'll fire up the engines once more, do a departure burn. This is what commits us from departing the moon and heading back home. We'll dip in close to the surface once more for the return powered flyby and execute correction burns on the return transit as we target a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. 
Before that happens, the spacecraft separate. The European service module's job is done. It drops away to burn up, revealing the heat shield. This is goal number one for this flight, is testing that heat shield at lunar return velocities, because when we hit the upper atmosphere, we're going to be moving more than 20,000 miles an hour, heating that up to more than 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So really need to make sure that that can withstand that heat of reentry. After it makes it through, parachutes deploy, Orion splashes down in the Pacific, a Navy ship and other recovery assets are standing by to pick it up out of the water and bring an end to the first mission in the Artemis program. So that's all still going to unfold. It all starts with launch today though, so let's get back to the countdown. Over to you, Megan. Our return to the moon would not be possible without our partners across the country and the world. So joining us now is Frank Davina, head of, of ESA's European Astronaut Center. Good evening to you. Good evening. <laughs> well, so I want to ask you, talk, talk to me about Airbus and how that company and ESA contributed to the Orion spacecraft. Well, uh, Airbus is of course the, the lead uh, manufacturer and uh, integrator of the service module of our Orion uh, capsule and uh, that will fly to, to the moon. So this is a very important part of course because without the service module it's clear that uh, we would not get uh, <laughs> to the moon or would not be able to return from it. So it's a very important part for, for ESA but there, of course there are industries across Europe, not only Airbus, but across Europe that are contributing to the service module uh, in Italy, in France, Belgium, uh, uh, really, it's a really European project. Yeah. Frank, we've been close partners, NASA and the European Space Agency, for decades now, and partnering on things like the space station, scientific exploration, and of course, commercial crew missions. Matthias Maurer, ESA astronaut extraordinaire, was on my crew, Crew 3. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about what makes these partnerships so important? Well, it's important, uh, these partnerships, because uh, we want to do sustainable exploration of the moon. We want to explore space on a sustainable way. And I think partnerships in, in that sense are essential. Uh, one nation alone, could they do it? The U.S. maybe, yes. Europe certainly could not participate to a lunar program by themselves or could not do it by themselves. Uh, but I think if we do it as a partnership, uh, we can go a lot further, we can do a lot more. We can leverage technologies, we can leverage talent uh, in all these countries uh, across the globe that can really push the, the partnership forward. So looking ahead to future Artemis missions, we're going to have ESA astronauts on board those. Have you guys begun preparing for that training, anything like that? Uh, we have actually started preparing already for uh, lunar uh, missions, uh, surface missions. We have a program called uh, Pangea in uh, ESA, uh, which is basically uh, there are Na NASA astronauts uh, participating in, mm -hmm. in those trainings. Uh, Stephanie uh, was just over with us uh, just one week ago uh, doing field trips. Uh, and uh, we are actually starting to prepare to see also which technologies do we need to use that we can at the best possible way to science on the moon because of course we just do not go there uh, to walk around or do two things we want to do uh, real science we want to do discoveries uh, we want to live there for a sustainable way so which these technologies do we need and that we are actually starting already uh, in the European Astronaut Center the, we actually started already more than five years ago oh, wow. developing this uh, this training program so so yes we are involved again together with our NASA colleagues and colleagues from the the international partners to start preparing crew to really do a uh, sustainable surface exploration of the moon. Yeah. And you guys are doing more than just crew, right? You, you guys are contributing to the Artemis programs in other ways? Uh, we are uh, contributing to the Artemis program in, in many ways. Of course, the service module uh, that we will see uh, launching here hopefully uh, today is the, is the biggest part today. Uh, but we are looking into a lot of uh, other uh, capabilities. First of all, there is the gateway. Mm -hmm. Uh, that will be a, a real element to enable the sustainable exploration of the moon. We have uh, the communication system on the gateway, we have the IHAP, the habitation module, we have ESPRI, which is a refueling module, uh, which is essential uh, if you want to sustain the gateway there for a longer period of time. Of course, you need to be able to, to refuel the, the system. So these are essential elements, again, that ESA is, is providing. Uh, we're also providing uh, small technology uh, experiments, uh, radiation, 
aviation, for example, will be very important. Uh, we are looking in crew exercise device for the great way. We are crew looking into to medical systems. So these are also small components, but for the crew that are very important because we need to keep the crew healthy there, of course. You're a great uh, partner. You have so much that you're contributing. Oh, we, we really uh, appreciate it. We have a lot <laughs> that we can uh, contribute. And, Thank you. And of course, in this ministerial, because we have now our ministerial conference coming up next week, where the big decisions are going to be made for the next uh, decade. And there we uh, will propose a European lander that will bring logistics uh, to the moon. And this uh, logistics capability that is, will be a big part of the integrated Artemis program will allow us to have European astronauts actually walking on the moon. So wow. that is uh, awesome. really uh, interesting for us. Wow, Frank, thank you so much. And we continue uh, to look forward to the contributions that we can make together with this partnership. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And uh, good morning to the viewers in Europe. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, and, and speaking of viewers, we have a, a ton of people out here on the, uh, along the space coast of Florida watching today's launch. So let's head on over to NASA's Leah Martin. She's over at the Visitor Center with a whole bunch of excited people. <laughs> Oh my goodness, Megan, you know, this normally is a time of night that people are winding down and getting ready for bed, but there is not a single person here who has sleep on their mind. It is everybody is so excited on the edge of their seat, trading stories, talking about previous launches and being excited for this one. And I'm actually joined here by three women who um, are thrilled to come out and watch tonight's launch. What does it mean to be out here and see this historic launch tonight? It's an amazing moment. I grew up on the Space Coast watching launches, and so to be out here tonight, it's incredible. It's an amazing feeling to be out with all of these people celebrating, and we're super excited to be here. And Isabel, I know that you said that you have been having your eyes on this launch. You've been watching on the previous attempts. What does it mean for you to be here tonight? Well, yeah, this is our third attempt here. Uh, we were here for the first and second here at Banana Creek, so we're really excited. The energy out here is electrifying, and we can't wait to see this thing go off. Now, this is the first of a series of missions that are becoming increasingly more complex. What are you most excited about for the Artemis missions? Leah, I am so excited to be here. I just feel so honored because, as you know, this isn't just a momentous launch for humanity as a whole. It's so important for gender and cultural minorities across the globe because Artemis is landing the first woman and the first person of color on the surface of the moon. This is this generation's Apollo, and so all of the people who who didn't have the opportunity to live through Apollo and be inspired by that, have the opportunity today to witness it. And I'm just so grateful to be here. I can't wait to see the positive impact. One more question. Uh, this is going to be something that you guys, I'm sure, will remember for your entire lives. Are, how are you uh, marking this? Do you have any special plans of capturing these memories and being able to pass them on to you know people in your life? Um, well, my son is growing up here. I didn't grow up here, and so he's going to grow up here on the Space Coast, and I just can't wait for him to just grow up with the Artemis missions. Well, Megan, we're out here. We have our eye to the sky, and we can't wait to see it go. Back to you. Really great interviews, and wow, I saw that drone shot that we had showing all of the bleachers filled with people there to watch the launch. That was incredible. If you're just joining us, welcome to NASA's live launch coverage of Artemis One, our return to the moon in almost 50 years. I'm NASA's Megan Cruz, and this is NASA astronaut Kayla Barron, who flew on NASA's SpaceX Crew-3 mission and returned home earlier this year after living and working on the International Space Station for about six months. I got to ask you, how was that experience? It was incredible. <laughs> we had such an amazing time up there. The Expedition 66 crew was awesome. I've been saying since I got back that we're the happiest crew in the history <laughs> of the space station, and nobody's been able to really challenge me on that yet. You guys look very happy in that oh, photo. Oh, man. We, we were just like a family up there executing an incredible mission, some amazing science experiments. We got to do three spacewalks. Uh, it was just you couldn't have planned a perfect first mission for me, Matthias and Raja, and of course our veterans up there, Mark and Tom. We just, it was, it was amazing. We had an incredible time. Yeah. Wow, look at that photo of you in the cupola. That is amazing. Yeah, the views are beautiful. It's just like every time you look out the window, it takes your breath away. Wow. And now here you are adding some valuable insight into Artemis One. This is our third opportunity to launch NASA's brand new space launch system rocket and Orion spacecraft. This is an uncrewed flight test to pave the way for future crewed missions, starting with Artemis Two. And Kayla, you could be chosen to fly on some of those future missions. How does that make you feel? 
Uh, honestly, it's a little unbelievable to me. <laughs> I like could barely imagine what it'd be like to go to the space station until I did it. And just thinking about what it would be like to look back at the Earth from orbit around the moon or even standing on the moon kind of blows my mind. Wow. So, yeah, it's hard, hard to even imagine that that's true. But it's a really special time to be at NASA and an even more special time to be in the astronaut office. Yeah, that's a beautiful picture of you seeing the moon, right? Yeah, that's a sort of a moon spotting adventure there. I've <laughs> got binoculars. Um, one thing that's really cool about seeing stars and the moon from orbit is you're not looking at them through the atmosphere. So you get these very clear views oh. and the moon is always super spherical. You never get these like sort of slices that look kind of flat from Earth. Uh -huh. Up there, you see it in 3D, it feels like. Wow. Um, so yeah, we I think we all sort of fall in love with the moon from space in a whole new way. Yeah. Well, today's launch attempt comes amid a very busy year for us at NASA. Some of the highlights include two more commercial crew launches with SpaceX, Crew 4 in April, you're seeing there, and Crew 5 last month. In May, NASA and Boeing flew OFT-2, the second uncrewed flight test of the Starliner capsule. The goal is to certify the capsule for regular flights to the International Space Station after a crewed flight test next year. In July, we released the first images captured by our James Webb Space Telescope, and wow, they are magnificent. Pictures like these could help us answer some of astronomy's biggest questions about how our universe began. And then in September, we intentionally slammed the DART spacecraft into asteroid Dimorphos and successfully changed its course. The asteroid wasn't headed for Earth, that's important to say, but the test was to show that we could defend our planet if needed. And recently, two other missions that benefit the Artemis program. Last week, we tested a new inflatable heat shield that could help us eventually land humans on Mars. And just two days ago, Capstone arrived at its intended orbit around the moon. The small satellite launched from New Zealand in June and will now test the unique lunar orbit for a future space station there. You heard us talk about a gateway. Now, Kayla, what do you think about all that NASA is accomplishing? I mean, those are all just amazing examples <laughs> right? of why it's such a <laughs> cool time to be part of human spaceflight and the larger space program. We're yeah. learning so much, not only about our home planet, but our galaxy and the universe. Like those James Webb images just capture my imagination every time they release a new set. Yes. And so it's, yeah, we have a lot going on and a lot to be excited about right yeah. now. I hope people are following along for it because it is truly great and, and we want people to, to share along with that. So, all right, one hour, six minutes and counting from liftoff of of Artemis 1. Let's head back to la the Launch Control Center with Daryl Nail. Yeah, thanks, Megan. And uh, so we got an update for you now. The Red Crew, of course, completed its work on torquing down the bolts for that replenish valve on the core stage hydrogen side. And now we are back in replenish for core stage hydrogen, which is good news. The team now looking to work on that upper stage. And we understand for the update uh, to the NASA test director, uh, they just informed uh, the NTD that they can uh, start getting back uh, the flow on the upper stage as well. It went into a stop flow uh, roughly around 10 p.m. Eastern time after a leak was detected. You can see the core stage status there. Uh, the liquid oxygen side is in stable replenish both for the core stage and the upper stage of the rocket. Over on the right side, you can see we've lost some hydrogen since going into a stop flow that uh, allowed some liquid hydrogen to boil off uh, during about an hour or so while a red crew was sent out uh, to the launch pad to make repairs. Now the hydrogen bleed for the engines was reestablished and it looks like the team is back on track to recover that uh, after a stop flow halted the bleed. They are required to bleed that liquid hydrogen through the RS-25 engines for 90 minutes, but they're picking up where they left off, and that appears to be on track. In the meantime, we've had an update from the range, and the range has informed the NASA text director that currently at the moment, if we were to launch now, they are no-go due to the loss of signal on a radar site. That's currently being worked right now. Again, the range advising the NASA test director that they are no-go. Uh, the range is not clear for launch until they remedy that issue on their radar site. And so we're also tracking that. In the meantime, 
We started this at uh, 3.23 p.m. Eastern time. Got the course stage tanked in about four hours and 23 minutes and now looking to get everything back on track to try to make that launch window at 1.04 a.m. Eastern time, which has a two hour window associated with it uh, all the way to 3 a.m. Eastern time. That's the latest from the firing room. Megan, back to you. Thank you, Daryl. Now, there may not be astronauts aboard the Orion spacecraft for this flight test, but there are some passengers there with very important missions. Inside the Orion spacecraft, as we fly around the moon, we have some cool experiments going on to help us understand what the environment is like. Although there's no humans aboard Artemis 1, we do have a few special passengers aboard that will help us pave the way for future Artemis missions. So there's basically three occupants riding. You can kind of think about it like three astronauts. We have a moonikin. We will also have two torsos that are learning about the moon and learning about the environment for our astronauts before they go. We have a mannequin on Artemis 1. We call him our Moonikin uh, for short. That Moonikin is called Commander Moonikin Campos. The name is actually in homage to Arturo Campos, who was an important person who helped bring the Apollo 13 capsule home. The Moonikin will sit in the commander's seat and it will wear a suit just like our astronauts will wear. Munikin Campos is actually weighted to simulate an actual human aboard the Orion spacecraft. So it will help us understand what our astronauts will experience as they go to the moon and home. The Orion Crew Survival System suit and the Orion seat were designed simultaneously to fit together as a seamless package. The actual design of the suit was built into the Orion seat, such that when they're in the suit, in the seat is a true cocoon of protection for them. During this test flight, the seat will actually be instrumented with accelerometers. Sensors that tell us how much the chair is shaking during launch and re-entry, and how many G-forces or gravitational forces it experiences. We expect Commander Munich and Campos to have a very exciting ride on his way to orbit. The thrill of launch, the experience of weightlessness, the excitement of landing. What we learn on Artemis 1 with our mannequin's assistance will help us better understand how a human will actually behave in the seat, both for landing and for launch to allow us to ensure their safety. In addition to the Munikin, we'll have two seats that have basically what's like a human dummy, an upper torso that are detecting how much radiation they're experiencing. It's called the Matryoshka Astrorad Radiation Experiment, MARE. MARE is an international collaboration with German Aerospace Center, DLR, and with Israel Space Agency. The MARE experiment consists of two anthropomorphic phantoms called Helga and Zohar that are simulating a female body in a space radiation environment. One of those will be wearing a safety vest. The Astrorad radiation vest. That we hope will help protect our astronauts from radiation. Each one of the two phantoms will be equipped with about 20 battery-operated radiation instruments. So between the two, we'll be able to determine how well we can protect our astronauts from radiation events. Space radiation is a mix of high-energy, heavy-charged particles that originate from the sun. To put things in perspective, one year of Earth exposure to cosmic rays is equivalent with one day of space radiation exposure in deep space. The purpose of the MARA experiment is to learn more about the radiation exposure as well as the biological effects of different organs. So basically it's like we have three occupants inside Orion that are learning about the moon and learning about the environment for our astronauts before they go. Going back to the moon with new exploration goals and new technologies will help us gain better understanding of the challenges we encounter with deep space exploration. We will have to develop new technology and solutions to meet really difficult challenges. But that's what NASA does. That's what Artemis is all about. And we have one more passenger to tell you about. It's everyone's favorite beagle that's had a special connection with NASA ever since Apollo. Artemis is NASA's plan to go back to the moon, and Snoopy is to be the zero gravity indicator. A zero G or zero gravity indicator demonstrates the moment that the crew in the spacecraft reach weightlessness. Snoopy is about to take his first trip around the moon. The relationship with NASA and Snoopy goes back about 50 years since the Apollo days. He was the face of the safety campaign, the icon 
for NASA's culture of safety and mission success. So NASA and Peanuts have a Space Act agreement. And we collaborate together on STEM content. And we really were excited when it was decided that Snoopy would be the zero gravity indicator on Artemis One. We wanted to go all out, so we created a custom Snoopy. And the spacesuit is actually made out of material worn by the NASA astronauts. Everything was done with extreme detail. They cut patterns for his suit, even how his collar worked and how the NASA Meatball logo looked. We're very excited. I'm personally very excited. I can't contain the excitement I am feeling about this day. Snoopy is going farther in space than he's ever been before. This is a day that we've all been waiting for. It's, it's fantastic. And we snapped this picture of Snoopy and Orion. He's comfortable and ready for his journey to the moon. Lucky for us that Snoopy has this twin that's staying here on Earth. That way we can take a closer look at how cute he is. <laughs> and this orange um, suit, I mean, it is amazing. It's actually uh, the same material that would be worn by Artemis astronauts, right? Yeah, you know, the suits we'll be wearing in Artemis ultimately are an update of the suits that the shuttle crews wore. That, they're this iconic orange color. Um, and we've updated them, though, for with new technologies and also new crew capabilities so that they can best protect the crew and our return to the moon. I actually got to work with that suit team before my oh, assignment. That's cool. And so the suit's kind of near and dear to my heart. Yeah, I think we have a picture of you wearing the suit as part of when you were helping to design it, right? Yeah, so I was our representation from the crew office, from the astronaut office, to the engineering team that's working on putting the suit together. So I got the chance to wear it for some of the early testing, um, and it, it is an amazing suit, and it'll protect us while we're in the vehicle. Cool. So what was your uh, zero-G indicator? Yeah, like the video mentioned, we always choose stuffed animals. So <laughs> we actually had a turtle. We named her Fowl, which is German for peacock. Um, and we cho chose that because Raj and I are from the turtle training class. So we thought it would be fun to have a sea turtle Aww. as our zero G indicator. But we wanted to have a nod to Matthias, who is a German astronaut, so that's what we gave her a German name, and uh -huh. Tom, who's from the peacock class. So she's peacock colored, and it kind of worked for everybody. I was about to ask, I was like, wait, why is it German for peacock, but it's a turtle? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now I get it. Was it was a, you know, diplomacy, crew diplomacy <laughs> Now move. I get it. So we had turtle, we have Snoopy here. Why is it always toys? I think the tradition goes back to crews taking stuffed animals from their children and sometimes flying the stuffed animals of their kids. Mm. Um, that still happens to this day when a crew selects a zero-g indicator, but they're convenient because they're nice and soft. So if you're going to allow say. something to bounce around in the <laughs> capsule, you want to make sure that it won't hurt the crew or any of the equipment. And they're cute. I mean, yeah. come on. Who doesn't want Makes a mascot? Makes you smile, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, NASA's workforce has changed over the last 50 years. For Artemis One today, women make up 30% of the launch team. But when we first stepped on the moon with Apollo 11 in 1969, take a look at this picture here. You see this woman highlighted near the center there? That's going to be Joanne Morgan, and she was the only woman in the firing room. She now has a special message for the Artemis generation. Hello, I'm Joanne Morgan, and I am so excited for Artemis One. This flight test will bring new knowledge to people on Earth, and I'm thrilled to see such a diverse team at the LCC making it happen. Firing Room One is a different site today than when I was on console for Apollo 11. I was totally focused on doing my job and never thought about being the only woman in the room. Today, women at NASA are center directors and launch and flight directors and have substantial roles in engineering, science, and technical areas. This is so important for a new generation, the Artemis generation, to see how individuals are leaders and contributors to the mission, and for youth across America and the planet to see this as well. After 50 years, it is gratifying to see this change, and I can't wait to see what you all accomplish together New century, new generation, new mission to the moon and beyond. Godspeed, Artemis team and Artemis One. I think it's so great that we know she's following along and interested in this mission too. 
Yeah, it's so awesome to see the women who have come before us at NASA and paved the way for a much more diverse team to contribute to these amazing missions. Yeah, and speaking of women breaking the mold before serving as a NASA astronaut, I know you were a naval officer and a member of the first class of women commissioned to the submarine community. How amazing is that? I mean, what would you say as you look at these pictures, what would you say to women, young girls who might be thinking, hey, I might want to join a predominantly male field? Yeah, you know, I was just really lucky to be in the right place at the right time. I was a senior at the Naval Academy when they announced that they were going to change the policy and allow us to serve aboard submarines. But even before that change happened, I knew that I was passionate about serving in that role and I was dreaming about it. So I think allowing yourself to really examine what your passions are and be brave enough to dream that you could actually yeah. do those things. I had awesome mentors who encouraged me along the way and told me never close a door on yourself. You know, you always want to put yourself in the roles you're most passionate about, especially if you're going to challenge yourself. Doing something you love that's yes. hard is so much better than doing something that you're not as well suited to. So I was just lucky I had some awesome leaders in my life who encouraged me to be brave enough to dream so that when those opportunities presented themselves, I was ready to take them on. Yeah, no, that's great. Having mentors is always so important because yes, yeah, sometimes you don't know what path to take, especially if you're blazing your own. So it's always so nice to have somebody to, to talk through some of that. So. Absolutely. 52 minutes until the opening of the two hour window for Artemis One today. Once it soars off the launch pad, our colleagues over in Houston will take over. Leah, how are things looking in mission control right now? Hey Megan, I'm here now and thanks for joining us again here in the white flight control room here at uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center. So you might be wondering why Johnson Space Center will control the flight of Orion after liftoff, even though it's launching at Kennedy Space Center. And that's all about how our flight control centers are designed. Launch control is at Kennedy while mission control is in Houston. And we also have the SLS Engineering Support Center at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Ever since the Gemini 4 mission in 1965, all flights have been commanded from Houston after launch, so we have the infrastructure and the experience here at Johnson Space Center to work through long duration missions with, or in this case, without crew. Additionally, launches must be conducted over water rather than over populated areas, which makes Kennedy Space Center a prime location. Again, we're ready to jump into action once SLS takes flight and this room will be staffed around the clock until Orion splashes down at the end of the mission. We're excited to continue that work today with Artemis One and throughout the Artemis program. But for now, we'll turn it back over to you, Megan and Kayla. Now the fully stacked SLS and Orion system was rolled from the vehicle assembly building uh, to the launch pad about two weeks ago. We captured this video of the four mile nine hour journey. It took a special transporter and a special team of people to make it happen. Hear from them what it's like to shoulder the weight of this moment. Uh, the crawler transporter is a, it's a machine that goes and picks up the mobile launcher, the SLS rocket with Orion, it's basically the cornerstone of the mobile launch concept. Without the crawler, you couldn't transport the mobile launcher and the vehicle from the VAB to the pad or the pad back to the VAB. And it was designed and built for the Apollo program to move Saturn V to the launch pad. Um, since then, we've modified it and used it to move the entire shuttle program. And after the shuttle program, we did extensive modifications and now it's to be used to move Artemis to the launch pad. The crawler is 136 feet long from end to end. It's 114 feet wide from the edge of the truck to the other edge of the truck. It weighs 6.6 .6 million pounds. It has the power to do two miles an hour, but you never want to go that fast. Generally, we're around 0.83 for SLS. Artemis will be one of the heaviest loads we've ever carried and one of the tallest loads we've carried. I am exceptionally proud of our team. They're very talented, they're very committed, and they're, they're just all around good team. I think uh, we'll, any problem that crops up or anything that comes up, we'll fix it and we'll get moving again. And again, it starts right here with the crawler. So if we do our job and everybody else does theirs, man, we're gonna have a successful launch. We're going back to the moon. This is gonna be just fantastic. Such an impressive team and, and the crawler, Kayla. I mean, this is a certificate from the Guinness Book of World Records. 
Yeah, it's pretty cool getting the recognized for the heaviest self-powered vehicle in the world at 3,106 tons. That's amazing. That's amazing. I know, I know. We were just talking about how awesome uh, the crawler is. I mean, it was retrofit. It was it was created in the Apollo uh, for the Apollo uh, uh, missions, and it was updated, modified for shuttle, and now it's been modified for Artemis. It's just really a, an amazing machine, and the people who uh, um, keep it maintained and operate it. Like, I'm so glad that we could feature them today. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we are 48 minutes and counting, again, from that opening of the two hour window we have today. Kayla, if you thought you were excited, you have got to check out this video here. This is really cool. We got some children that are on a bus and they're going to come here to the vehicle assembly building and the administrator and I are going to jump on the bus and surprise them. We're going to give them the opportunity to come in and go up the elevator with the rocket. Wow! Wow! It's so cool! Hello! Look at that! Oh, that's awesome! Hey guys, would you like to see a moon rocket? because it is the future of our country, and indeed the future of the world. Uh, and we saw what our space program does for science and technology and engineering and mathematics. We saw that in the Apollo generation. All right, guys, what do you think? What I hope to achieve today is uh, inspiring a new generation. I mean, the more people that we can get to see up close and personal this rocket, it, it just, it's awe-inspiring. And I cannot wait till the launch. When America sees our rocket actually launch on a test flight to the moon, you know, it's just gonna spark a whole new push for what we are doing. Best day of my whole life ever. It's gonna be incredible. It was a dream come true. This rocket is definitely going to the moon. I think it's really amazing. And I was actually really excited because I've never seen a rocket like this close up. Now we have the Artemis generation. This is a new generation of us going back to the moon to learn and live, and then we're going to Mars. Artemis! I told you they were so excited. They're so cute, their faces, it was amazing. I think my face looked pretty similar the first time I walked into the VAB and looked up at that rocket. I mean, the building is huge and standing at the base of the rocket just takes your breath away. The scale of it, you know, 322 feet, especially stacked on its end like that is just amazing. So yeah. I almost relived my first time in the VAB <laughs> through their eyes. And it was really cool. There was this opportunity where they got to just ask any questions they wanted. I was there, so they were asking me questions. They were asking the administrator, um, uh, Bob Cabana as well, and they just, hands shot up. They just had questions. And then sometimes I didn't really know the answer. And they're like, well, it's this. And I was like, oh my God, they know so much and they're so interested in it. I mean, again, this is why we're doing this. This is this is part of the inspiring the next generation. Absolutely. Whenever I get a chance to interact with, with kids, kind of of any age, all the way from elementary school up through college, the human spaceflight program and Artemis in particular, I think really captures people's imagination yes. and gets them interested in everything it takes to do something so daring and mm -hmm. so complicated. Yeah. And actually before we move on, an interesting note about the opening music in that video, it's an original composition called the Artemis Generation performed by the Cooper Middle School Band percussion section of McLean, Virginia. And to continue to inspire the Artemis generation, NASA invited students to take part in a national essay contest, challenging them to imagine what it'd be like to lead a week-long mission to the moon's South Pole. Here's the first winner now. I gazed out of our moon pod window just before it was time to exit. My crew of three and I had been working for years to get here. Our crew consisted of a botanist, an engineer, a doctor, and me, an astrobiologist. We'd been picked because of how well we got along together, with our complementary STEM backgrounds and our naturally upbeat personalities. Houston, this is Artemis Crew 1, initiating airlock sequence, I said over my microphone. 
becoming the first woman on the moon. Our purpose was to set up a moon habitat containing the four things needed to keep a crew safe. Oxygen and clean water, a waste disposal system, the veggie project for food, and a protective outside shell made of regolith and mycelium. We will build it over the next week, and it will be used by other astronauts for years to come. Embarking on this incredible adventure, I couldn't help but be grateful to be given this opportunity to lead the most remarkable crew, and to know that I was a part of the Artemis generation. So that was beautifully written by Taya Sauer of Laguna, California, uh, and she was one of three essay winners. The two others were Austin Pritz of Walcott, Indiana, and Amanda Gutierrez of Lincoln, Nebraska. If you want to check out their essays, you can scan the QR code you see on the screen. Uh, the three of them beat out nearly 14,000 students who submitted essays, so you definitely want to check out the other two, again, by scanning this QR code. So right now you're looking live at uh, right outside of Kennedy Space Center's visitor complex. We have uh, plenty of bleachers set out to accommodate, as you can see, a lot of guests that are hoping to see uh, the launch today. So why don't we go in there and check back in with NASA's Leo Martin. Hi, Megan. Yeah, this place is filling up. You can feel the excitement, people chattering, people sharing stories, people talking. And, uh, you know, we just heard about those uh, Artemis Moon Pod essay winners who are part of the Artemis generation. Also joining me tonight from the Artemis generation, we have two students who were actually able to come down and visit at Kennedy Space Center to watch this launch live tonight. I'm joined here by Denim and Allison. How does it feel to be here tonight? Um, really, I was just, when I first found out, I was really nervous. I didn't really know what to expect. Like, we really just looked at each other and we kind of screamed. Yeah. Just out of excitement? Yeah. How did you feel? Honestly, it was, like, amazing. It was surreal. Like, that we have this opportunity out of so many people who applied for this. It was, like, outstanding. And you guys actually got to take a tour of Kennedy Space Center a little bit earlier this week. What was something that you got to see that was just really outstanding? I think it was the shuttle experience, like, how it is when the rocket ship goes on up with people in it. It was honestly really fun doing it and learning, like, how they feel at the moment. And Denim, what do you think it will be like to watch the world's most powerful rocket launch tonight from just across the river? Well, really, I don't really know what to expect because I've never really done this before, but I, I feel like it would really be outstanding. I might shed a little tear, but um, I don't really know. Like, I was just, I'm really excited to be here, and I just... It's amazing, like. It is amazing, and I don't think you're going to be the only one shedding tears tonight. <laughs> Megan, we're super excited, eyes on Artemis, and we're ready to see the launch. Thanks so much, guys. Now, Kayla, are you ready for more questions from social media? We're getting them in. Always. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the screen now. We have another celebrity question. Hey, I'm Kiki Palmer, and I play Izzy Hawthorne in Pixar's Lightyear, and I can't wait to see Artemis One launch today. How will going back to the moon pave the way to Mars? Thank you, Kiki. <laughs> yeah, what an awesome question for tonight. I mean, the return to the moon is going to give us a chance to test all of the capabilities we need to operate on Mars. Mars is really far from yes. home. <laughs> it's going to take us six months just to get there, and that's with ideal planetary alignment and expected advances in propulsion technology. Then we'll spend about a year plus on the surface before it's send, you know, six months home. And so the moon is a lot closer. We can get there in three days. The communications delay is a lot shorter. Mm -hmm. And so we can really test our operational concepts a lot closer to home. The moon's super far away. It's 250,000 miles, but that's way closer than Mars. So it's going to give us a chance to test all of our technologies so that we know what we need to develop in order to take that next step. Yeah, it's a, we call it the next giant step for a reason. Mars yes. is very, very far, like you said. All right, let's take another question from social media. Kayla, what inspired you to be an astronaut? 
you know, my journey was a little bit different than some of my colleagues. I didn't grow up specifically dreaming of becoming an astronaut. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the barrier was there. I was aware of and inspired by the space program, but I never allowed myself to dream of becoming an astronaut mm -hmm. until I had served on a submarine, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I think that operational experience that's so similar to what we do in the space program, if you think about it, we're sending humans to live, work, and do something of importance in a place where people aren't supposed to be, sure. the depths of the ocean or the vacuum of space. And so I think those experiences gave me the confidence to even dream that I could become an astronaut mm. and then inspired me to apply in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't deter you again, like being in a place where, yeah, we're not supposed to be a confined space at that. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, those parallels, The I, I got a chance to meet an astronaut after serving on my submarine, mm -hmm. Kay Heyer, who's also a Naval Academy graduate, class of 1981. And hearing about her experiences working on the space station really made me click. All of a sudden I said, this, the space station's a submarine in space. Yes. And it sounds silly, but I never made that connection before. And once I did, I just couldn't stop dreaming about it. Oh, that's so cool. I love that your story isn't, uh, uh, you know, the typical one, as you said. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Ha, is Snoopy <laughs> ready and excited? <laughs> of course, I think like any crew member, Snoopy's been training for this moment. <laughs> he knows what to expect in a nominal and an off nominal launch and all the actions expected of him. So like any good crew member, he's ready to go. And he has a suit that's been tailored to him. It's especially made for him the way that the uh, astronaut suits are especially made for them. So yeah, I think he's ready. Yeah, <laughs> seeing the moon up close, he's ready to go. So keep those questions coming. Use that hashtag Artemis and tweet or drop them in the comments wherever you're watching this broadcast. And don't forget those NASA moon snaps. Uh, hashtag NASA moon snap for your moon inspired content. Okay, we are now 37 minutes from the opening of our two hour launch window today. Let's check, check back in with Daryl uh, with the launch team. Yeah, we've had a couple of issues that the launch team has been working and uh, we have an update on both of those. First of all, uh, is the leak, the liquid hydrogen leak and the replenish valve out at the mobile launcher. We understand from the launch team that that leak has not recurred. The work that happened out at the pad is that the red crew uh, and the work that they did out there remedied the leak. That's good news. And now the liquid hydrogen tank on the core stage is back in replenish at this moment. And the upper stage of the rocket, liquid hydrogen side, is in fast fill. You can see from the graphic there that we are back up to 100% over on the liquid hydrogen side on the right hand of the screen. On the left hand of the screen, uh, you can see we have been in stable replenish for liquid oxygen. Now, with regards to the range, they reported that they had an issue to the NASA test director with their radar site, later found out that that was actually a bad Ethernet switch uh, that was uh, cutting out and not providing them the data. The range reported that they will swap out that bad switch, and uh, they're currently working on that. They advised at the time, about uh, a half hour ago, that it would take them about 70 minutes, or about 25 minutes into that work. They did uh, just recently update the NASA test director to say that uh, it's going to take them a little bit longer because they're going to need to re-verify this Ethernet equipment uh, once they have it installed. Again, that work is ongoing, but at the moment, if we were launching right now, the range is no-go as a result of that bad ethernet switch. The Dolly Lou file, which uh, helps uh, steer uh, the space launch system through the upper atmosphere has been uploaded uh, to the rocket. And so we're good to go there in terms of other configurations that are ongoing. But we are continuing to monitor communications of the launch team about holding to the top of the window, currently slated for 1.04 a.m. Eastern time. But we do have two hours and we have yet to see uh, whether or not the launch team has, is uh, going to be able to uh, make enough adjustments in order to hit the top of that window. No slip yet, but we're monitoring their work, and we'll give you an update when we have it. Back to you, Megan.
Thank you, Daryl. Really great news about uh, that leak. Kayla and I actually said, wow, that's really great news. So we'll uh, wait on your next update. Let's go back live now to Kennedy Space Center's visitor complex where uh, we have NASA's Dan Hewitt inside there with our new moon board. Dan, let's focus in on Orion now. It has three main elements, right? That's right, Megan, and Orion is the spacecraft that's going to be carrying our Artemis astronauts off of planet Earth and then returning them home. As you said, three major components, so we'll jump in here at the top with the first one, the launch abort system. This is a critical safety feature on Orion, designed to pull the capsule away from the SLS stack in the event of an emergency on the pad or the way uphill, and it does that using three solid rocket motors. The first one, the abort motor, can fire within milliseconds of automatically detecting an issue, pulling the capsule away to a safe distance. After that, the attitude adjustment motor. This one will fire. We can cancel out any rates, put us into a nice stable glide before we get ready to fire the jettison motor. This is the one that will actually take the launch abort system off of Orion, allowing it to then deploy parachutes and parachute down to safety. I will note the jettison motor, the only one that fires no matter what on a normal mission, it's going to fire once we're high enough in the atmosphere. And for Artemis 1, that is the only motor on this that is active. The attitude and abort motors are inert for Artemis 1. And that's all focused on protecting this, the Orion crew module. This is where you have your astronauts physically inside. In the capsule, you have everything you need to keep a crew safe, happy, healthy, thriving in deep space. You have a pressurized environment, seats, crew displays, toilet, everything that you need. On the outside, couple of critical features. On the bottom, the heat shield. Remember, this is goal number one for this mission, is testing that heat shield. It's an ablative structure made to survive that fiery reentry at the end of a mission. Along the outside, you saw the, see these small gray circles. Those are reaction control system thrusters. Orion can use that at the very end to control the yaw, pitch and roll as it's hurtling through the atmosphere. We have windows. You need windows to look outside. Two on the front, two on the sides, one in the side hatch, one up top in the very top docking hatch. Those are different layers of glass and acrylics for pressure and thermal control. We have a docking system, an uprighting system, parachutes, all for the very end of the mission. Third and final piece, down here at the bottom, the European Service Module. This has all of the propulsion assets for after SLS has done its job. Starting on the bottom, the large orbital maneuvering system engine. This is the one that's providing the most thrust for all of those key maneuvers around the moon. Eight auxiliary thrusters also around the aft of the bottom part of the service module to provide some additional push as well. And then 24 of these smaller reaction control system thrusters, they can be used for attitude control, which way you're pointing, as well as small translational maneuvers moving side to side. We flip the vehicle up, we see four solar arrays, each one 24 feet in length, all together generating 11 kilowatts of electrical power for Orion systems. Inside the service module, you have tanks for things like the thermal control system, potable water when we have a crew on board, and also pressurized oxygen and nitrogen for an atmosphere, which gets fed through this umbilical here to the crew module, along with electrical lines. That's also what's going to separate us at the very end of the mission. So that's Orion. It's going to be making its first flight around the moon on Artemis 1. Can't wait to see it, taking those selfies around our lunar neighbor. Send it back over to you, Megan. Thanks, Dan. That last component Dan talked about, the European Service Module, provided by the European Space Agency. Let's go to Jasmine for that. Thank you, Megan. We are back in Firing Room 2 with the Launch Control Center, and joining us now is Philippe Delou, uh, ESA's Program Manager for the Orion European Service Module. You have quite the title there, big title for a big job, I'm sure. We are very glad to have you here, and we understand that the, the European Service Module is powering Orion that's going to send humanity farther than ever before. Philippe, how is it getting us there? Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. So, yes, the Service Module accommodates the propulsion system, system that uh, contains uh, among the tanks and the pressurization of the system the uh, engine, all the engines, uh, 33 engines in total, among which the main engine, which, uh, which is going to perform the burns to put Orion into the moon orbit and then back uh, on the trajectory to return to Earth. Uh, the other engines are used for attitude correction during, uh, sorry, attitude control and trajectory correction during the travel to the moon. In addition to the propulsion system, the service module generates the power and distributes the, the electricity 
to the crew module and the service module equipment so that they can operate. And the third function is the thermal control of the uh, system. Uh, the service module accommodates radiators to reject the heat that is produced by all the equipment and the crew that will eventually be in the Orion. Um, and uh, uh, finally, not on Artemis 1, but on future Artemis mission, uh, it will have tanks to store the, cons the crew consumable, the water, the oxygen and the nitrogen. Right. So we understand, too, that you are monitoring launch here in firing room two with us. And uh, you also have a team. Uh, we're going to bring up a, a picture of that team right now or a live look inside ESA's control room uh, in, the, in the Netherlands. So can you tell us what is your team working on today? Yes. Well, the ESA team is not only back in the Netherlands. It's one aspect, but we have also a significant team in the control room in Johnson in the Mer control room. And their role is to monitor the uh, telemetry from the service module to make sure that uh, all parameters are within uh, their nominal behavior, that the operations are performed also nominally, and for sure identify if something goes wrong, if something goes not nominal. And if something non nominal is identified, then they will have the role to support the NASA team. Uh, to troubleshoot the anomaly and uh, prepare the recommendation to be brought to the mission management team for a decision on how to operate the vehicle forward. Great. That's glad to, we're really glad to hear that your teams are monitoring here, Johnson in the Netherlands as well. And this has been a huge collaboration. There were 10 countries that contributed to the European service module. Can you tell me about that teamwork? Indeed. It, it was a real teamwork but of uh, about 60 companies across 10 European countries. Uh, well, together with the prime contractor, we have uh, selected the finest companies uh, available in Europe uh, to build a state-of-the-art equipment which is needed to go back uh, to the moon with humans. Right. We're going back to the moon and farther even beyond. Thank you so much, Philippe. We really appreciate you being here tonight. You're welcome. Thank Fantastic. you very much. Of course, of course. Megan, back to you. Now it's time to check back in with Mission Control in Houston. Leah, how are things over there? Things are good over here at Johnson Space Center, which is just one part of an agency-wide effort with many NASA programs doing their part to make future missions a reality. When the first woman and first person of color travel to the moon, they'll be wearing a state-of-the-art launch and entry spacesuit called the Orion Crew Survival System. When they set foot on the moon, they'll be in another all-new next-gen suit, both being developed at the Johnson Space Center and through partnerships with commercial providers. During those spacewalks, astronauts will collect samples for further study of the moon. The Astro Materials Research and Exploration Science Division at JSC is preparing to receive rocks, soil, and ice collected from the moon's south pole, which has a unique crater impact history and ice deposits that have never been sampled. And leading the effort to advance capabilities for science, exploration, and commercial development of the moon is the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, or CLIPS. More than a dozen American companies are developing science investigations and tech demos. Additionally, we need a sustainable presence a specific station in orbit to facilitate continuous lunar access and serve as a home base or a jumping off point for new deep space exploration missions. This is where Gateway comes in. It's a multi-purpose lunar space station being developed by a worldwide effort led out of JSC. NASA is again teaming up with international and commercial partners to create this essential component. Artemis and Gateway will enable NASA's human research program to better understand how the human body adapts beyond low Earth orbit, ensuring future astronauts traveling to the moon and Mars have the tools to keep healthy and thrive in new environments. And with that, we're going to turn it back over to Megan and Kayla at Kennedy. Thank you so much. So Artemis will also facilitate new discoveries about the moon. So to tell us what we're hoping to learn, we have Sarah Noble here. She's the Artemis Lunar Science Lead. Great to have you here. Thanks. So tell us about what we know about the moon. Yes, yeah, so we learned a ton about the moon during Apollo, right, from the samples and the data that we collected. In fact, we're still learning from those samples and data even today, 50 mm -hmm. years later. Uh, but then since Apollo, you know, we've actually been studying the moon mostly from above, learning mm -hmm. about uh, getting more of a global perspective on the moon that we really didn't have during Apollo. And so that's allowed us to ask a lot better questions and to understand where to go to find the answers to them. 
Now that we're headed back to the moon, sending human beings as part of the Artemis program, what are we hoping to learn that's new? Yeah, so we're going to an entirely different part of the moon for Artemis, right? During Apollo, we kind of landed almost in the same place, like six mm. times, right? In the sort of central near side of the moon. But for Artemis, we're going to go explore a new part of the moon. We're going to go to the South Pole, uh, which is some of the oldest uh, rocks on the, on the moon. It's the, the part of the original crust of the moon. Uh, and, and there's places there that are permanently shadowed uh, where we think that water and other molecules um, sort of get trapped and we really want to understand what those are and so that we can use them for both science and and for as a resource. Hmm. Sarah we're also planning to land a rover at the south pole of the moon in late 2024. Can you tell us about that? Yeah absolutely the Viper rover the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration rover <laughs> is going to land near the south pole and it's actually going to explore some of these permanently shadowed areas. It's going to dip into them, drill down, try to find out what that what that water is, what else is there, what form that water is, how much is there, so that we can really understand it both from a science perspective and if we want to use it as a resource, we will understand how to how to extract it. So some people might say, you know, we have all these rovers, we have access to machines that can do a lot of the work on the surface of the moon for us, so why is it important to return humans to the moon? Yeah, it's not an either or proposition, right? There are some things that robots are better at and some things that humans are better at. And it turns out that humans are, are much better field geologists. We're really <laughs> much more efficient and, and better at that. Plus we can, we can do uh, better, we can um, it, deploy more complicated instruments and we can okay. use tools in a ways that it's very difficult for robots to do so we can collect better samples. And one of the great things is that we can bring back a lot of samples. Right? Mm -hmm. When we do robotic sample return, it's usually a very small amount. But if you look at what we brought back from Apollo, it's a large amount of samples that literally hundreds, probably maybe thousands of scientists have been able to study over the years and over generations. And that's a lot of brain power to, to put behind those samples. So again, that's how Artemis and Apollo are different. Now we're utilizing machines and people that's right. to Work hopefully together. advance. Yeah. That's right. Perfect. Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. So in honor of our destination the moon we asked you all to create moon inspired content and share them with us using the hashtag NASA moon snap we got so many wonderful submissions so why don't we check them out now That was a really cool look at, at all the different kinds of creations, recipes, and also art, and, and, and it was great to see what people submitted. Yeah, it's awesome to see the creativity out there and how people are engaging with this mission in so many different ways. Yeah, so I know that you, you didn't submit it yet, but you did create a moon snap, sort of, so to say, so why don't we take a look at that picture? Yeah, this is one of my favorite pictures of the moon that I was able to take from orbit. I think for me, it kind of reminds me of that iconic picture of moonrise or earthrise from the moon from Apollo. And it's kind of that in reverse. I think there's something about seeing the moon from orbit around the Earth that makes it seem a little bit easier to imagine what it'd be like to have that view from the moon looking back at our home planet. Yeah, you should definitely submit that because that's an amazing photo. Did you take that yourself? Yeah, out of the cupola window wow. aboard the space station. Wow, the resolution's yeah. great. The cameras we have up there are incredible. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. So I haven't taken a moon snap, so I had nothing to submit. So how do you feel about creating a moon snap with me? Let's do it. All right, well, take that, if you don't mind lifting it up, <laughs> and we're just going to snap a photo here. Oh, lighting. <laughs> Perfect, so I just created a moon snap. I love it, I'm gonna share it. Uh, and again, this is just to encourage people to really get involved in this mission. So uh, we will continue to collect and share those photos. So again, if you have a NASA moon snap, just use that hashtag. Okay, Artemis 1 comes amid a very busy year, an exciting year at NASA. Some of the highlights include two more commercial crew launches with SpaceX, Crew 4 in April, and then Crew 5 last month.
In May, NASA and Boeing flew OFT2, the second uncrewed flight test of the Starliner capsule. The goal is to certify the capsule for regular flights to the International Space Station after a crewed flight test next year. In July, we released the first images captured by our James Webb telescope, and oh my, my, those are really beautiful, fascinating photos, and they're going to really help us answer some of astronomy's biggest questions about how our universe began. And then in September, we intentionally slammed the DART spacecraft into asteroid Dimorphos. Boom, look at that. And we successfully changed its course. The asteroid wasn't headed for Earth, but the test was to show we could defend our planet if needed. And recently, two other missions that benefit the Artemis program. Last week, we tested a new inflatable heat shield that could help us eventually land humans on Mars. And just two days ago, Capstone arrived at its intended orbit around the moon. The small satellite launched from New Zealand in June and will now test a unique lunar orbit for a future space station there. Artemis I heralds a new era in the history of human spaceflight. It marks a pivotal next step in humanity's return to the moon, ushering in a new generation of astronauts, technology, and research. This critical flight test sets the course for a bright future at the moon. It represents our ability to safely send Artemis astronauts and critical hardware to lunar orbit. Humanity will experience Artemis in different ways than we did Apollo. We will explore new areas of the moon with 21st century materials, technologies, systems, and operations. Gateway will be humanity's first space station to orbit the moon, built with next generation technology. Gateway will not only provide a deep space outpost for future lunar expeditions, it will also serve as a station for landers, experiments and supplies. Starting with the core power and habitation elements, Gateway will grow with increasing capability as international partners contribute new habitat and refueling modules, observation windows, external robotics, and more. Gateway will enable longer stays and more science to be conducted on and around the moon than ever before. And one day, it will help set the stage for missions to Mars. A highly skilled, diverse core of astronauts will be selected for Artemis missions, including the first woman and first person of color to step foot on the moon. Aboard Gateway, the crew will conduct exciting research from their unique deep space vantage point. Gateway will also be a transfer station for astronauts to board innovative human landing systems that will ferry them to and from the lunar surface for exciting scientific expeditions near the South Pole. Once on the moon, Artemis astronauts will use expertise in fields like biology and geology to conduct groundbreaking research in modern spacesuits using advanced tools. They will drive new rovers to investigate the lunar terrain and unlock some of the greatest mysteries of our solar system. Artemis I cements our capability to send astronauts and cargo to the moon for years to come. We're going back to the moon. We are Artemis. As we approach the opening of our two hour launch window, we have a special musical performance for you. America the Beautiful, played in honor of the flight test by the Philadelphia Orchestra and Yo Yo Ma.
truly beautiful performance. It, it really has me feeling quite emotional right now. Yeah, perfect tribute for tonight's launch. You know, it's just, uh, it gives me a sense of pride, really, to just remember that our country continues to lead our nation in space exploration. So, and as such, the White House is closely watching this historic launch. Earlier this year, Vice President Kamala Harris came down to Kennedy Space Center and met with NASA leadership as well as astronauts. She also toured our facilities where teams are working on hardware for future Artemis missions. Before leaving, she signed a piece of the Orion spacecraft that will fly on Artemis 3. She's doing it right there, which will return astronauts to the lunar surface. Okay, Kayla, time for more social questions. So let's take the first one. You know now the drill. It's going to be a celebrity question, so let's take that. Hey, guys, I'm Jack Black, and I'm super excited for the Artemis 1 launch today. I was part of a little movie called Apollo 10 and a Half, A Space Age Childhood, and I have a few burning queries. Question the first, how is Artemis different than Apollo? Artemis is different than Apollo because we're returning to the moon, but this time we're going to stay. Mm -hmm. So rather than a short visit where we can do some amazing science, but it was pretty limited by these short visits, kind of a small area of the moon, we're going to the South Pole and we're going to learn how to live there long term. So we're going to be building habitats. We're going to have rovers. We're going to have all of this infrastructure on the moon supporting scientific discovery, but also that next big step to Mars. I love seeing celebrities also take part and ask questions because it really shows that th this is something that's, that's that's captivating a lot of people. So that was really fun to see Jack Flag. Also, query the first. That was <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> All right, let's go to the second question. How does it feel in space? Being in space is amazing. I mean, for us launching to orbit around the Earth and then go to the space station where I just was for six months, we're in an apparent microgravity environment. So for us, it feels like we're weightless, like we're floating. So hmm. you have to relearn how to live and work in that space. But once you get used to it, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, we were just talking, Jessica Watkins, another ast uh, NASA astronaut was just here. And she was saying that actually when you came back on Earth, that was an adjustment as well because you got so used to, uh, used to living on the space station. Yeah, it, the transition home was actually a lot harder for me than the transition up there because because our vestibular systems kind of remap. We start ignoring all the sensors in our inner ear that tell us how our bodies are moving because the space environment is so strange, but we really need that on Earth to balance and control our bodies. Sure. So when we get back, it takes a couple of days before we feel comfortable again. Really interesting. Thanks so much for those. Okay, so we are 10 minutes uh, until the opening of our two hour launch window today. So why don't we head back over to Daryl. Daryl, tell us what's happening now. Yeah, Megan, we actually uh, have about 10 minutes before we go into a half hour hold. Uh, that half hour hold is part of the L clock and what you see on uh, your monitor right now, I believe is the T clock. So uh, in about 10 minutes, we'll hold for a half hour. And currently the launch team is trying to evaluate uh, how much of a delay may result from some issues that we've uh, been facing uh, over the past hour. Just to recap those, we had a uh, a leak in a replenish valve uh, on the mobile launcher that feeds uh, into liquid hydrogen core stage tank. Uh, that's been resolved. The leak uh, has been fixed and we're moving forward. Currently, the upper stage of the rocket for liquid hydrogen uh, is roughly 78% at the moment. So that is tracking. Progress continues there. The core stage has been topped off and now both liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen are 100%, along with the upper stage of uh, the liquid hydrogen side of the equation. So we're just waiting on uh, the complete tanking of the upper stage liquid hydrogen. Now with regards to the range issue that we had, we just got an update from the range, the 45th Space Wing uh, officer reporting in to the NASA test director that the ethernet switch uh, has been replaced. This pro problematic switch uh, took down uh, their ability to see uh, radar from one of their assets, which is key in uh, getting acquisition and signal for the flight termination system if it were to be needed. Of course, this is a critical system uh, that uh, has to be tested before we can launch. So at the moment, we're looking still at a 104 
a.m. Eastern Time launch. But it is pretty clear from the work that is ahead that it looks like we're going to slip into that window. How much exactly? Um, we don't have an accurate calculation from the launch team as of right now. But of course, we're uh, anticipating that. Um, so for the moment, uh, you see on your clock now, we are in the T minus 10 minute hold. We just entered that. And now roughly we're looking at 28 minutes um, to uh, resume terminal count. The launch team will assess what work needs to be done, how that syncs up with the range getting back online with their, uh, with their equipment, and then we should have a new T0 for you soon. That's the latest from Firing Room 1 here at the Kennedy Space Center. Megan, back to you. So things are obviously still very dynamic. We're going to come back to, to Daryl as, as much as possible. Now to understand where we are going, we have to know where we have been. To do that, we spoke to some of the special few who walked on the moon and those who sent them. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. It's been 50 years since we've been to the moon, and we've got a great program called Artemis. We're going back. The Apollo program was a test for the American people that you can do what you set out to do. All it took was turning to it and making it happen. We are go for a mission to the moon at this time. Engines on five, four, three, two. All engines running. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour. I think the characteristic that, that I remember most though of the Saturn V was the noise. The noise was enormous and it was almost impossible to communicate. We're go, St. High, we're go. Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. The landing to me was a great celebration. The nation was almost euphoric. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. There are so many things that we can eventually learn about our universe and the spacecraft that we use exploring. We are a nation of explorers. During Apollo, we were on national TV literally every day because we were doing something visible that Americans could see and they could feel and say, look what we are doing. And I believe Artemis is going to come up and say, look what we are capable of and what we are doing now. Artemis will stand on the shoulders of Apollo. They're gonna have the eyes of the world on them when they start down this trail. The science of a space flight is one that will continue to inspire. Going to the moon generates technology, more communications, more computer technology, more sophistication in manufacturing that help us in everyday life. We have a generation that is ready, a generation with that technology, a generation with the education. Artemis represents the future in space. It is our next big step, and it is time to take it. If you're just joining us, welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center, where we are showing you a live look of another visitor center. This is the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. Wow, take a look at all of those people who are there hoping to watch the launch today. You know, this is uh, the visitor center for the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. They, uh, that center played a crucial role uh, in uh, contributing to the Artemis program, so I'm not I'm not uh, surprised that there are a bunch of people there watching. <laughs> All right, so now we're gonna take a, uh, go back to Leah Martin over at Banana Creek. Again, that's right outside of our visitor center and she's with some other folks who came out to watch today's launch. 
Yeah, you know, Megan, we talked about this being America's rocket, right? Every state in the United States has contributed to this rocket, so it should be no surprise that we have people from all over the country joining us here tonight. I'm actually joined by uh, some friends of ours who are joining us from Georgia and Utah. What does it mean to be here tonight to see tonight's launch? I think it's amazing. I know that tons of people from all over the United States have helped build the rockets and are here tonight so it's awesome to know that we all have a little bit of personal ties to the rocket and go ahead <laughs> no i'm just excited to be here because i've been a fan of space travel and going to the moon and back and uh, i'm glad to see it's happening again later in life and you were actually telling me a little bit earlier that you grew up in the apollo era in those years following those first launches and now here how does it feel to be watching the sister program launch and seeing at the beginning look at the goosebumps <laughs> that tells it all right here uh, i am i'm totally thrilled to be here now and you were actually telling me that you have a personal connection to this rocket as well you know yes. some people who have worked on it what do you think it feels like being here how does it feel for you to see uh, something that's the culmination of so many years of hard work yeah, I think it's crazy when you think about how long it takes to build it and stuff. Like, I wasn't even born last time people tried to get to the moon. So it's awesome. I think it's so exciting, and I cannot wait. And, and uh, we have a ton of people who are working tonight still on console. We just want to tell them words of encouragement. What more do you have to say? Oh, I hope it goes tonight. <laughs> Megan, Go back Artemis. to you. Go Artemis. <laughs> Woo! Go Artemis. Yes, I love that. And again, I just love these drone shots that we're showing of all the people who are here ready, hoping, uh, anticipating uh, launch today. So now let's head back over to Dan. So Dan is in the Apollo Saturn V Center, which is right next to uh, this crowd that you're seeing here. He's inside there and he's going to tell us more about SLS using an interactive state of the art tool we're calling the moon board. That's right, Megan and everybody, welcome back to the moon board. So just to recap, SLS out on the pad, on the mobile launcher, Daryl's been walking you through all of the tanking, all of the preparation. We had that hydrogen leak that was in the base of the mobile service structure here. That's been remedied. Uh, we haven't had any issue with those tail umbilicals that we were tracking so closely back in August uh, and September. So everything looking really good with SLS. Just to recap, most powerful rocket we have ever built. It's propelled by two solid rocket boosters and four engines on this core stage. Now these solid rocket boosters are gonna be firing for the first roughly two minutes of the flight, a little more than two minutes. And we call them solids because of the type of propellant in there. If you forgot it already, it's aluminum powder, ammonium perchlorate, and polybutadiene acrylonitrile. It's a binding agent that's inside. Solid propellants are extremely stable. They're very reliable but once you ignite them, they're gonna keep burning. You can't really throttle them up and down like you can with liquid-fueled engines. You can throttle just based off of the distribution, so you basically put more propellant in some areas and less in others as you're trying to really throttle the rocket down, which we do as we go through things like max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. And just a reminder, as these things are firing, they can steer, they can gimbal, the bottom part here, gimbal just means you can really direct and they're providing 90% of the steering as SLS is making the flight uphill and more than 75% of the thrust with those two firing at the same time. And again, they're attached to this. This is the core stage, 212 feet tall, the largest single stage we've ever constructed. It's been through the green run test, a lot of preparation for this flight today, and it is propelled by these four RS-25 engines. Now these are liquid-fueled rocket engines, so you have a fuel and an oxidizer, and one of the great things about liquid fuel is you can throttle them in real time. You could kind of like the gas in your car, you can go faster or a little bit slower. So these throttle up to 104% of their rated thrust at the time of liftoff. We throttle them down as we go through max cues, the maximum amount of pressure on SLS in the way uphill, and then throttle them back up until they've consumed all of their propellants. And they're consuming that propellant at more than 1,500 gallons a second. That is just an astronomical amount of fuel that's running through these engines to produce that thrust. Each of these up to half a million pounds each during their operation. And of all the different components, we've got this engine block section down here. You have all of the associated plumbing, everything to feed those propellants down to these engines. You also have these two attachment points here and that's where we actually tank the SLS rocket. So a lot of focus on those in the previous attempts. They've cooperated spectacularly so far today, and we've been able to fully tank 
this core stage. And a reminder, you have a fuel, about half a million gallons right here of liquid hydrogen, and then an oxidizer. You need those two together, and then an ignition source. That's what gives you your reaction, your thrust, your basically controlled explosion that then comes out of those rocket engines. So fully tanked, these are cryogenic fuels, hundreds of degrees below zero, so we've got a spray-on insulation across the entire vehicle. As it's sitting out there in the Florida air, it's a little bit warm tonight, but we need to keep those hundreds of degrees below zero. It takes a lot of energy to do that, so the less you have to use to keep them cold, the better, which is why we have that insulation. So we're gonna be seeing SLS take flight for the first time tonight as we clear all of those final issues. Again, this is going to be one heck of a show when this thing launches into the night sky. So with that, send it back over to you, Megan. If you're just joining us, welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center for live launch coverage of Artemis One. I'm NASA's Megan Cruz, and this is NASA astronaut Kayla Barron. It's been great having you these past two hours. It's been so awesome to be here for this historic launch tonight. So right now we are awaiting a new T0. Uh, the launch team had to work through some issues, and they're doing a great job at working through those issues. So now we're just waiting to see uh, a new T0 since we had been aiming for the top of the launch window, which opened uh, our wood. Uh, does open at 104 a.m. Eastern time. Now, today is a big deal. Apollo 17 in 1972 was the last time humans stepped foot on the moon. That uh, the rocket you see right there behind us, illuminated in the darkness there, is the first step back uh, towards getting us to the moon. Now, Artemis 1 is the first integrated flight test of NASA's deep space exploration systems. That's the ground systems here at Kennedy Space Center, the Space Launch System, or SLS rocket, and the Orion spacecraft. We will send an send an uncrewed Orion spacecraft farther beyond the moon than any of the Apollo missions before it. For Artemis II, Orion will have astronauts on board as it orbits the moon. Then future Artemis missions will land the first woman and first person of color on the surface of the moon. So Kayla, why do we want to go back to the moon? The moon's a super interesting place to study. It can tell us a lot about the Earth, its own formation, but also more about our solar system. And we also want to return this time in an international partnership for a permanent presence on the lunar surface that'll teach us everything we need to know to travel onto Mars. Mm -hmm. And what about for you? I mean, you have uh, the possibility of maybe being selected for those future missions because they, uh, the Artemis program can choose from any of you guys, any of the NASA astronauts. It's a crazy time to be a NASA astronaut <laughs> and even imagine that that could be real. I think we're all just honored to be a part of the team that's doing this. We're just a small representation of all of the amazing human beings around the world that it takes to do something as audacious as returning to the moon, learning what we need to go onto Mars. So we're just all excited to support the program in any way we can. But of course, a ride to the moon would be incredible. So yeah. I think we're all just dreaming about those moonwalks. Now, since Artemis 1 is setting the stage for those future crewed missions, is there anything in particular about this 26 day mission that you will be watching? Is it reentry? Yeah, you know, we've mentioned that a few times throughout the broadcast tonight. The re-entry is a really important part of the flight, of course, and the heat shield, we're interested in seeing how it performs in real life. We tested it on the ground, but Orion's going to be coming in faster and hotter than any human rated spacecraft in history. And so we really want to see how the heat shield performs and make sure all the systems can keep the crew safe for that dynamic event. Yeah, we'll all be watching for that, too. It's not just about the launch, a 26 day mission, as we said, so we'll be uh, keeping uh, watch over the entire mission. Our workforce now is very different from what it was during the Apollo era. When Apollo 11 launched, there was only one female engineer in the firing room. Today's launch of Artemis 1 is led by NASA's first ever female launch director. Take a look at how she and other women across NASA are shattering glass ceilings. When I was a little girl, I wanted to be an astronaut, a scientist, a doctor, a fighter pilot. When I was a little girl, I wanted to grow up to be strong and independent. When we were asked to draw a picture of what we wanted to be when we grew up, I drew an astronaut standing on the surface of the moon. All I thought about was when I was going to get to NASA. It's a huge honor to be NASA's first female launch director. To be the launch director for Artemis, NASA has so many wonderful women pioneers, so many heroes to me. Some of the most amazing women in my eyes are people like Katherine Johnson and the other women that you've seen in Hidden Figures. 
Sometimes it's difficult to believe that I'm on this side now wearing this blue flight suit with all of the other astronauts, representing this iconic image that had so inspired and excited me my entire life. Being of South Asian heritage, Kalpana Chawla was just such a big thing for me growing up. I've always looked up to Sally Ride and Mae Jemison, who really laid the foundation to allow people like me to be in the position that I am now. All of these women were pushing those boundaries and breaking those glass ceilings. Now, of course, there are some fantastic women in leadership positions that inspire me every day. So much has changed since the Apollo program. During the Apollo 11 launch, we had one woman, one out of 400 engineers in the room. And I look at our team today, it's much more a reflection of the world that we live in. A big piece of why it's so important to have women and diverse backgrounds because it allows us to bring everybody along with us on this journey. It doesn't really matter what you look like. If you've got the brains and you have the knowledge, we need you at the table. We are at such an exciting time in human spaceflight right now, and Artemis is such a huge part of that. We haven't been to the moon in many, many years. We have a lot of younger generation folks that have never seen that happen. We will understand so much more about the moon, about the Earth, about our solar system. We're going to stay, and to me, that's an amazing idea. The moon is gonna be the blueprint for how we go to Mars and out into the solar system and maybe beyond. It is incredibly exciting to be part of this Artemis team. It still feels pretty surreal to think that I might one day walk on the moon. To see a woman and a person of color on the surface of the moon, to be able to say that space is for everyone and that we go to space to make life better here on Earth for everyone, I know that tears will be in my eyes. My message to women and girls out there is to find your passion, whatever that is. Don't let anyone tell you what you can do or can't do. Only you can realize your dreams. Faith is for everyone. And if me being in this role helps to send that message, I think that's a great thing. And I just actually love that I don't feel like a woman at NASA. I just feel like a person at NASA. The women of NASA are Artemis, and we make a difference every day. I am NASA's Spacewalk Office Hardware Manager. I'm the Program Scientist for Space Biology. I'm the Director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. I am Artemis. 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 I just love the way that that video ends with you and all these other women saying, I am Artemis. What do you think, why is it so powerful to just hear those three words, I am Artemis? Why does that resonate so much? I think it just represents how far we've come since the Apollo era, era and how we take advantage of the incredible diversity our country has to offer. Having seats at the table for everyone, you know, spaces for everyone, you heard that a few times in the video, and I think we're proving that out every single day in our work, not just at NASA, but with our international partners. I think it's so important to our ability to succeed on these really complex missions. Yeah, I thought that was a, a very powerful video, and, and I'm glad that people got that message, young girls in particular. Another person who you saw in that video is uh, Pam Melroy. She's a former astronaut and NASA's uh, deputy administrator. So why don't we head over to Jasmine Hopkins because Pam is there with her now. Thank you so much, Megan. Yes, I am honored now to be joined by Pam Melroy, NASA Deputy Administrator. Uh, this is just a fantastic night. And we just saw that powerful video with you among so many of the great women here at NASA. What is so important about us now being ready to send, you know, the first woman, the first person yeah. of color to the moon? Yeah, I loved watching that video. It just inspires me. So many of those women are my friends, but also they're just such fantastic engineers and scientists and just so many roles at the agency. I've always thought one of the strongest teams that you could ever find is a family. And families have men and women. And so our teams are stronger, I think, when we have uh, that balance and that diversity. So that was exciting. But for me, I, I was a part of the Apollo generation and I was very inspired by you know Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and uh, Mike Collins on Apollo 11 and all the Apollo astronauts. I just cannot even imagine 
the inspiration, though, for a little girl. I mean, it, it never occurred to me that there, I mean, I wanted to be an astronaut, but of course there were no women astronauts then. I think what's going to happen now with the Artemis generation is that that first woman and the first person of color is just going to have a, a huge impact on the next generation. Right. We, we are just watching with, with bated breath, and I know that it's going to mean so much to, yes. to little kids to look up to them. And, and we understand, too, this is a huge, I mean, when we launch Artemis, it's going to be a global accomplishment. Mm -hmm. We have the Artemis Accords, which are helping us make sure we explore peacefully. Can you tell us more about those? Yeah, it's really important, actually, uh, especially because, um, you know, unlike in Apollo, where it was actually just a few countries that had the capability to go to space, now those capabilities are proliferating throughout the world. And so what we do with the rocket is really important, and how we go is, is just as important. And how we go is as teams and with our partners and with a sense of the responsibility that we have as we go out into the solar system to do it peacefully for scientific pur purposes and responsibly. Right, Pam, you have a great sense of teamwork and this is definitely not our, our first time. You know, there's a lot of things that go into testing out a first time vehicle. Um, there's actually dynamic activity going on right now. So how does this first flight test of SLS compare to other first times, you know, with shuttle or with Saturn V before that? Well, I can, I can do even better as a test pilot, uh, <laughs> right. right? So there's a history there. Um, in fact, uh, the, you know, the amazing thing about this is, it, so first flight of a first aircraft, you actually taxi it out to the end of the runway and then run down the runway and come back and check all the data. And then you might take off once and go around the pattern and come back and land. This is a little bit like taking off and going to fly a full mission on right. your very first flight of an aircraft. And so um, everything has to be right. So this compares very, you know, it's very similar to the experiences that all new rocket developments have, uh, where, you know, it's not just about learning the hardware, that's a big piece of it, but it's also about gelling that team together and your procedures and how you're going to deal with issues that come up, because they will come up, they always come up. Exactly, and you have that experience as a test pilot, but also as a former astronaut in that video, we saw you uh, getting your induction into the Astronaut Hall of Fame, which is pretty cool. So what is your perspective or what advice do you have for the Artemis astronauts, those ones that are, are going to maybe set foot on the moon? Oh, well, they, they don't need my advice. I, <laughs> I'd love to elbow them out of the way and go to the moon, <laughs> too. But they are uh, fantastic. I mean, we are, I'm so proud of uh, all of our astronauts. I was just talking to Jessica Watkins, who just came back uh, on Crew 4. Uh, this generation is prepared, ready, and excited. And I think they're really excited that we're putting science front and center in the Artemis program, too. We're going to learn so much about the solar system from the moon and even about the Earth. And so the, I think the astronauts are really excited about doing that hands-on science. And they're, they're, they are ready to go. Right. I know they're ready to go. And maybe you are as well. <laughs> uh, but Artemis 1 is just the beginning. Then we have Artemis yes. 2 and on. We're learning so much. Yes. Uh, what do you think about this just uh, forward movement that we're making right now? Well, it's really important. This is uh, the Artemis campaign is actually part of a multi-decade effort that we're doing right now, which is really with the goal of creating a blueprint for how we're going to explore with humans and do science throughout the solar system. So we're going to learn through the Artemis campaign on the moon, and then we're going to go demonstrate it on Mars and then the next destination, who knows where. Right. I mean, we're going so much further than we ever have before. Mm -hmm. Pam Melroy, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Go Artemis. Of course. Go Artemis. Megan, back to you. Thank you both for that interview. Now, teams over at NASA's uh, Johnson Space Center are also monitoring today's launch attempt. So why don't we go back over there with Leah uh, to tell us what's going on over there. Thanks, Megan. And you're right, teams here in Mission Control Houston continue to monitor today's events. Again, they will really kick into action once we have liftoff, and they'll remain on console all the way through splashdown. But quickly, I have to show you something, a little show and tell. It makes me feel like the coolest kid. In school, I've got a moon rock here. Uh, I hope you can get a good shot of it. It is from Apollo 15, 1971. And when it was brought back to Earth, it was part of a larger rock. In total, it was 21 pounds. This is 
is, of course, a smaller section of that. But we're looking forward to the Artemis program and being able to go back to the moon so that we can continue to gather these kinds of samples, um, but this time at the lunar south pole. We've never been there, and we've never brought samples back from that area. So uh, we're really excited to see what might differ in those samples and the ones that we have here. Now, of course, we've got a whole laboratory of scientists uh, that are able to study all of those samples. We just opened some up for the first time earlier this year um, so that we're able to test with new technology everything that we can learn about these samples that we brought back now 50 years ago. So hopefully within the next few years, we're bringing some new ones back uh, to, to use that same experimental process on and tell us a little bit more about the moon. But just had to show this off, Apollo 15 moon rock. We're looking forward to having some Artos, Artemis ones here at Johnson Space Center. And with that, I will send it back to you at KSC. You were a cool kid before you even had the moon rock, so. <laughs> but now you're even a cooler kid. <laughs> now the name Artemis was chosen because in Greek mythology, she's the twin sister of Apollo. NASA's Leo Martin is over at the nearby Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex where thousands have gathered to watch today's launch attempt. Hi, Megan. I'm actually joined here tonight by a very special group of guests uh, here from Stennis visiting Kennedy Space Center. Why don't you tell me, Ryan, what it is that ties you to tonight's launch? So we were lucky and privileged enough to be able to test the core stage of the SLS rocket that's going to launch today. Um, we got to Green Run, which is a full duration hot fire. Um, it's very historic time for us at Stennis. It was so exciting to be a part of. It was seven years of hard work by a lot of really great people. And Jack, and so, oh, so yep, sorry about Just that. so excited to be here, to see it. And Jack, you were actually telling me that you know firsthand, you know, how much work has gone into tonight's launch. What does it feel like to be here tonight, seeing the rocket fully integrated on the pad, ready to go? Man, I'm just incredibly grateful to be a part of this history and just really excited to see this thing launch. And uh, Barry, you were uh, telling me that you know also firsthand, you know, the adversity that these teams have overcome to be here tonight. Do you have a word of encouragement, anything that you'd like to say to the teams all across the United States right now, both at Kennedy and at JSC, who are just sitting in these seats ready to get the rocket launched tonight? Sure. Persevere. I mean, it's hard work, but it's so well worth it. Um, we spent many hours doing the testing and trying to get ready for this moment. And I think uh, we've forward that information to those guys and we also give them the encouragement to continue on so we know they can do it. Thanks so much Barry and I think it would be great if just on the count of three we can give them a great big Go Artemis. One, two, three. Go Artemis. Back to you Megan. That was amazing. Uh, and that's just, uh, uh, you know, people who, who were actually able to come here to Florida. There's many uh, people who are joining us from around the world who couldn't obviously make the trip out here. Uh, so let's take a look at some of those watch parties there. Here's Space Center Houston. It's the visitor center over uh, for Johnson Space Center in Houston. And you can see a lot of people there after hours because you know that visitor center is closed right now. People are waving. I love it. Wow, look at that. Whatever that is, That's it's awesome. amazing. I don't think I've ever noticed that when I'm at Space Center Houston. Maybe it's new. I know. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just look at that crowd. It's really fun to see, again, all all these people who are captivated, young and old, by today's launch attempt and the beginning of the Artemis program. Uh, I know that they're uh, uh, probably looking at the clock and, and uh, wondering when we might see the launch today. So lovely to see all those people. And there's the Space and Rocket Center, uh, where we have a ton of people <laughs> waving their flags, <laughs> cheering us on tonight for this incredible launch this evening. Uh, I love that. They totally look like cheerleaders, and I they're embracing it. I love it. Uh, and yeah, this is the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. This is the Visitor Center over in Huntsville, Alabama. As I've said before, uh, this uh, that. Uh, um, Marshall Space Flight Center there is uh, super instrumental uh, in uh, what uh, what the Artemis program is doing. The, they uh, uh, contributed a lot to the mission, so it's nice to see everyone there. And then here is Airbus in Bremen, Germany.
Germany. So Airbus is the main contractor for the European Space Agency and together the company and ESA, they provided the European service module, which is uh, an important part of the Orion spacecraft. So we have quite a bit of people there, uh, a more reasonable time over there in <laughs> Germany. It is 7 a.m. So I'm going to say uh, Guten Morgen to them. Did I say it right? <laughs> Guten Morgen to them over there uh, in Bremen, Germany. Again, the Airbus company. All right, so let's get another check on the launch team with our Daryl Nail, who's inside there and has an update for us. Yeah, that's right, Megan. So we are uh, clearly in a delay now. The NASA test director, who's basically flying the ship for the launch countdown tonight, has said that uh, we are extending the hold that we were currently in at T minus 10 minutes and counting. And so that puts us off the 1.04 a.m. Eastern time launch. We're now slipping indefinitely into the hold. And NASA uh, test director Carlos Monge saying that uh, we are currently uh, estimating how much work needs to be done before resuming uh, the polling that uh, is supposed to take place 15 minutes before launch. It then goes to terminal count at T minus 10 minutes. Now we've got an update on the tanking of the upper stage liquid hydrogen tank. Currently 95% filled. We're in topping on that tank. It is the last of four tanks in the space launch system that needed to be completely fueled up before we launch. Of course, cryogenic tanking, a complex operation that has seen some delays tonight. We had a roughly hour delay uh, after a replenish valve on the core stage liquid hydrogen side required hands-on work by a red crew team that went out to the launch pad and tightened down some bolts on the valve uh, and got it fixed before leaving the launch pad and uh, then uh, launch team verifying that that work was complete. Now currently we're awaiting some work with the range. Uh, the 45th Space Wing, which oversees the range here, makes sure that uh, the airspace and, uh, and uh, the ocean out over the flight path is clear and also has the responsibility to destruct the rocket should it go uh, off track. Uh, they have been working on some issues with their equipment and sending a flight termination signal to the rocket. That... that uh, uh, there is testing that must happen with the flight termination system that was delayed by a bad Ethernet switch. Switch has been changed out, and now uh, the range is looking to start testing their connectivity to the rocket uh, in order to preserve that uh, safety function uh, that they are responsible for. So again, we are slipping now indefinitely into the launch window. Um, we're awaiting uh, the uh, launch team to evaluate just how much time is required to complete the work to get this rocket ready to launch. And of course, when we have a new T-0 for you, we'll report that out right away. Megan, back to you. Daryl, thank you so much. As NASA prepares to explore the moon, here's a look at the spacesuits and tools that will help us to do that. Watching Apollo footage of astronauts doing geology on the surface of the moon is a really great way to think about preparing for Artemis, for putting people on the lunar surface once again. We learn a lot in how they did science operations on the moon and what it's like to work on the moon. You see them doing geology. You see them taking rock samples, putting in a drive tube to take a core sample. You see them bouncing along the surface of the moon on the lunar rover that they used in Apollo 15 through 17. So it's a great way to help drive technology development for the next generation of spacesuits and geology sampling tools. There's these facilities that help us train like we are on the lunar surface. You you know, these 1-6G offload systems or putting people in the aquatic environment are great ways to train the mobility part, right? Like what can you do and how different does it feel to be in 1-6G and do these tasks? We've been training astronauts in geology and geoscience for decades now. The Apollo astronauts had literally hundreds of hours of training in geology before they flew to the moon. It's often said that the Apollo astronauts had the equivalent of a master's degree in geology by the time they flew to the moon. 
In the intervening decades since Apollo, we've been training astronauts who fly to the International Space Station because when they're on the ISS, they spend time observing the Earth looking out the window, taking pictures of what they see on the Earth's surface. Now that we're looking at putting astronauts on the surface of the moon, we also take them into the field. We take them to field sites here on Earth that resemble field sites that we expect them to see on the moon. That's the reason why we take them out into places that are unique like volcanic landscapes or places that are analogous to the lunar surface to train them on the scale and fidelity of science that you just can't recreate in these facilities. And so by combining this classroom and field training, we're able to prep them for fundamentals of geology, the major driving lunar science questions that we have that we hope to address with the Artemis program, and teaching them how to do field work in relevant analog environments. For just science aspects of developing new spacesuits, can it get you to where you need to go and then once you get there can you do the cool science that you need to do and so that's can you move effectively and efficiently in the suit to be able to collect the samples or use the tools or the instruments for the visibility it's like can you make the necessary observations that you need to or does the suit have the lights on it that it needs to to illuminate the surface and make the observations you need to the Lunar South Pole holds tremendous resources that are going to allow us to, to continue to explore. This is, this is a place that we've never been before. There's so much to be learned from getting boots on the ground and exploring a unique place that challenges us as humans and also helps us develop technologies that make our everyday life that much better. We think there might be volatiles present at the South Pole. By using these volatiles, we'll be able to do things like create drinking water, create rocket fuel to launch astronauts back to Earth. And so by harnessing the power of the land, we'll be able to help astronauts establish that long-term sustainable presence. It's human nature to explore. Pushing our boundaries and exploring our universe is, I think, just one of those things that's just stuck in our human nature and that we need to do it in order to understand the world around us, including our Earth and our solar system. We just heard there how curiosity is just a part of us. So. With that in mind, why don't we do some social questions? Because some people are very curious to hear what you have to say about their questions. So why don't we pull up the first question here? What are your thoughts on the responsibilities that come with going to space? Obviously a question for you. I am not going to space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, the opportunity to travel to space is it comes with a lot of responsibility. I think for all of us, it's a huge honor to be a part of these teams and the work we're doing is so critical in supporting scientific discovery on the ground. So on the International Space Station, we're a national laboratory. Our crew executed over 350 different wow. scientific experiments during our six month mission. And so when you think about that, it's years of work to get one of these payloads or an experiment on the space station. Yes. And it, sometimes that's someone's life's work you're holding in your hands and executing. And so being prepared for those moments is really important and understanding how to bring the team from the ground into solving complex problems. We take that really, really seriously. And of course we wanna share what that experience is like. Only a few people have been able to go to space. And as we commercialize space, as low earth orbit becomes more accessible, that'll change. But still Still, it's only available to some of us. So we really want to share what that's like and the perspective we gain from our time up there. It's really great to see and hear that you guys acknowledge that, right? Like that this experiment that you're holding, uh, that you're working on for six months, somebody has been working on literally for years. I mean, I've talked to some scientists and they're saying, oh, this has been my life's work, 20 Absolutely. years of my life's work. So, so yeah, that was a really good question. I like yeah. that question a lot. Okay, we have another one from social media here. Astro Kayla, have you considered what you might say if you had the opportunity to be the first female to set foot on the moon's surface? <laughs> um, no, I have not <laughs> considered that. Um, if I was in that role, it's something I would take really seriously. I think the iconic words of Neil Armstrong, you know, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind 
are something that we all know, whether you witnessed that moment or not, or it happened before you were born for like, for me, I think we all have that embedded in our psyche, oh, those yeah. important words. So I think it's something I, I would have to think a lot about yes. ahead of that mission. Yeah, that would be in the history books. That'll be something you're remembered for. Oh my gosh, I'd be so anxious <laughs> delivering it even after I've thought of what I want to say, like to actually Absolutely. open my mouth and say it from the surface of the moon. Wow. Yeah. That we'll have to think about that yeah, one for exactly. sure. <laughs> okay, let's see another question here. Oh, why is the spacesuit orange in color? That's an awesome question that I wish I knew the answer to. <laughs> Megan and I were actually talking about that earlier when we had Snoopy up here. Uh, it's a continuation of the same suit that we used during the shuttle era. And I was kind of hypothesizing that maybe it's to help forces if for some reason when we landed in the water we had to get out of the capsule mm -hmm. for some reason it would be easy to see us um but that i'm gonna have to take a phone a friend on that one i think to know the real answer i'm sure somebody will be commenting on social media right now with the what the real history behind i know the orange i'm trying is. to think about it too i'm thinking I, does it have anything to do with sls being orange because oh, of yeah, the foam match your vehicle yeah, why not maybe it's that. i don't know <laughs> i don't know we got stumped that was our first one that we got stumped on <laughs> do we have another question all right, if you could name one of the moon's craters, what would you name it? Oh man, what would you name it, Megan? I don't know, that's a big decision. I thought you might say the name of your zero G graph. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe, I don't know. That's a like pretty big responsibility, I think, to name these geological features. And a lot of the craters on the moon already have names. So yeah. I'm sure there's some that maybe they haven't named, they're too small or we haven't explored them yet, but a lot of them already do have names. Like we're gonna be exploring the edge of Shackleton Crater as sure. part of Artemis mission. So a lot of them are already named and mapped. Yeah, thanks for throwing it back on me. I was like, I don't <laughs> know. Do you think like our parents or, or husband or fiance are now upset that we didn't say them? I don't know, I mean. <laughs> I don't think so. I think they understand. <laughs> All right. Are, these are big decisions. This is. All right. Last question here for this segment, at least. What will Orion do when it gets to the moon? Um, so for this mission, Artemis 1, it's actually going to orbit the moon and then go into a distant retrograde orbit. And so it'll get really close, as close as 62 miles, and then go way past the moon um, and way deeper into space than we've ever been before. So. Yeah, the Orion vehicle will be checking out all of its systems. We're going to be analyzing that data from the ground, and then we're going to see that it can survive re-entry and a successful splashdown off the coast of San Diego. Yeah, yeah, that was a good question too. Okay, well again, just keep those questions coming. You know, we do, we are entering into this launch window and uh, we do have time, so we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to uh, try at least to answer <laughs> uh, most of your questions. So uh, you've been hearing throughout the broadcast all the different science that returning to the moon will enable us to do so there's actually something called the prime one mining it's experiment and that's going to robotically look for ice and other resources below the lunar surface nasa's first polar resources ice mining experiment also known as prime one will robotically look for ice and other resources below the lunar surface thanks to data from spacecraft orbiting the moon Scientists believe that the polar regions contain water ice in the form of ice just below the surface. With the right technologies, that ice is a game-changing resource that can be mined and used to produce propellant and breathable oxygen for future explorers. Under NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative, the agency selected intuitive machines to fly and land Prime 1 on the Moon's South Pole. Prime 1 will land near the Shackleton Crater to drill into the lunar soil in an area that could contain water ice. Prime 1 is made up of two instruments, Trident, the regolith and ice drill for exploring new terrain, and M-Solo, the mass spectrometer observing lunar operations. Trident will drill up to three feet into the lunar surface, extract lunar soil, and bring it up to the surface. Trident drills to its maximum depth in multiple phases, stopping at different increments. As it reaches each desired depth, it will pause and retract the drill string to deposit lunar soil on the surface for analysis. This is where M-Solo comes in. M-Solo is a commercial off-the-shelf mass spectrometer modified for spaceflight. 
It will evaluate the chemical elements and compounds released from the lunar soil for water and other chemical compounds. Trident will then proceed to the next specified depth and repeat the process until samples at all desired depths have been analyzed for water. If no ice is found where Prime 1 lands, NASA will still collect valuable information about drilling into the lunar soil for a future mission. NASA's Viper, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, will use Prime 1 technology on a mobile robot that will navigate the moon's south pole searching for additional resources. Prime 1 data will help NASA assess lunar resources to inform future Artemis missions and a robust human presence on the moon. So we are, away, we are still awaiting a new T0 for today's launch attempt, but for more on what to expect when we launch uh, for this first day, let's go to NASA's Dan Hewitt. He's inside our Apollo Saturn V Center at the KSC Visitor Complex. Hey, thanks, Megan. Everybody, welcome back to the moon board. There's a lot of people here in the complex. I just heard a woo-hoo. People are getting in and out because we have a great view of launch when it's going to happen, and it's going to happen today. But that launch is just the first step in the Artemis One mission. So let's look at what's ahead for this historic first flight. As we just said, launch is step number one. Those four RS-25 engines throttle up, followed shortly after by the two solid rocket boosters igniting, sending SLS and Orion skyward. Now on our way uphill, we'll have a number of jettison events. You'll be able to see things coming off of the SLS rocket. One of the most visual ones will be these two solid rocket boosters. Now they'll expend their propellant a little over two minutes into the flight, they will separate. We'll see them flare off onto either side and then the core stage continues to fire. We're also going to see the launch abort system come off the top. Once you get high enough in the atmosphere, it's no longer required. You could actually do aborts using engines on Orion and its service module. I will also note that on the launch abort system, it's got those three solid rocket motors. The jettison motor is active. The abort and the attitude ones are not for this flight. We don't have people, so we're not flying a fully active abort system. We also have three fairings that are there to protect Orion, the service module and the crew module, as we're flying up through the really dense parts of the Earth's atmosphere. Next up, we'll hit core stage separation. So we've got four main engines. We'll hear Miko, main engine cutoff. Those engines will shut down, the core stage will separate, drop away. It's eventually going to splash down in the ocean. And that hands over the propulsion duties to this, our upper stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. Its first job is to execute what's known as a perigee raise maneuver. So the perigee is the lowest part of your orbit. You have a perigee that's your low part and an apogee that's your highest point. We're going to raise up the perigee and that's going to actually put us in a nice circular path around the planet. And while we're there, that gives us time to check out Orion. We're flying it in space for the second time, the first time in this fully integrated stack with SLS. We'll be able to look at all of Orion's systems, make sure those solar arrays are capturing the sun's energy and turning it into electrical power for Orion systems, make sure the communications are working, all of our guidance and navigation and control. That is your time to make sure you have a healthy spacecraft before you do something that is going to send it to the moon. And that's next up on our list. That's the translunar injection. For today's launch profile, that's going to be a firing of about 18 minutes of that single engine on the upper stage. Now that engine optimized for a vacuum, it's producing about 24,000 pounds of thrust. So it's a pretty big engine and it's doing that because we need enough energy to be able to send our payload, Orion, beyond low Earth orbit and send it on a path to head out to the moon. Now after that burn is complete, ICPS separates. It's gonna do what's called a disposal burn. So it's gonna send itself on a path from Earth around the moon and slingshot out into what's known as a heliocentric orbit. So it's going to completely leave the Earth-Moon system and go into orbit around our sun. But after it separates, propulsion duties get handed over to this, the European Service Module. And it's got a couple of different engines that it's going to be using. And we're going to be testing those out just on day one. We're going to do what's called the Outbound Trajectory Correction Burn 1. 
and we'll do a couple of these trajectory corrections as we're flying out to the moon, but that first one is that first critical test of this large engine, the orbital maneuvering system engine. That's the one that has the most thrust, generating about 6,000 pounds of force in a vacuum, and that's what's going to be doing a lot of our maneuvers or giving us that pushing power as we do these maneuvers around the moon to enter into what's known as distant retrograde orbit, or DRO. And that's this dotted line that you see around here. Now we call it distant, basically because of the distance we're away from the moon, we're about 40,000 miles, a little bit less, off the lunar surface. And then we call it retrograde because the moon orbiting planet Earth in this direction, going in a counterclockwise fashion, we're going to be entering into a clockwise orbit around the moon, opposite retrograde. Now to do that, we're going to get in close, we're going to dip in off the lunar surface, we're going to be about 80 miles, 80 statute miles off the lunar surface as we do this outbound powered flyby. Again, the major thrust coming from that orbital maneuvering system engine. After we do that, we'll do a final maneuver to actually go into that distant retrograde orbit, that DRO. Now, why DRO? Why are we not just going around the moon and coming back on like a free return trajectory, which we did on some of the Apollo missions? Well, in DRO, it's a very stable orbit. It doesn't require a lot of fuel to maintain that area around the moon. So it gives you a lot of time to really test the spacecraft. If you followed with any launch of a new spacecraft, you know there's only so much testing you can do on the ground. Once you actually put all of that hardware in space, in the environment that it's going to be operating, hundreds of thousands of miles away from Earth, you're going to learn things you didn't even realize about everything from communications, the life support systems, the thermal control, everything on a spacecraft needs to get put through its paces in this environment before we put people on board. And that's why we're heading out to DRO. Eventually though, it's going to be time to come home and we will do a DRO departure maneuver. This again, firing up that orbital maneuvering system engine and others on the service module. And this is what's going to commit us from leaving the moon and heading on back towards Earth. We'll dip in once more, close off the lunar surface, slingshot and use the lunar gravity to do this return powered flyby. And then similar to the way out, we can make correction burns as we kind of fine tune our path back towards the Earth. And then it's time for re-entry. A couple of things happen before that. One of the really critical ones, spacecraft separation. We're going to detach the European service module shortly before re-entry, its job largely done. That burns up in the Earth's atmosphere and reveals on the crew module the heat shield. I circled it earlier. This is goal number one of the Artemis mission. Artemis one mission is testing this heat shield at lunar return velocities because when we make that trip around the moon and we come back, we are going in speeds of excess of 20,000 miles an hour. So when we slam into the Earth's atmosphere, it's going to heat that thing up to more, excuse me, more than 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, for the Artemis 1 profile, we're going to do what's known as a skip re-entry. So basically you can come in too shallow and skip off the atmosphere, too, uh, too narrow, and you're going to do what's known as a ballistic entry, which really heats things up. We're going to do kind of a mix where we're going to skip once off the atmosphere and that we're still going to get the heat, but that helps to reduce some of the G-loads on the crew. Once you're through that, you get to parachute deploy. There's 11 parachutes in total that are going to uh, slow Orion down before it splashes down. We're going to be going from 20,000 miles an hour to about 300 miles an hour before those parachutes deploy. And then they do a final job of getting it in the water in the South Pacific. We've got these big orange balloons, that's an uprighting system. So even if Orion landed in the water upside down, those can, those can inflate and they put us back upright into what's known as stable one. That's where you want your spacecraft to be, nice and upright in the water, especially if you're an astronaut in there floating. Now, we also have a large US Navy ship uh, with a big bay that's gonna basically come up and swallow Orion into its deck. And you've got a couple of other assets in the area to help recover hardware, the forward bay cover, parachutes, things like that. But that's scheduled to happen 26 days after a launch today. So that's 26 days from liftoff here in Florida around the moon to a splashdown in the Pacific. And that will be the first mission in the Artemis program, the farthest we've ever sent a human rated spacecraft in history. And just the first step before we put people on board. So 
That's a look at everything still to come. We're counting down to that launch. I'll send it back over to Megan and the team at the host desk, guys. A very comprehensive look at that. Thank you so much, Dan. If you're just joining us, welcome to Kennedy Space Center and our live coverage of Artemis 1, an uncrewed flight test that will return us to the moon in nearly 50 years. But you know, some might ask, why the moon? Well, here's why. We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible with science fiction turned reality, with innovations that have spun industries all their own, and with demonstrations of peace for all humankind. We soar in the skies of our home planet. We maintain a human presence just outside of gravity, and we touch points all across the solar system and beyond. We're going back to the moon, and this is why. The moon is a treasure trove of science. It holds opportunities for us to make discoveries about our home planet, about our sun, and about our solar system. The wealth of knowledge to be gleaned from the moon will inspire a new generation of thought and action. Without fail, every major program and mission NASA has invested in has led to technologies and capabilities that have shaped our culture. The breakthroughs of the Artemis era will define our generation and the generations to follow. The tens of thousands of jobs associated with propelling us to the moon today are just the beginning of a lunar economy that will see hundreds of thousands of new jobs develop around the world. This is not an ambition of one entity or one country. The exploration of the moon is a shared effort. Woven together by a desire for the greater good. Why the moon? Because the missions of tomorrow will be sparked by the accomplishments of the Artemis generation today. Because the ambition to go has already begun. And because Mars is calling. We need to learn what it takes to establish a community on another cosmic shore. So let's camp close before pushing out. And so, we go to the moon now, not as a series of isolated missions, but to build a community on and around the moon capable of proving how to live on other worlds. We'll use the lessons for more than 50 years of peaceful exploration to send a new generation to the lunar surface to stay. We will anchor our efforts on the Lunar South Pole to establish the Artemis Base Camp, positioning us for long-term science and exploration of the lunar surface. We will prove what it takes to assemble a complex ship in deep space. We will perfect descending down to and returning from a distant surface. We will learn how humans can survive and thrive in a partial gravity environment. With improved spacesuit designs, mobile habitats, and with reconnaissance robots pre-positioning and relocating supplies. We will learn how to utilize the resources we find on these other worlds. Starting with finding water ice and purifying it to drinkable water. And refining that into hydrogen for fuel and oxygen to breathe. We will establish fission power plants on the surface of the moon, capable of supporting a growing community of efforts. And we will expand the logistics supply chain to enable commercial and international partners to resupply and refuel deep space outposts. None of this is simple or easy, but nothing in our history ever has been. The eagle has landed. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. This kind of continuous lunar presence is a natural extension of all that we've learned in low Earth orbit. And what we will accomplish there will ensure the monumental missions to Mars are within reach as we ready the launch of the first Artemis mission and as commercial companies ready their lunar landers for the first private payload deliveries, we have already begun to take the next step.
Throughout this launch broadcast, uh, our NASA's Leah Martin has been introducing us to people over at the uh, Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex who have come out for uh, hopefully the maiden voyage of Artemis One. Uh, people from near and far, young and old, uh, just really excited to hopefully see uh, this historic flight. So now she's joined by somebody else who has a really interesting story. Leah, tell us about it. Megan, I think one of the most exciting things about being here tonight is being with people who are like minded, who have such a strong tie to the history of our nation's space program and their love of space flight. And I actually struck up an amazing conversation with Scott here, and you were telling me about the special tie that you have to tonight's launch as well. Oh, yeah, I, I, I grew up, literally grew up with NASA. My father went to work with the NACA before NASA. Work, went to work for Dr. Von Braun, followed him over to Marshall Space Flight Center, and became, you know, when it became NASA, he worked on the Jupiter C, Redstone, Saturn 1, Saturn 5, and then because of that, he brought me here to see Apollo 11 launch. So that was my first launch. I was five years old. I loved it. Still remember the sound. That's about all. But and then years later, through my flying career, I was able to bring my sons back with my friends that flew the shuttle and they saw five launches and four landings. But basically I wanted to be here. I was here for the first moon launch, the last moon launch back when Uncle Gene Cernan, our family friend, went to on Apollo 17. So I, I wanted to be here for this because it's, it's kind of in our family, in our blood and hopefully I'll be around for the next one when we go and land again. So that's incredible. So you have NASA actually in your DNA, grew up with the program. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I knew uh, most of the German scientists, uh, the kids sat in our lab, Dr. Ernst Stirlinger, and uh, my father flew with Von Braun because he was a general aviation pilot as well. So uh, they'd get off work and fly, and uh, it was, it, they were in Life Magazine together. National Geographic, so it was fun. I, I literally got to <laughs> new Al Shepard, all the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo guys, and uh, it was an honor. I, I would have loved to have been an astronaut, but I went a different route, and uh, but I can still come here and see him. We can, and we're so, yeah. so grateful, so thrilled to see you here tonight, and uh, so excited that you will be able to actually compare the last launch and the sound of the last one with the one tonight. It's absolutely to gonna rock louder. the sky. I want it to be even louder. I want to feel it. Yeah. Thank well, you. thanks so much for joining us tonight. It's been an honor to meet you. Yeah. And Megan, we're going back to you. Leah, thank you so much for sharing that. That was such a fun story. Here we are now at Space Center Houston. This is a live look inside of the visitor center there. Uh, lots of people uh, hoping to see the launch today. I love this guy in the front with his NASA <laughs> shirt representing. Uh, and again, just seeing children and young and old, just all these people who uh, feel captivated and, and are excited about our next giant leap into deep space. So glad to have them here. Oh my gosh, I love this. <laughs> yeah, the team in Marshall in Huntsville there is always ready for their shot. Waving their <laughs> flag, they're super pumped. That's the home to the SLS program office, so they have a dog in the fight tonight they seeing do. Artemis launch for the first time. Is that an inflatable astronaut in the center? center? Do you see that? I think somebody is dressed oh, up as yeah, an astronaut. Look at that. Yeah, they're representing. Ready to go. I love this. Yeah, I'm so glad that they're there. Again, these visitor centers are closed to the public, but, uh, you know, the uh, people there decided to hold a watch party. Oh, and look, that's our exciting friends to in see. Germany are ready for us <laughs> this time. They're, I know, they clapping. They anticipated the delay. They look pumped and ready to go. <laughs> so these are employees of Airbus. Airbus is the uh, main contractor for the European Space Agency. And to Two valves, liquid oxygen valves in the upper stage. That work is almost done. We are now a minute and a half away from the pole of the mission management team, which is several minutes before T minus 15 minutes. When that pole starts, we'll get a clearer picture of our T zero.
NASA, NASA's test director has informed the launch team to all switch to a common communication channel. It's called 230, 232. And what this means is that uh, the entire launch team is now on one channel and all future communication will happen there, whereas there are many channels. Now they reduce it down to one. Just heard from NASA test director Carlos Monge. I'm sorry, Jeff Spaulding. Jeff Spaulding's on. They swapped out. There are currently no constraints to launch. Great news. Again, no constraints to launch. And they're getting ready to pick up with a poll to determine readiness for launch. Okay, NASA test director Jeff Spaulding getting ready to conduct the readiness poll. So we are getting close. We're going to pull up the audio now so that you can listen in. LPs go. And rock. Rock is go. All right, copy all. And Launch Director NTD, our launch team is ready to proceed at this time. I copy all NTD. At this time, I will proceed with my poll. And attention on 232, this is the Launch Director performing the final poll for launch. Verify no constraints and go for launch. EGS Program Chief Engineer. EGS Program Chief Engineer verifies that the EGS, SLS, and Arroyan Program Chief Engineers have no constraints and are go for launch. Copy, Greg. Thank you. EGS Chief Safety Officer. The EGS uh, CSO verifies the SLS, Orion, and EGS CSOs uh, have no constraints uh, and are go for launch. Copy, John. Thank you. Range weather. Weather has no constraints and weather is go for launch. Copy LWO and Mission Manager. And Mission Manager, Launch Director. Launch Director, Mission Manager on 232. The Mission Management Team has been pulled. You have a go to proceed with terminal count and launch of Artemis 1. I copy all. Thank you. And Entity, Launch Director. Go ahead, Launch Director. Yes, sir. On behalf of all the men and women across our great nation who have worked to bring this hardware together to make this day possible, and for the Artemis generation, this is for you. At this time, I give you a go to resume count and launch Artemis 1. Copy, Launch Director, and thank you. All right, we do have a couple of steps to configure, and then we will be ready to resume the clock. CVSE, NTD. CVSE here. Initiate recording of Orion cameras at this time. In work. R, NTD. RSR here. Perform the booster ignition SNA arm rotation enable. NDT, RSR, booster ignition SNA arm and rotation enable is complete. And I copy. Thank you. Okay. So there you heard the poll from Launch Director. 
really. Getting ready to get that new T0 time. The poll that you heard was the NASA test director's poll. And all right, and we have verified no cutouts at this time. And all personnel, we are going to resume the clock. GLS, you can resume the clock on your mark. GLS copies. Countdown clock will resume on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. GLS mainline has been initiated. Okay. T minus 10 minutes and counting. We are T minus 10 minutes away from liftoff of Artemis 1. As you can see, the clock is now moving. Let's put that up. T minus 9 minutes and 47 seconds. The L minus 15 pole complete. Uh, show 06, 47, 44 is the new liftoff time. Affirm. Okay. O one forty seven forty four one forty seven a.m. Eastern Time and forty four seconds. We went straight into terminal count. Lift off now nine minutes away. So terminal count. Control has been given over to the GLS, the ground launch sequencer, a computer and software that is doing all of the commanding and monitoring of the space launch system. We'll hear callouts from the GLS operator, Alex Pandalos. as well as NASA test director Jeff Spaulding. GLS is pre-tensioning the umbilicals at this very moment. You can see them as they run down the rocket. That's getting them ready to detach. At liftoff, those arms will swing away, will let go of the rocket in a clockwise direction. T minus eight minutes and counting. The GLS is uh, performing up to 100 commands per second, inclu including configuring ground systems for power transfer to the rocket. GLS is turning on cameras, recording video inside and outside the crew module to collect data for engineers. Purging the aft skirt booster with high flow nitrogen. Clear out any hydrogen gas that may be there. You can see the crew access arm is already retracted. When there is crew during Artemis II, it would happen at T minus six minutes. But out of abundance of caution, they went ahead and retracted the arm well ahead of liftoff. Want to point your attention to the base of the mobile launcher. If something wasn't done to reduce the power from the pressure caused by the rocket's ignition and thunderous sound, it could damage the rocket. So the ignition over pressure and sound suppression system will flood the mobile launcher with water. You'll see that sequence start at T minus 17 seconds. Now coming up in less than 30 seconds, the ground launch sequencer will start bringing the high energy systems online, starting with core stage pressurization. Fire room one is completely silent as they listen for the next call. GLS is go for core stage tank pressurization. The core stage tank is now pressuring, pressurizing to flight levels. The replenish valve to the liquid hydrogen tank now closing. The liquid oxygen tank will come a little later. 
Now we're arming your, the Orion Ascent pyros and transfer to internal power. The launch abort system, or LAS jettison motor, is now armed. On this flight, the abort motor is inactive because there is no crew on board. Up next is the flight termination system, or FTS, which gives the Space Force the ability to destruct the rocket if it goes in the wrong direction. Let's listen in for that. GLS is go for FTS arm. The flight termination system is now armed. Coming up at four minutes and 40 seconds, a big moment. This is where the RS-25 engines and their bleed go to high flow. It's been a little tricky to dial in. GLS is go for LH-2 high flow bleed check. Good word, we've passed that. The cryo team got the LH-2 engine bleed pressure loop dialed in. They are now at the right temperature for launch. Countdown continues. T minus four minutes, 15 seconds. Up next, GLS fires up the KPUs. Those are high speed turbines which provide pressure to hydraulic pumps that steer the RS-25s. Stands for core stage auxiliary power unit start. GLS is go for core stage APU start. That now leads to the thrust vector control test at T minus two minutes and 30 seconds. That can proceed now, and we will see the engine's gimbal at the bottom of the core stage. At T minus three minutes and 10 seconds, you will hear the go for purge sequence four. That's a helium purge of the four core stage engines downstream of the propellant valve, getting the air and moisture out. GLS is go for purge sequence four. And in just a few seconds, GLS will close the core stage LOX vent, liquid oxygen. The white vapor cloud caused from the super cold gaseous oxygen condensing the water in the atmosphere will disappear. You see it coming out there now. And there it goes, it's closed. LOX vent closed, pressure rising in the core stage LOX tank to flight levels. Coming up in 15 seconds, look for that thrust vector control actuator test. Engines will gimbal. And there they go. The four core stage RS-25 engines gimbling around, testing the ability to steer the rocket into space. They will operate at 109% performance, each RS-25 throwing down a half million pounds of thrust, all four, two million pounds, all together with the boosters, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. GLS is good for upper stage to internal power. Now the upper stage has gone to internal power. So power is removed from the rocket's upper stage, the ICPS, and it's been switched to battery power. The same milestone is coming up for the core stage at T minus one minute and 30 seconds. GLS is go for core stage to internal power. The rocket's core stage, which houses the three flight computers, is now on battery power. So there is no more hold time available because there's no more margin on the battery. So if we hold, have a hold, we'd have to recycle back to T minus 10 minutes and recharge those batteries. The count continues. A note now, shortly after liftoff. One minute. Shortly after liftoff, Mission Control Houston will take control of the rocket, and my colleague, Leah Cheshire, will take over commentary. T minus 50 seconds and counting. Coming up at T minus 33 seconds, the GLS will hand off control to the ALS. This is the autonomous launch sequencer. On board the rocket, it will take over command and control of the rocket. 
but the ALS will check, make sure there's no holds coming from the ground up until T minus two seconds. Is go for ALS. And we are go for ALS. The Space Launch System is now counting down to lift off of Orion on its maiden voyage to the moon. Launch team can no longer recycle the count. Sound suppressor water now flowing 15. under the ML. And here we go. 10. Hydrogen burnoff igniters initiated. Seven, six, five, four stage engine start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. All four RS-25 engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. Hearing good, con good control on the roll from teams in Mission Control Houston. All good calls so far. Now 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. First milestone will be for the vehicle to pass through max Q at about 1 minute and 9 seconds into launch. This is the greatest period of atmospheric force on the rocket. traveling 607 miles per hour. You're looking at 8.8 .8 million pounds of maximum thrust quiet here in the loops in mission control. Four core stage engines throttling down ahead of passing through max Q. traveling at 1,420 miles per hour. The four core stage engines are back at maximum thrust. The next major milestone will be for the solid rocket boosters to cut off and jettison at about two minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, so about 30 seconds from now. Again, quiet here in Mission Control Houston as teams continue monitoring the flight of Artemis 1. We're now 16 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center, traveling over 2,800 miles per hour. Standing by for solid rocket booster jettison and shortly thereafter. confirmation that the solid rocket boosters have separated these 177 foot boosters. Now the core stage continues to power the flight of Orion, all four RS-25 engines firing, traveling over 3,400 miles per hour, 46 miles downrange. Two minutes and 36 seconds into the flight. Hearing nominal calls here in Mission Control Houston. We've still got four good engines on the core stage. Next up, we'll be looking for the service module fairing to separate. This is three 15 by 15 foot fairing panels, providing structural support, protecting the service module. Those will separate at about three minutes and 11 seconds into flight, and very shortly thereafter will be followed by the launch abort system separation. Just over three minutes into the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 4,060 miles per hour, 83 miles downrange. We just had confirmation that the service module fairing has separated. And that the launch abort system pyros have fired, separating those from Orion as well. For future crew members. We just heard the call for three engine press, meaning if SLS were to lose an engine at this point in the mission, we could still achieve a nominal mission. We would just have an extended main engine cutoff time. However, we still have four good engines, all at maximum thrust right now, powering the first flight of Artemis at 5,200 miles per hour, 148 miles downrange. We're four minutes and 16 seconds into the flight of Artemis One. 
So far, we've had a clean ascent. We saw those solid rocket boosters jettison about two minutes and 11 seconds after liftoff. Shortly after, we had the service module panels fairings separate, as well as the launch abort system. The launch abort system was inert for this flight, except to perform this separation. Those four core stage engines will continue to fire and power the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 6,800 miles per hour, 229 miles downrange. Booster flight controller reports that the engines are looking good. Our core stage main engine cutoff time is about eight minutes and three seconds. We are now five minutes and 11 seconds into the flight, 7,656 7, miles per hour. Again, four good core stage engines, those four RS-25 engines. The last time those core stage engines flew, they were taking space shuttles to orbit, and now with upgraded capabilities, they're launching the future of human spaceflight. Five minutes, 42 seconds into the mission, we are now traveling 8,800 miles per hour, 345 miles downrange from the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center. Again, we are anticipating core stage main engine cutoff at about eight minutes and three seconds. And about 10 seconds later, we'll see core stage separation, at which point Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will be flying free. Now traveling over 10,000 miles per hour, six minutes and 15 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1, 427 miles downrange. Quiet here on the loops in Mission Control Houston. Teams continue to monitor this first flight. About a minute and a half now until that core stage main engine cutoff time. Our four core stage engines continue to fire maximum thrust. Coming up on seven minutes since launch today, now traveling over 12,800 miles per hour, 563 miles downrange. Again, still quiet here in Mission Control, Houston. As we prepare for main engine cutoff, the four RS-25 engines are beginning to throttle down. Thirty seconds now until core stage main engine cutoff. All four engines continue to throttle down. Now seven minutes, 45 seconds into the flight, traveling over 16,000 miles per hour. Continuing to hear good calls here in Mission Control Houston. We're standing by for core stage main engine cutoff. And we have confirmation of core stage main engine cutoff, Orion, and it's now in Earth's orbit. The flight dynamics officer reports that we have a nominal main engine cutoff. And we just heard the call for core stage separation. That means Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage are now flying free from the core stage of the space launch system. The next milestone will be solar array deploy approximately 18 minutes after liftoff. But before Orion stretches its wings, let's check back in with our friends at Kennedy Space Center and hear all about what it was like to hear the rocket roar off the launch pad. Megan and Kayla, I've got to hear all about it. <laughs> well, if you're just joining us, welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center where we just watched Artemis One launch, our first step towards our next adventure into deep space. As Leah said, I'm NASA's Megan Cruz, and this is NASA astronaut Kayla Barron. And I'm kind of still giddy and speechless. I don't even know how to explain how I'm feeling right now. I feel the same way. This is the first launch that I've been able to I watch know. in person. And I've got to say, it was incredible. I was just, it took my breath away, and I was tearing up just 
what an, an amazing accomplishment for this team, this international team, people who have been dedicating their careers to getting this rocket off the ground and taking the first step to getting a crew on that vehicle back to the moon. It was just incredible. Yeah, it, this is a moment I think that we're all going to remember where we were when we saw this sort of thing, you know what I mean? And it was great to see, again, when we entered into Terminal Count, everybody here just started cheering, you know, coming out to get a really good view. And boy, I mean, it lit up the night sky and it just shook everything around us. Did you feel that? Like in my bones, I felt that. Oh yeah, the, I mean, the cool thing is just kind of the delay between what you see and yes. what you hear because of course the sound travels a little bit slower uh, and it was just amazing. The, the ground shook, we could hear the thrust pushing that rocket into space. 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. Yes. It's incredible. It yeah. was amazing to see here live in person. How does it compare? So this is your first launch on the ground. How does it compare to your launch when you're in the capsule soaring towards space? I mean, equally emotional, I think. Yeah. One th we train for everything, and so when we're in that capsule waiting for launch, we're just running our procedures. You could almost you know, trick us and say that we were in the simulator and it wasn't real, but like in that moment of liftoff, when the thrust builds underneath you, like we saw it today, it's just hard not to be overwhelmed by the emotional experience, the excitement, the joy of that moment. It's incredible. Yeah, I, I think we can't say it enough. This team really deserved this moment. They've been working so hard for this moment. When I heard that we got into terminal count, it was, <laughs> I felt a sense of relief and excitement for them that I think everybody here did. You know, we really wanted them to succeed. We really wanted to see the launch today. And wow, I, I will never forget this. Me neither. It was an incredible experience to be here and see that happen. Yeah, was there anything that was particularly surprising to you? Again, this is your first launch. You know, what were you expecting? You know, I think uh, we also had a nighttime launch for our launch. And so I, I think one thing you underestimate is how much it lights up the night sky. Yes. We were able to watch it all the way through that trajectory. We were able to see the boosters separate and everything. So it was just an incredible view. It's amazing how much you get to see of the flight path when it's at night and it's lighting up the sky. Yeah, and I don't know if you notice this, but we see the moon here and it and yeah. the trajectory of the rocket looked like it was flying <laughs> towards me. You know what I mean? I was like, oh my God, that's so poetic. It's so beautiful. I'm so glad we launched today. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations absolutely. to the team. It's so incredible. We're going to head over to Daryl, who was at the launch team. Daryl, you got to count us down through that, uh, uh, through liftoff. I mean, how was that being in the launch, uh, launch uh, uh, control center with them? Well, Megan, it was, uh, it was something else. I got to tell you, you're looking live inside the firing room where Charlie Blackwell Thompson is about to address her team after a whole lot of hard work and preparation to get to this moment. Let's stand by and listen to her now. Com check. But you can't hear it in the room. Can you guys hear me? No. Hey, Jeremy, can you just run something on the microphone? The press side can hear me, but the, the room can't. The room can't. You can hear me? Because the guys. I don't know what he's telling me to do. Is here. Can Associate you guys hear me? Oh, there we go. Is he ready for me?
Well, for once, I might be speechless. So you guys know I have talked a lot about appreciating the moment that you're in. And we have worked hard as a team. You guys have worked hard as a team for this moment. This is your moment. It is not by chance that you are here today. So I want you to look around, look around at this team and know that you have earned it. You have earned your place in the room. You've earned this moment. You have earned your place in history. You were part of a first. Doesn't come along very often. Once in a career, maybe but we are all part of something incredibly special, the first launch of Artemis. The first step in returning our country to the moon and on to Mars. What you have done will what you have done today will inspire generations to come. So thank you. Thank you for your resilience. You know, I said at the pretest briefing, the harder the climb, the better the view. We showed the Space Coast tonight. What a beautiful view it is. So congratulations. So we got a couple of traditions here in launch control. And the first one is when you're in the position for the first time, you get a tie cutting. And so I have my launch director scissors. And I'm going to get my tie cut by a couple of legends that are here. And then Anyone who wants their tie cut will be making the rounds in the firing room. You got your console chiefs, if they want to do it, that's fine. If you want me to do it, you might have to wait a little while, but I'll stay all night if I have to. It'll be my pleasure to cut ties. So I'm going to get going to take care of mine, and then I have one other presentation that I want to make this evening. This is Charlie Blackwell Thompson, Artemis One Launch Director. She just got her tie cut. That is a tradition here at NASA. We just got to hear her talk to the team. And one thing that really stuck out to me that she said is that they've really earned their place in history. We're coming up on Solar Array Deploy. Let's go on to Leah. Thanks, Megan. And yes, we're here in Mission Control Houston, still monitoring the Artemis One mission and the first flight of Orion atop the Space Launch System. So far, we saw successful liftoff at 1.47 a.m. Eastern Time, um, all the way through separation from the core stage. We now have Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage flying free. And we've just heard that we have initiated solar array deploy. So we are turning our focus uh, to that. The spacecraft was running on battery power, but stretching things wings will allow it to stop relying on those batteries and significantly extend the time it can stay in space. So solar array deploy takes about 12 minutes. We have four solar arrays that we need to deploy and latch. These will provide power to the spacecraft on its journey to distant retrograde orbit and all the way back to Earth. Once these are properly configured, again, Orion will no longer need to rely solely on battery power. And we expect this to be done about 30 minutes after liftoff. Right now, we're 19 minutes since liftoff today. Uh, Orion is now traveling 17,175 miles per hour. 
We're continuing to hear good calls here in Mission Control Houston from the flight controllers monitoring the mission. A little bit about these solar arrays as we wait. Uh, again, we heard the call that the deploy has been initiated. We'll hear a little bit more about that um, once they start to unfold. These four solar arrays generate 11 kilowatts of power, which is enough electricity to power two three-bedroom houses, and they have a wingspan of 63 feet. Just one of these six and a half by six and a half foot panels has uh, 1,250 solar cells. So you're looking at a total of 15,000 solar cells. Now we just heard the call that all four solar arrays have been released. So we initially heard the initiation call. That command had been sent. Now those four solar arrays are released. Again, this is about a 12 minute process. The solar arrays will deploy straight, and you're getting a live view right now. This is really exciting. Uh, they'll eventually be swept back against the vehicle prior to translunar injection burn to prevent any loads from breaking or damaging the arrays. And on the end of each solar array is a camera that will capture imagery for us throughout the mission, along with a few other cameras placed outside and inside the spacecraft to help us monitor and perform various other inspections. Of course, if you recall the Apollo capsule design, there were no solar arrays. We had fuel cells instead. So this design with arrays gives us the opportunity to stay in orbit longer since we practically have no limit to the energy available for use from the sun. Coming up on 21 minutes since liftoff. Orion is attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. You can see those four solar arrays unfolding now. And again, Artemis 1 is a flight test. It's paving the way for a sustainable presence at the moon. Looking forward to the future, Gateway will be our space station in lunar orbit. And we have some similarities and differences in the solar arrays unfolding right now on Orion and those that'll be on Gateway. So like we're seeing now, these are deploying autonomously. Uh, the Gateway solar arrays will as well. And while these generate those 11 kilowatts of power, the two rollout solar arrays, or ROSAs, on Gateway will generate 60 kilowatts of power. That ROSA design is currently being tested aboard the space station. We have two new ones installed and a spacewalk conducted earlier today, preparing for another set. Coming up on 22 minutes since liftoff today, Orion and the interim cryogenic propulsion stage traveling over 16,800 miles per hour. The solar arrays deploying now are part of the European service module. It's comprised of 20,000 parts and components. The service module was developed as part of an agreement between NASA and the European Space Agency, or ESA. This is the first time NASA is using a European-built system as a critical element to power an American spacecraft. Coming up now and 24 minutes into the flight of Artemis 1, yeah. spacecraft now traveling at 16,500 miles per hour around the Earth. We are in solar array deploy and we have confirmation all four arrays are deployed.
Coming up in a little less than 30 minutes is the perigee raise maneuver. And with our launch at 1.41 Eastern time this morning, we are looking for a perigee raise maneuver about 53 minutes into uh, today's flight. Again, we are now 25 minutes and 47 seconds into the flight, and we have a complete deployment of all four solar arrays. Orion's journey to the moon continues as planned. Again, looking forward to that perigee raise maneuver. That'll be coming up uh, again at about 53 minutes into the mission, so about 27 minutes from now. During the perigee raise maneuver, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will use its RL-10 engine to lift the lowest point of Orion in Earth's orbit. The current orbit is more of an oval shape than a perfect circle, and this burn will raise that point closest to Earth and make the orbit more circular. This will also include a checkout of Orion's systems and any adjustments to the solar arrays. It'll be a short burn, less than 30 seconds long, but critical to keep us on track, and it also prepares us for the next engine burn to send Orion to the moon. That's the translunar injection burn. That'll come up a little later, which is a longer burn, another firing of the RL-10 engine on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. We caught a glimpse there of those solar arrays, and with all four solar arrays properly deployed, Orion's journey to the moon continues, and we've got more operational updates coming up shortly, but for now, I'm going to toss it back to Megan and Kayla at Kennedy. Leah, thank you so much. Our return to the moon will be different than the last time. We plan to explore more of the lunar surface and learn how to live and work there. With more on our destination, let's bring back NASA's Dan Hewitt with our new moon board. Hey, thanks, Megan. I, I got to be honest, we ran outside to catch it. I'm still shaking a little bit. That, that never gets old. That is always one of the coolest things you'll ever see in your entire life. And that rocket was massive and loud and just the, so cool. All right, the moon. This is why we call it the moon board, but the moon, you know, since the dawn of time, humans have looked at the sky and shouted at our neighbor, I'm gonna walk in your face. And in the 60s, we actually did it. Uh, six times, starting with Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 11, 1969, followed by five more successive landings, each time delivering two human beings to the surface of the moon. Our last one was Apollo 17, and that was in 1972, Gene Cernan and Harrison Smith stepping off for the last time. Now, we have not sent humans back since then, but they accomplished a lot under Apollo. Lots of technological advancements, deployed science instruments, brought back hundreds of pounds of lunar rocks and regolith, teaching us about the moon and also about our place in the solar system. The moon is fascinating because it doesn't have a lot of the geological processes we have here on Earth. You don't have erosion, you don't have wind and water wearing down rocks, you don't have plate tectonics that are constantly recycling the crust. And so everything out there is really old. In fact, one of the rocks brought back on Apollo 15 called the Genesis Rock was dated to be four billion years old. So from the primordial beginnings of our solar system. But as Kayla said a little bit earlier, those missions were measured in days, their spacewalks in just hours. With Artemis, we're looking to go and we're looking to stay. And we're not looking around the equator like our, uh, under Apollo, we're looking 
at the lunar south pole. Now, why? So we haven't sent people since the 70s to the moon, but we haven't stopped studying it. We've had orbiters like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which has literally just been flying loops around the moon, taking high resolution images of the surface, so high resolution that you can look them up. They have images of all the different Apollo landing sites and you can actually see the footprints, the paths they left in the lunar regolith of those sites. Uh, we had a mission called LCROSS, which slammed a probe into a crater on the moon, sending out material, some of which potentially hadn't seen direct sunlight for billions of years, and then analyzing what shot out. And through missions like that and others, we've been able to find that there is water ice trapped in those permanently shadowed areas on the moon. A lot of them center around that South Pole. We have already identified 13 potential landing sites for the Artemis III mission. And these are where we're going to send our astronauts around the lunar south pole to access that water ice. Now, why water? Why are we caring about water? Well, it serves a lot of purposes. Obviously for humans, you need that to breathe. You can split water apart, get oxygen for breathing gas for an atmosphere. If you have a lunar base, you can split it into oxygen and hydrogen. That's rocket fuel. We just launched the most powerful rocket in history using those constituent parts. And so you can start to live off the land. We can use that, something called in situ resource utilization. And really, the whole point of that is to use the moon as this proving ground. We're trying to get to Mars. We're trying to learn to live on other planets where there is gravity, where we're going to have to use resources there on the ground because we won't be able to bring everything with us. And by going to the Lunar South Pole, by going to stay under Artemis, we're going to be able to start practicing that. We're going to perfect those systems, perfect those techniques and operations we need to do that so we can use the moon as that jumping off point to Mars and beyond. So that's why the moon. We're going to see Orion fly around it for the very first time in just a couple of days. That launch is spectacular. I'm still way too excited, uh, but can't wait to see some shots of the moon from up close from Orion. So I'll send it back over to you, Megan. Thanks so much, Dan. So right now we're actually joined by members of the Red Crew. You'll remember from watching the launch coverage that the Red Crew was sent out by the launch team when the launch team uh, identified a small leak on a hydrogen valve inside of the mobile launcher. Well, now here they are. This is Trent Annis. Trent, can you just uh, um, introduce everybody else here on your team? Yeah, so this is Chad. He's our safety guy. And behind me is Billy. And he's the uh, experienced hydrogen tech out here. And the three of you guys really, I would say, saved the day today. I mean, really, you guys had to go in there to what's called the blast danger zone. You guys are specially trained uh, to be able to do uh, operations on the pad while cryo is loading. Talk to us about getting that call, being told, hey, you guys need to go in there. And it was the first time for all three of you. Yeah, all I could say is we were very excited. <laughs> I was ready to get up there and go. Really? How, how are you guys feeling? Very, very comfortable, very confident in the test team and uh, the procedures and our training. We uh, we did a great job. Walk yeah. us. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. How gratifying it must be for you guys because you you train for this eventuality, but don't always get to do it. Billy was saying that he's been a Red Crew team member for 37 years, and this is the first time he's been called to go into the blast danger zone. So I know for us, when we're training for all of these eventualities, whether it's a spacewalk or robotics operations, you really want to put that training into practice. How do you guys feel like it went today? Amazing. I still can't believe it. It's surreal to me. It's just insane. Yeah, kind of walk us through what you were thinking. So you get there and, and what? Is it just like game time and you're really focused or, you know, how, how are you feeling? Yeah, I'd say we were, ex we were very focused on what was happening up there. Just making sure we knew what was happening. Because the rockets, you know, it's alive. It's creaking. It's making venting noises. It's, it's pretty scary. So on zero deck, my heart was pumping. Mm -hmm. My nerves were going, but yeah, we showed up today. I think <laughs> as soon as we walked up those stairs, we were ready to rock and roll. And they were telling us a bit about it while you're working on it. You guys were actually just torquing down the valve to prevent or reduce the leak rate or stop the leak. Is that right? That's right. Just the packing gland it was a little loose. So went up there and tightened her up. You're probably still like in this, oh my gosh, moment like all of us are. You know, has it actually hit you like the role you played today in making Artemis One launch? 
you know, I still can't believe it. Like, it's, like I said, it's surreal and just amazing. I don't know about you guys, but. <laughs> <laughs> They're nodding along behind yeah. you, <laughs> for sure. Uh, anything you want to say to the launch team? Again, this is a big day for the launch team, for you guys, um, NASA, but really the whole world. I mean, this is a historic launch that I think we'll all remember. Uh, we'll all remember, really. You know, we had a lot of people here helping us out, a lot of teams, firing room. I'm sure that was hectic. And, uh, you know, NASA, Boeing, all the other companies did a great job, and we're glad to be part of it. One well, thing I like, always like to say is space flight is a team sport, and I think you guys perfectly demonstrated that today, right? Like, none of us could accomplish this on our own. It takes a really complex team. Nobody can be an expert in all of the systems, all the technology, all the workarounds we might have to do to get a rocket off the pad. So thank you for the role you played in that team today. It's thank awesome. You. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. I appreciate you coming by to talk with us. All right, it's now been about 35 minutes since liftoff of Artemis 1. Orion and ICPS are now free flying, so let's head back to Leah again to talk about how the journey is going so far. Thanks, Megan, and it has been a pretty smooth ride so far, and uh, we are now, again, like you mentioned, coming up on 36 minutes since launch. That puts us about 17 minutes into the perigee, until the perigee raise maneuver. That's going to be the maneuver that lifts the lowest point of Orion's orbit around the Earth and puts us where we need to be ahead of the translunar injection burn. The translunar injection burn is that really long burn that we're going to need to send us on to the moon. So we've been treated to some exciting views from the spacecraft today, um, including, and we hope to see some from inside the cabin, um, but we expect to continue receiving photo updates throughout the mission. It takes a team, though, to bring the imagery of Orion down to Earth, so let's meet them. The imagery that we're collecting on Artemis One and the mission itself is preparing to carry humans to the moon the Orion Imager team is going to be monitoring every aspect of visual spacecraft performance for the entire duration of the mission. The first time that we're going to be live streaming digital video from its spacecraft back down to the Earth from the vicinity of the Moon. That's never been done before. What we'll be transmitting live streaming will be lower resolution, more compressed, because we have to fit it into a, a thinner pipe, if you will. Every one of these cameras is in its position where it is and is configured the way it is for a very specific reason. We're going to be monitoring anything that we can see with the cameras for spacecraft performance. The imagery teams at NASA are composed of dozens and dozens of very highly trained, very specialized people, engineers, technicians, analysts. If we can see it, we're going to try and keep an eye on it. Imagery has been invaluable throughout the history of NASA. We flew cameras on Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, all of that stuff that we saw with the astronauts around the moon. It helps us detect the unknown unknowns. It allows us to see things that we didn't anticipate happening before. So when we do fly people on Artemis II, we can have a high confidence that everything is working the way it should. I love getting a look at those teams that we don't normally see, like the red team that Megan and Kayla just got to interview. A really big thanks to them and everyone that made this liftoff happen tonight. So uh, we are going to toss it back to Megan and Kayla now at KSC. Again, we're about 15 minutes away from Perigee Race Maneuver. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, we wanted to take us back into Orion and talk about some of the science that's being enabled by Artemis One today. So inside of Orion are 10 of these. So they're called CubeSats because they're tiny satellites. Essentially, they're the size of the shoebox when they're folded down. But then once they're deployed, they're opened up. They have solar arrays, things like that. That's when it gets a lot bigger. Now, these are called secondary payloads for this mission. Kayla, can you talk to us about what secondary payloads are? Yeah, it just really means that it's not a primary objective of the mission. It's not, we're not relying on the success of these CubeSats for overall mission success. It's kind of a bonus payload, right? A chance to deploy these satellites that have different sensors on them and collect some awesome data to support other research objectives. Yeah, and I know battery life was a concern for some of them, but all 10 were deployed and scientists, I'm sure, are eager to see what kind of information that hopefully they'll be able to get. And they're just some of several research projects on this flight that will help gather data about the moon and more.
Artemis One is paving the way for us to explore deeper and deeper into space. I think Artemis One is significant on so many levels. It is a new frontier to do science. So the primary objective is to test the Orion spacecraft integrated with the Space Launch System. And it is designed to, to carry out the, the boldest of the bold missions. But it's more than just learning how to travel in space. We're taking a lot of cool science along with us on this first mission to the moon. So as NASA plans to go back, to the surface of the moon and then onto Mars. We want to spend more time there, and that's riskier business. So the more we learn about the moon itself and the environment where we'll be operating, the better we can prepare. We have 10 CubeSats we call secondary payloads, which are small scientific spacecraft of their own that will each be conducting their own scientific mission. All of these payloads in some form or fashion will help us going forward. They are going to be studying the moon. And they're going to help us understand what is the moon made out of, what types of rocks, what types of regolith, what types of ice, what's mixed in with water that might be present. One of them actually is going to attempt to land on the moon. They're going to be studying the sun understanding and studying the space environment or the space weather. Some different propulsion systems. These novel ideas will ultimately turn into the technology and the systems that we want to use going forward. There's a lot of cool things going on between all these CubeSats that make up our secondary payloads. Additionally, inside the Orion, we'll be flying an experiment to study space biology. Space biology is where we study the underlying changes that Earth-based biological systems undergo when they're in space. Or basically, how does life respond to the space environment? The level of ionizing radiation that you experience when you go beyond the Van Allen belt, so you go beyond the protective magnetic sphere that we have around us, you then get exposed to higher levels of ionizing radiation. So we are flying several space biology experiments. We will take a series of materials, plant seeds, fungi, the yeast cell, algae, and ride along the trip. And then when it comes home, we can analyze how they responded to that environment. This research will help us thrive in space. It will help us to go further and stay there longer. In addition to space biology, we'll be learning about how to make astronauts more effective in the Orion in the future. An example of that is something called the Callisto Technology Demonstration. Lockheed Martin built the Orion spacecraft for NASA and we'll be flying a secondary payload that's a demonstration payload called Callisto. So we took the technology from Amazon for Alexa and the WebEx technology from Cisco, and so we built a digital assistant, if you will, the custom space-qualified Alexa. Alexa, how does the life support system work? Orion's life support system is the environmental control and life support system oracles. And so this payload is a demonstration mission to show how astronauts in the future could use this technology as an innovative uh, user interface. So there you have it. I hope you agree with me. This is exciting. I am just over the moon excited for the Artemis One launch. The science we'll conduct on Artemis One lays the groundwork to ensure that we can safely conduct scientific activities at the moon with our astronauts going forward. This really is the stepping stone for us as we take that next giant leap in space exploration. So a lot of great science uh, also happening on the International Space Station. I got to speak with astronauts Jessica Watkins and Samantha Cristoforetti while they were still on board about the research there that will benefit future Artemis missions. Jessica, Samantha, your primary job on the space station is to maintain the orbiting lab and conduct science experiments, more than 200 before Crew 4 returns home. Jessica, can you tell me about one of the experiments that will help return us to the moon with the Artemis program? We do a lot of experiments where we are looking into developing new technologies that will um, enable us to go further into the solar system. And one of those technologies um, was the AstroRad um, experiment. Radiation is, is one of the challenges that we face when we think about going further into the solar system. And so this um, vest is an option for um, providing the crew member with protection. Um, and then um, one of the mannequins on Artemis One, launching here later this month, will also be wearing the vest. Um, we'll get a, a sense for um, its effectiveness on board as well. Samantha, I know that you've been doing a lot of work to test uh, how we would would grow crops in space. What crops are you growing on Space Station right now and, and what's unique about them? 
Indeed. Actually, right next to uh, to us, as we are talking to you, we have a little uh, space station vegetable garden. It's called uh, X Root, and in a few weeks, it will be full of uh, fully grown hopefully tomatoes and uh, carrot plants. I don't have much of a green thumb, I must confess, but when I harvested those plants and I could really like breathe in all that smell, even if there is no soil, it still has that smell that you would associate on the ground with uh, walking, you know, through a vegetable garden after a rainy day, you know, when there is that moist, the moisture in, in the air. And, and that was just so, so pleasant after, you know, such a long time living away from any kind of natural environment. It was very, very pleasant for me. If it makes you feel any better, I also do not have a green thumb. <laughs> um, so what about water? How are you testing critical life support systems like water uh, to hopefully help us stay off Earth longer than we ever have before? Sure, yes. So um, we, we kind of use the, um, the tagline that um, today's, yesterday's coffee um, becomes today's coffee. Um, so there's a, a process by which we can um, filter our, our urine. And so we are at the point now where we are able to recycle um, about 96% of the, um, essentially of our, our water um, on board and, and are continuing to test new technologies to get even closer to to the 98% utilization rate that we'll need for, um, for the moon in particular. Samantha, what are you most excited about for Artemis 1? Seeing that gigantic rocket take off, and uh, I think it will be just uh, you know, uh, a sign of, of all those great things to come. Jessica, you could one day walk on the moon as part of the Artemis program. How does that make you feel? The idea of being able to explore the, the surface of another planetary body, um, especially for me as a geologist and a, a planetary geologist specifically, is just super exciting. Um, all of the, the science that we're going to be able to conduct from the surface of the moon. Jessica, Samantha, thank you so much. And before you go, I'd love to see a flip. <laughs> I love, I love it. <laughs> and a they double backflip at that. <laughs> now, Kayla, you, of course, lived and worked on the International Space Station as part of Crew 3. Uh, you know, do you enjoy or did you enjoy doing all those science experiments while you were there? It's a lot of hard work. Yeah, it's incredible to be a part of the every single experiment. It's an honor to play a small role in it. We got to do some really cool tech demonstrations while we were up there, too. So for me as an engineer, that was really fun. That's a photo of me doing the first scanning electron microscope samples on the International Space Station. And it was cool for me because I worked with a scanning electron microscope in my graduate school research that took up like it was as big as this desk. Oh. But seeing a miniaturized version of those that we have up there and imagining how we could use it in a lunar or Martian laboratory to better analyze samples and decide what to bring home was really exciting. Yeah, and you touched on this earlier before, but I, I do think it's just so important to note again that you're doing science for scientists who've been working on um, their, their uh, studies for decades, some of them. So to fulfill that, how does that make you feel? It's incredible. We're almost like their laboratory technicians <laughs> for that little moment in time, you know, but they've been working their entire life sometimes, decades, years, to get that science payload up there. And it's a really unique laboratory environment. The microgravity environment, the space environment, the radiation environment, like you heard talked about in those videos, provides an opportunity to do science that we just can't do here on Earth. Yeah, and to think that what we do on the International Space Station can fuel future Artemis missions, I think the fact that they go hand in hand is really cool. All right, so let's take some more social media questions. Uh, social media is buzzing right now since we launched about 48 minutes ago. So why don't we take the first question, I think again from uh, actor, oh no. Let's see, Kayla, how do you feel after launch? <laughs> Super inspired. I mean, we talked about it earlier with the Red Crew and in the moments just after launch, but this is really the culmination of a giant team effort. It takes every single member of our team to pull off a successful launch. It's incredibly complicated, incredibly challenging, and in some cases kind of dangerous for a Red Crew team who went inside the blast danger area to make a fix that was critical today's launch. And so to see the team succeed and feel that excitement was incredible. Uh, I really still have um, Charlie Blackwell Thompson's words ringing in my head. The fact that she said the harder the climb, the better the view. Absolutely. 100% correct. All right, next question is from actor Jack Black. He starred in, in a movie called uh, Apollo 10 and a Half. He has a question for Kayla. 
Okay, Jack's final question. I promise. <laughs> Let's talk about Orion. How long will it take for Orion to fly around the moon and come home? And what's that re-entry gonna be like? Sounds like it might be a little hot. <laughs> Coming in hot. You're exactly right, Jack. It is a 26-day mission that we have planned for Artemis where it will go to the moon, go into a distant retrograde orbit, so we'll get a few close flybys and then some time in deep space past the moon. And then, yeah, that re-entry is going to be something else. It's going to be 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, super hot. And so we'll be looking at how the heat shield performs just to ensure that it'll be able to protect the crew for that speed and temperature. That's half as hot as the sun. Yes, it's incredibly hot. Um, so we rely on that heat shield to keep our systems and our crew safe, um, but we expect that it'll perform well, but we're excited to see how it, it does in about 26 days. Okay, uh, one last question from social media. What qualifications are required to become an astronaut? Um, you have to study STEM. You have to have a master's degree or higher in a STEM field. But besides that, we're looking for people who are awesome team players. So there's a lot of different roads to become an astronaut. We seem to be getting a lot of questions about how you, people themselves can become astronauts. I think that's really cool that we might see and inspire, again, people who might think about becoming astronauts. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you, Kayla. And thank you for those who sent in those questions. Uh, we are about 50 minutes after the launch of Artemis 1 and we are approaching uh, the next critical milestone. That's Perigee Ray's maneuver. So let's head back over to Leah in Mission Control. Thanks, Megan, and you're right. We are coming up on Perigee Ray's maneuver about two minutes from now. Uh, we are now 51 minutes into the flight of Artemis 1 after lifting off at 1.47 a.m. Eastern time from Kennedy Space Center. The vehicle now traveling over 14,600 miles per hour. So during Orion's orbit of Earth, it reaches an apogee and a perigee. The apogee is the highest point above Earth's surface and the perigee is the lowest. Therefore, this Perigee Ray's maneuver is a firing of the ICPS RL-10 engine and it's going to raise the lowest point of Orion's orbit over Earth. This also included a checkout of Orion's systems and any adjustments to the solar arrays. All four of those solar arrays, as you can see, are swept back. That's going to keep them from having any loads imparted that might damage them uh, for use later in the mission. This also, uh, the perigee rays maneuver, will put us in the proper position for the translunar injection burn. That's that really big and long burn that we need to send us to the moon. We're about one minute away from the perigee rays maneuver. This is a shorter burn. It's a less than 30 seconds. About 45 seconds until the perigee rays maneuver. Coming up on 53 minutes into today's mission, and we are standing by for the start of the perigee rays maneuver. Again, this is a firing of the RL-10 engine on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. It's less than 30 seconds long. And we have confirmation of perigee rays maneuver ignition and full thrust. This is a live view from the spacecraft. Again, a really short burn. We're standing by for the cutoff. And we have confirmation of perigee rays maneuver cutoff. 
Flight Dynamics Officer reporting on the loops here in Mission Control Houston that it was a good burn. We are now 54 minutes into the flight, Orion traveling 14,700 miles per hour, and that was the perigee raise maneuver lifting the lowest part of Orion's orbit around the Earth and putting us right where we want to be for the translunar injection burn. We're looking for that translunar injection burn to happen about one hour and 26 minutes after launch, so about 30 minutes from now. That'll be that long burn that helps us break free from the pull of Earth's gravity and commits the spacecraft to a lunar trajectory. So with successful completion of the perigee race maneuver, I'm going to toss it back to Megan at KSC. No, keep it. I hope you didn't miss it, but if you did, we have a quick replay of the launch here. Sound suppressor water now 15. flowing under the ML. And here we go. 10. Hydrogen burn off igniters initiated. 7, 6, 5, 4 stage engine start. 3, 2, 1. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis 1. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. All four RS-25 engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. Hearing good, con good control on the roll from teams in Mission Control Houston, all good calls so far. Now 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. First milestone will be for the vehicle to pass through max Q at about one minute and nine seconds into launch. This is the greatest period of atmospheric force on the rocket. SLS now traveling 607 miles per hour. You're looking at 8.8 .8 million pounds of maximum thrust quiet here in the loops and mission control. The four core stage engines are throttling down ahead of passing through. Now to celebrate Artemis 1's successful liftoff is NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. Administrator, you gotta share what you just told Kayla and I. You said that that was the biggest flame you've ever seen. That's, <laughs> that's the biggest flame I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, it's the most acoustical shock wave that I had ever experienced. We were out on the roof of the launch uh, control center and uh, I'm telling you, you definitely knew that there was some energy being expended <laughs> over there. So yeah. what does it mean to you to be the leader of our organization for a historic launch like this? We've been talking about the team it takes to get this done. How does it feel to be at the helm of that ship? Well, I got to talk to the launch control center team and I said to them, you all are a part of a great legacy that has been many, many years coming, uh, a lot of sweat and tears, uh, and uh, this legacy is now taking us as we explore the heavens. And um, it didn't end with Apollo 17, but this time we're going back and we're going to learn a lot of what we have to, and then we're going to Mars with humans. Why uh, is it such a priority for the agency to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon through this Artemis program? Well, I think it's reflective of us. It's reflective of America. Uh, we are uh, people, uh, I, our uh, Latin uh, emblem is E Pluribus Unum. In the, uh, in the chamber of the United States Senate, over that main door is E Pluribus Unum, out of many, one. And so our astronaut corps uh, reflects that. And it's going to be uh, the 
first boots back on the moon are going to be the first woman and the next man. Yeah. And uh, another goal of the Artemis program is to spur economic development. Can you talk to us about how this program has been able to do that for the country? Well, if you put it in NASA's uh, economic report terms, it's uh, billions of dollars affecting uh, the economy, almost 400,000 jobs. But that's just direct. Think of all the indirect uh, expenditures that are causing the economy to rise and more jobs. For example, what you guys are doing on the station, a lot of your research, Take, for example, the pharmaceutical research. You're helping already one drug that's uh, being manufactured on Earth better because of what you learned in space, and that drug is attacking cancer. Now, what's the value of that? That's just additional value that is right. added. I remind everybody, uh, in everybody's pocket, they've got a cell phone and that's got a camera and that's a camera on a chip that came out of the NASA space program. That's right. Absolutely. In addition to those innovative new technologies and the economic impact, I think for me seeing this launch today, it's so palpable, just that human desire to explore. What do you think about what we're doing to inspire the Artemis and the generations to follow us? Well, I think all you have to do is walk into a classroom of kids and look how their eyes get big when you start talking about space. And that is going to multiply itself many fold as we go back to the moon and then on to Mars. Uh, it's also going to bring about a new generation of engineers and mathematicians and technologists uh, and scientists and all the benefits of that additional activity and education coming out of the Artemis generation, look what that's going to do for our country and our economy as well as for our international partners. And uh, it's a great day. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself. Administrator, thank you so much for joining us for this momentous occasion. As you said, this is the beginning of a new age in space exploration. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> and Kayla, that's going to do it for us here at the host desk. Uh, launch uh, was just the first step in a nearly 26-day mission. Our colleagues in Houston will now continue the broadcast to bring you the next big milestone to the moon. From Kayla and me, have a great day and go Artemis 1. Go Artemis <laughs> Artemis. And we had a great ride to orbit today. We are now one hour and two minutes since we launched the Artemis One mission. Orion is traveling with the interim cryogenic propulsion stage now almost 15,000 miles per hour. We recently saw the perigee raise maneuver. That's where we lifted the lowest point of Orion's orbit around the Earth, and it puts us in the perfect position to prepare us for translunar injection burn coming up in about 25 minutes. So again, we are looking forward to that translunar injection burn. That's what it's going to commit us to our journey to the moon. And to tell us a little bit more about the translunar injection burn, we've got Dan Hewitt standing by to show us on the moon board how it's all going to go down. Hey, thanks, Leah. Everybody, welcome back to the moon board. So translunar injection, this is the big one. Just a refresher, we're going to be using this, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. This is what's taken over for all of our in-space propulsion maneuvers after that core stage and those boosters have since dropped away. Modified upper stage from the Delta IV family of rockets from United Launch Alliance. Hydrogen, oxygen, fueling the RL-10B-2 engine produces about 24,000 pounds of thrust in a vacuum. Now. The translunar injection is what's going to give us the energy to go from low Earth orbit all the way out here. Now, what does that mean? Here comes a really overly simplified orbital mechanics lesson. Let's say you're in orbit around a planet, say Earth, and you're in a nice circular orbit, but you want to have that orbit be even higher. 
But what you can do is fire your engine behind you, increase your speed, and that then increases the corresponding apogee or the highest point of your orbit on the other side. And that's how you raise it up. Well, if you wanted to make it into a nice circle, you could follow up and do another burn right here, and that would raise your perigee or your lowest point, and then you're in a circular orbit around Earth. That's essentially called a Hohmann transfer. If you've ever followed our missions to the space station, that's what we're doing to kind of gradually raise our orbit until we get to the space station. But for this, we're talking about a lot more energy to get somewhere a lot farther away. So what we're essentially doing is we're going to be in this circular orbit around planet Earth and we are going to be firing that engine with 24,000 pounds of thrust for about 18 minutes. And what that does is it doesn't just increase your apogee by a little, it increases it all the way out and it's timed. So by the time Orion is hitting its apogee, the highest point of that orbit, the moon will have moved into position that you're entering into its sphere of influence. You're entering into that area where the lunar gravity is going to be able to capture you. And so that's why we're firing the engine for that long. We need to have that much thrust, that much time to get the energy to go out there. So that's the rough orbital mechanics of what we're doing. Now, after that TLI burn is done, the ICPS is going to separate. Its job largely done in the Artemis 1 mission. As we heard, it's got some secondary payloads up in this uh, stage adapter here that it's going to deploy on its way out. The ICPS will have one more burn after TLI called the disposal burn. And what that's going to do is put it on a trajectory almost looking parallel to that of Orion where it's going to go around the moon, slingshot away, and then go into what's called a heliocentric orbit. It's actually going to go into orbit around the sun just like Earth. It's going to leave the Earth-Moon system completely. And then after that, all of the propulsion duties get handed over to the European Service Module. Um, so it'll be using its engines. It's going to do the outbound trajectory correction burn, at least the first one on flight day one, and a couple more until we get out to the Moon and get ready to head into distant retrograde orbit. So that's TLI. It's coming up next. It's going to be a really big moment to pay attention to, so we'll send it back over to Leah to walk us through the ops. Leah. Thanks, Dan. We are one hour, six minutes, and 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1, now traveling over 15,200 miles per hour. Again, we've recently had the perigee raise maneuver, and in less than 20 minutes now, we'll be looking for the translunar injection burn that Dan just showcased that's going to send us to the moon. But our mission started off with an epic show from the Space Launch System. Again, the Space Launch System is what carried us into orbit today, launching off at uh, 1.47 a.m. Eastern Time. And we've got a couple of special guests from Marshall Space Flight Center. We have Bruce Tiller, the Solid Rocket Booster Manager, and Johnny Heflin, the RS-25 Engine Manager, to tell us more about the maiden voyage of the rocket. Now, they both got to watch it live at Kennedy Space Center. So a big hi to you, Bruce and Johnny. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, pleasure to be here. And can you tell me a little bit about SLS performance today? Did it perform as you expected? Go ahead, Bruce. You want me to start? Go ahead. Sure. So, so I managed the booster part of the rocket, and uh, the boosters were fantastic. They performed just as we expected. Um, we got to see some of the data. Obviously, the team hadn't plotted it at all, but the pressures looked great. You know, it, it, it uh, burned for just the right amount of time, and... Uh, the, it separated great. We could see that as well. So very pleased. We were confident it would work well, and it did. Very happy. Similar story for RS-25. Nominal, what we call nominal performance. The engines performed exactly as predicted uh, based on the quick look data. Uh, like the booster, we've got a lot of data to look at, but so far the data looks really, really good. These historic RS-25s that have 25 flights between them on uh, coming off the shuttle program so really looking forward to getting a look at the data. It looks really good so far. 
That's fantastic, and we agree. It was it was amazing to monitor here, and the loops were very quiet in Mission Control Houston. That was a good sign. You knew that things were going well. Um, so we know that the launch abort system was inactive for this mission, but it will be active for when we have crew on board for Artemis II. Are there any other differences we can expect to see in the rocket for Artemis II? So for the boosters, by and large, no. If I talk about the boosters from top to bottom, we didn't. We are going to make one change, though, because the crew is on it. We're going to have a delay timer in there, so that it, if for some reason they need to abort, we have a a, a few seconds there before, um, after they abort, before the 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 termination system destroys the rocket. So we will add that. But other than that, nope. These boosters will be the same. Second flight is the first. Same story for RS-25. It will be a, a, the next set of four uh, uh, heritage engines from the shuttle program. Configuration-wise, they'll be the same as what we flew today. Then I'm glad it all went so well. And so after you get that data back from today, what's next for your team? Well, for my team, we've still got a ton of work to do. We're, we're not only, I mean, we're working on at least three flight sets at the same time, uh, and so we've, We've got two and three and four to work on. Um, we also are working on a new booster that's a composite case design that will replace this steel case version that we're flying today. So, so we're excited about that, and there's a lot, of, a lot of work going on there as well. So we've got a lot to do, and we'll just keep doing it. So RS-25, super busy as well. We have the Artemis II engines have already been delivered to MAF. And they're on, on schedule to be installed in the Artemis II core stage in mid-January. Uh, we're also about to start the certification test series for the new RS-25 engines that we're building. We have heritage engines for the first four flights. Beyond that, coming in on Artemis V, we will fly what we call the RS-25 restart engines that have been redesigned uh, to reduce cost and reestablish manufacturing for future flights. So we're really excited to get into that certification test series really soon as well. All right, well, thank you both so much again for joining us. I'm glad that you got to watch the launch and a major congratulations to you and your teams for all of the effort that you've poured into this. Go Artemis. Thank Great you. day. Great, Great day. day. Thank Fantastic. you so much. All right, and we are now one hour and 12 minutes into the flight of Artemis One. We are uh, traveling at orbital velocity. Again, Orion is currently attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, which recently performed the perigee raise maneuver. And we are standing by for translunar injection burn, now less than 15 minutes away. It's gonna be about an 18 minute burn that will commit us to the moon. Part of the Artemis program's goal is to inspire the next generation of dreamers and explorers. So we want to show you what students are doing right now to bring the Artemis missions to life. NASA's Artemis mission will land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And today's students are the Artemis generation. If you're a student, you can design and build technologies that support the Artemis mission with NASA's Artemis Student Challenges. No matter your background or experience, you're invited to choose a challenge that interests you, whether it's rockets, robots, tools, software, vehicles, or other technologies, there's an exciting challenge for you. To find a mentor and build a team of students. Review the rules and requirements. And bring your ideas to life with NASA's Artemis Student Challenges. Visit stem.nasa.gov slash Artemis and see how you can join one of NASA's mission-related student challenges. Again, one 
hour and 13 minutes, 30 seconds since liftoff today. We are looking towards translunar injection burn now about 13 minutes away. That's going to send us to the moon. But did you know that you were invited to fly on the first Artemis mission too? Earlier this year, NASA asked the public to create a pass to virtually board Orion. Anyone who signed up got to include their name on a flash drive. I know my name is on there. And that flash drive is on Orion right now for its journey around the moon. It has more than 3.3 million names. The Orion spacecraft is designed to carry four crew members to lunar orbit, which we're preparing for on Artemis II. NASA astronaut Randy Bresnik brought us through the hatch of the vehicle to show us where those future crew members will live and work during their journey. This is the Orion crew station, where the crew will be when they fly the vehicle. As you can see, the commander seat is on the left, the pilot seat is on the right. Compared to the space shuttle, which had over 1,200 switches, controls, and circuit breakers, Artemis astronauts will have much less, only about 63. Inside, the crew of four can live and work for up to 21 days at a time, which is several days longer than the previous crewed Apollo missions to the moon. The interior is about 30% larger than those Apollo-era capsules to give more crew living and working space. Everything crew needs is packed right under the floor, thanks to the Orion stowage system. Under these panels is space for everything ranging from food, clothing, sleeping bags, to science and camera equipment, and even the tools necessary to perform repairs if required. On the upper part of the crew compartment, or what we call the overhead, is the docking compartment, a crucial component to future exploration. It allows crews to dock the Orion capsule to Gateway, NASA's next generation lunar outpost. Once they dock, crews will have the ability to board the lunar landers also attached to the Gateway and then head down to the surface of the moon. Through these windows, the four crew members will have amazing front row seats of their journey to and from the moon. Do you remember Apollo 8 and Bill Anders' famous photo of Earthrise as they came around the moon and saw it for the first time? Imagine being one of those first crew members on Orion having their own modern day Earthrise and knowing they are traveling farther from Earth than humans have ever traveled before. Thanks to thousands of people from across the country and around the world who have helped with the research, design, construction, testing, and more testing. My fellow astronauts and I know that whoever gets selected for future Artemis missions, they're gonna have the journey of a lifetime on board the spectacular vehicle we call Orion. We're now coming up on 10 minutes until the translunar injection burn. Again, Orion is still attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. That RL-10 engine is what's going to perform the burn for us. But to hear more about Orion, I'm going to send it back to Dan at the moon board to tell us all about our spacecraft. Hey, thanks, Leah. Welcome back to the moon board and Orion. So it's still attached to ICPS, still flying on the very upper part of SLS, but pretty soon it's going to be flying free. And after that happens, it's going to take over all of the propulsion, all of the flying, everything for the rest of the mission. And so to talk a little bit more about propulsion, let's focus in on this, the European service module. So this is what's going to be doing all of our maneuvers after we're done with ICPS and that translunar injection burn. And it's going to be doing that with a mix of three different types of engines. First one here on the bottom is the large orbital maneuvering system engine. This one produces about 6,000 pounds of thrust. That's going to be doing a lot of your really major pushing maneuvers when we get into uh, the powered flybys, the insertion into distant retrograde orbit, the burns to start sending us back home. That's the one that's really applying the most force. It can also gimbal, uh, which essentially means it can swivel around and that can help your steering. It's helped out by these eight auxiliary thrusters. They're in pairs. Those are a little bit smaller. Each one of those produces about 105 pounds of thrust each, but they add some additional push to that uh, orbital maneuvering system engine. And then we also have 24 reaction control system thrusters, these smaller ones that you can see all around Orion. Those are used for a lot of attitude control, so again, which they can help which way you're pointing, uh, but also small translational maneuvers, uh, so moving side to side, up, down, those can be called into play. Now, all of those engines share a common fuel source. They're using what are called hypergolic fuels, a mix of a fuel and an oxidizer, in this case, monomethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. 
Now those are long names and they're hypergolic fuels. What does that mean? A hypergolic fuel essentially means you take your fuel and your oxidizer, you put them together, you get a reaction. You get an exothermic reaction which creates that thrust which comes out. You don't need an ignition source like we have on SLS which is using oxygen and hydrogen. They're extremely reliable. They're very stable. You don't have to store them at cryogenic temperatures which is really necessary for smaller spacecraft in orbit because it takes a tremendous amount of electrical energy just to keep fuels that cold. And so we can store them at a much uh, closer to room temperature essentially uh, when they're on board this spacecraft. So that's all of the primary propulsion that's gonna take over. And again, that's gonna be after we get through translunar injection, we're gonna be doing correction burns on the way out, a number around the moon as we hang out in distant retrograde orbit for about a week, and then eventually sending us on the way back home. But still attached to ICPS right now, gonna detach shortly after that burn is complete. Uh, and then Orion will be flying free, the service module pushing it for the rest of the way. So with that, I'll send it back over to Leah as we get closer to that TLI burn. Thank you, Dan. And yes, indeed, we are looking for TLI coming up in about seven minutes from now. Again, that's one of a long, that's a long burn for us, about 18 minutes long. But before we get to that milestone, I have a friend of mine here. It's Stu McClung, the Program Planning and Control Office Chief of Staff for the Orion Program. Stu, I am so glad that you could join us today. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Good to be here. So how is the spacecraft performing so far and what's next? So, so far, so well. Uh, good. Uh, we had good, we were clean during the uh, pre-launch and uh, ascent so um, the teams down the hall in the mer taking a look working everything um, it looks good so far so that's good and of course uh, you know we got the burn couple um, after the burn we'll start we'll start ticking through all of our planned events um, like we have a solar the the saw uh, modal survey solar the wings will have a modal survey that we'll do later this morning one of the mate one of the first DTOs that we'll take a look at and evaluate how they how they react so DTO designated test objective what are maybe an, what's another one of those that we'll be looking at over the next 26 days oh uh, we have probably a good hundred of them uh, they you know culminate from um, everything from like the modal survey to how the um, the, the, the cooling system uh, behaves common track system uh, on entry day um, one of our major test objectives is looking at how the heat shield and the, uh, how it handles entry heating so how does it feel to be here today and see the future of human space exploration unfold um, it's great. Um, I was, I was doing my, doing my shift in the mirror earlier today. Um, haven't slept. The the emotion and the the adrenaline's got me going. Um, it's great to be a part of this. Uh, it was great watching, you know, like watching the the KSC team execute. And uh, now it's this is day one for us. You know, we've got 26 days for our team to execute now, and uh, and we'll go do our job and uh, you know set the stage for future Artemis. Uh, exploration. And we're excited. We're going to be here along the way for all those major milestones, burns, uh, all the other exciting events that we are looking forward to. So thank you so much for joining us here. Um, we are really excited. A big congrats to you and your team. Thanks. Let's go have a good burn and let's go to the moon. Let's do it. We are now uh, less than five minutes away from the translunar injection burn. Again, this is the burn that's going to send us around the moon going to commit us to a lunar trajectory. Um, it is approximately an 18-minute burn. It's a firing of that RL-10 engine on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. You've got a view here of the white flight control room in Mission Control Houston. This is where all of the teams will be monitoring the mission over the next 26 days. Teams monitored launch tonight. There are, of course, several uh, different shifts that'll be working here.
All right, we are coming up now on about three minutes until the translunar injection burn. Again, this is about an 18 minute long burn firing of the RL-10 engine on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage commits us to uh, lunar trajectory. It helps us break free from the gravitational pull of Earth. In case you missed it, in June of this year, we launched Capstone, a small satellite launched from New Zealand designated to designed to test a uh, lo unique lunar orbit for our future space station around the moon called Gateway. And just two days ago, Capstone arrived at its intended orbit around the moon. So we're very excited for that milestone. It really helps pave the way for our future Artemis missions. We are now one hour 20, coming up on 25 minutes since liftoff from Kennedy Space Center today at 1.47 a.m. Eastern Time. We had a really smooth ride to orbit. We saw solar, uh, we saw um, solid rocket booster jettison as well as launch abort system jettison. Eventually, we had core stage separation, which put us in the configuration that we have now with Orion connected to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage and flying free. The solar arrays deployed and have been swept back in preparation for the translunar injection burn. Earlier, we had the perigee rays maneuver, which lifted the lowest part of Orion's orbit around the Earth, put us in this perfect positioning ahead of translunar injection burn. A good shot here of our two flight controllers. On the left, you saw uh, Judd Freeling. He is the ascent flight controller. He's been with his team here for the last several hours. And to his right is Rick Labrode. He's the lead flight controller for a majority of the rest of the mission. Judd's team will take over again once we get back into the reentry portion. We're now less than a minute away from translunar injection burn. And this is a live view from the spacecraft. Australia towards the Pacific Ocean. This translunar injection burn We'll begin to take it away from the Earth, breaking it free from the pull of gravity. We're standing by for confirmation that the burn has started. We have confirmation from the booster officer that the translunar injection burn has begun and that we are at max. Maximum thrust. Again, this is a long burn, about 18 minutes, 1960s, and it's a proven reliable engine. This single engine has 25,000 pounds of thrust. Thrust. We've already seen the ICPS in action today as it powered the parity, the uh, sun. Sunset of the Earth. This is the closest Orion will be to the Earth until it becomes.
begins its return home from the moon. I'm going to keep reporting that number. And by the end of the train, um, gravity now traveling at 17,000. There are other burns that will take place throughout the mission to direct Orion exactly where we want it to PS separates will be conducted by using the single main engine. Coming up on two and a half minutes into the translunar injection burn. And we're now traveling over 18,000 miles per hour. Again, that speed is going to increase as well. This is really going to push Orion toward the moon. And we are now 252,400 miles away from the moon. And they include the Lunar Ice Cube, developed by Moorhead State University in Kentucky. This will search for all forms of water with an infrared spectrometer. Luna Map from Arizona State University will create higher fidelity maps of near-surface hydrogen in craters and other permanently shadowed study the lunar environment. And Lunar by Lockheed Martin in Colorado will perform advanced infrared imaging of the lunar surface. Now three and a half minutes into the translunar injection burn. Again, it's about an 18-minute burn, traveling 18,560 miles per hour. Quiet on the loops here in Mission Control as the RL-10 engine continues doing its job on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. We talked about a few of our CubeSats. We also have one preparing to study an asteroid. The Near Earth Asteroid Scout, or NIA Scout, by Marshall Space Flight Center in Alabama will travel by solar sail to a Near Earth asteroid to take pictures of and make other characterizations of its surface. There's a CubeSat on board studying Earth called Equulius by the University of Tokyo, along with JAXA in Japan. Equulius stands for Equilibrium Lunar Earth Point 6U spacecraft and will travel to Lagrange Point 2, imaging Earth's plasmosphere for a better understanding of our planet's radiation environment. We're now coming up on four minutes and 45 seconds into the translunar injection burn. Orion traveling at 18,982 miles per hour. Our distance from the moon continues to decrease, now 251,900 miles away. To highlight some more of our CubeSats on board, we also have BioSentinel, developed by Ames Research Center in California, and we'll use a single yeast cell to detect, measure, and compare the impact of deep space radiation on living organisms over an extended period of time. Argo Moon was developed by the Italian Space Agency and ArgoTech in Italy. This CubeSat will observe the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, the stage that it's firing right now with its advanced optics and software imaging system. And our last CubeSat through the Centennial Challenge is Team Miles from Florida, who developed a CubeSat that will demonstrate propulsion using plasma thrusters and will compete in NASA's Deep Space Derby. These CubeSats pack a ton of tech and science in a tiny package, so they don't all have redundant systems. And if any of the CubeSats missions don't go as planned, it does not affect our primary objectives of Orion's mission. This rideshare opportunity is a rare chance to send CubeSats beyond low Earth orbit, and we're looking forward to seeing what we learn. We're now six minutes into the translunar injection burn. Orion traveling at 19,500 miles per hour, being propelled by the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. Still quiet here on the loops in Mission Control Houston. Teams are tracking no issues during the translunar injection burn. Again, this is about an 18 minute burn, so we have approximately 11 and a half minutes left. It's also been one hour and 33 minutes since liftoff today from Kennedy Space Center. That was a 1.47 a.m. Eastern Time launch. 
a smooth ride uphill, as we heard from Bruce Tiller and Johnny Heflin working with SLS at Marshall Space Flight Center. And this view from Mission Control Houston, teams continuing to monitor the Artemis One mission. This is where they will be around the clock for the next 26 days, all the way until we bring Orion home for a safe splashdown. Coming up on seven and a half minutes until into the translunar injection burn, so less than 11 minutes left in the burn. Orion now traveling at almost 20,000 miles per hour, 251,237 miles away from the moon. Again, that number continuing to shrink. Orion itself is still over Earth. It is over the Pacific Ocean, south of Hawaii. As we've mentioned in today's coverage, multiple countries are represented in Artemis One through the SLS Orion and European Service Module, as well as the payloads riding along. While NASA is leading the Artemis missions, international partnerships will play a key role in achieving a sustainable presence on the moon while preparing to send humans to Mars. In 2021, over a dozen countries signed the Artemis Accords, which will establish a common set of principles to govern the civil exploration and use of outer space. The Artemis Accords will create a safe, transparent environment that facilitates exploration, science, and commercial activities for all of humanity. This cooperation not only furthers space exploration, but also enhances peaceful relationships between countries on Earth. We're now over nine minutes into the translunar injection burn, an 18-minute burn, so we have about nine minutes left. We're about halfway through. The RL-10 engine continues to fire at maximum thrust. Orion traveling attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage now over 20,600 miles per hour. It's been one hour and 37 minutes since we launched today. Again, that was 1.47 a.m. Eastern Time from Kennedy Space Center. Orion is still attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. This is the last burn for the interim cryogenic propulsion stage while attached to Orion. It will also have a disposal burn later on. About 10 minutes after we have ICPS cutoff, Orion will separate from the interim cryogenic propulsion stage itself, and the capsule will be flying free, still attached to the European service module. We've got about seven minutes left in the translunar injection burn. Orion traveling now at over 21,000 miles per hour.
the RL-10 engine continues to fire on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, powering the translunar injection burn. This is the second firing of the trans or of the ICPS uh, today. The first we saw was the perigee raise maneuver, which lifted the lowest point of Orion's orbit around the Earth and put it in the proper positioning for this burn. This is the burn that commits us to the moon. We're now t over 12 minutes into this burn. Again, it's about an 18-minute burn, so less than six minutes left, and one hour, 39 minutes since we launched. Orion and the ICPS now traveling at over 21,400 miles per hour. And as I promised, we continue to grow closer to the moon, now 249,000 miles away. Now over 13 minutes into the translunar injection burn, putting us less than five minutes away from cutoff. We have had a nominal burn so far. That RL-10 engine continues to fire at maximum thrust, 25,000 pounds of thrust. We're now traveling over 21,730 miles per hour. And we've just heard the call for priority one, meaning we have reached the uh, point at which we could return at lunar return or similar speeds, testing the heat shield as required ahead of flight for Artemis II. Now over 14 minutes into the translunar injection burn, less than four minutes until cutoff, traveling now at over 21,900 miles per hour. Now less than three minutes away from cutoff of the interim cryogenic propulsion stage and coming up on one hour and 42 minutes into the Artemis One mission. The RL-10 engine on the interim cryogenic propulsion stage continues to fire as planned at maximum thrust. Again, this is about an 18 minute burn. That's uh, about twice as long as the ride to orbit today. So that just shows how much power we need to break free from the pull of Earth and take us to the moon. Sixteen minutes now into the translunar injection burn, Orion traveling at over 22,276 miles per hour. About a minute and a half now until cutoff of the interim cryogenic propulsion stage. Again, this being an 18 minute burn. We are now 248,280 miles away from the moon and continuing to grow closer, 605 miles away from Earth and continuing to increase that distance.
less than a minute now until cutoff of the ICPS and the end of the translunar injection burn. We've had a good burn all the way through so far. And one hour, 44 minutes since launch today. And we have cutoff of the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, which has committed Orion to the translunar conjection. The spacecraft is moon bound. Orion is now traveling at 22,500 miles per hour, 247,450 miles away from Earth. Now that the interim cryogenic propulsion stage has completed its translunar injection burn, it is no longer needed to propel us to the moon. It's done its job and it will separate from Orion. After it separates, those 10 CubeSats we discussed will be deployed from the Orion stage adapter, which is below the service module and above the ICPS. Each payload will be ejected with a spring mechanism from dispensers installed on the Orion stage adapter. And again, these will help us study the moon and space weather, test innovative propulsion technology, Technologies, analyze the effects of radiation on organisms and provide high resolution imagery of the Earth and Moon. The CubeSat deploys will st start just short of about four hours after launch. Once those CubeSats are deployed, the ICPS will be on track for disposal in a heliocentric orbit, meaning it will closely circle the Sun until destroyed. The next change we'll see is for the ICPS to separate from Orion and the service module. Those will continue flying free on their journey toward the moon. It's now been an hour, 47 minutes, and 30 seconds into the first flight of the Artemis program. Orion now traveling 21,860 miles per hour, 1,129 miles away from Earth. That stage separation from the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, again, uh, should be about 10 minutes after the translunar injection burn is complete, so approximately seven minutes from now. Shortly after ICPS separation, Orion's service module will fire its auxiliary thrusters to move the spacecraft a safe distance away from the expended stage. Orion continues on an outbound path to the moon, and the Orion stage adapter attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage will deliver several small payloads over several deployments.
We're now over one hour, 51 minutes since launch today from the uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Orion is traveling attached to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, but not for much longer. We look for that separation to happen in about five minutes. At that point, Orion will still be flying attached to the service module. And in this animation, you can see the service module directly below the capsule. Those solar array wings are deployed. The spacecraft now traveling over 20,570 miles per hour, continuing to gr increase its distance from Earth, now over 1,780 miles away, continuing to decrease its distance from the moon, 245,150 miles away. Hearing confirmation from teams here in Mission Control Houston that the solar arrays are in their proper configuration for interim cryogenic propulsion stage separation. Again, we just saw the translunar injection burn, a successful approximately 18-minute burn that has helped Orion break free from the pull of Earth's gravity and sending us toward the moon. We're now standing by for separation from that stage now that it has done its job for Orion. However, it still has a job to do. It will help... Uh, eject some CubeSats that will help us study the moon, Earth, and the space environment. Orion now traveling at 19,700 miles per hour, 2,270 miles away from Earth. We're expecting that stage separation to happen in about a minute. As you can see, we have confirmation of interim cryogenic propulsion stage from Orion. With the Earth in the background and the moon is our destination, Artemis generation, we are going.
It's been one hour, 57 minutes and 40 seconds since Orion launched atop the SLS from Kennedy Space Center in Florida at 1.47 a.m. Eastern Time. After a smooth ride to orbit, a perigee raise maneuver and a translunar injection burn conducted by the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, Orion is now flying free, attached to the European service module and on its journey to the moon. That might be the end of today's broadcast, but the Artemis One mission has only just begun. We'll continue live coverage for major milestones, including the outbound powered flyby and other major burns. But when we're not live, you can check out blogs.nasa.gov slash Artemis and the NASA newsletter for updates on the spacecraft. We're also excited to introduce Artemis All Access. It's a short video product uh, that will provide updates about mission accomplishments with a look at what's to come as well as inside looks and explainers about the mission. And if you want to stay updated on mission activities and how to watch Splashdown, you can still register as an online mission participant with NASA's virtual guest program to stay informed as the mission progresses. Virtual mission participants for Artemis One will receive curated resource and mission activities straight to their inbox. You can register at go.nasa.gov slash virtual Artemis One. That's a Roman numeral one as part of the URL. Don't forget, you can also learn about the mission on NASA and Artemis social media accounts. We'll be holding a post-launch news conference at Kennedy Space Center at 5 a.m. Eastern Time, 4 a.m. Central Time, and you can watch live at nasa.gov slash live. We'll also be back on the air later today for the first orbital trajectory correction burn at 9 a.m. Eastern Time, and again at 10.45 a.m. Eastern to get a look at the first images coming down from Orion. Thank you for joining us today for our coverage of the Artemis One mission. We leave you now with a rendition of our national anthem performed by Josh Robin and jazz pianist Herbie Hancock, followed by a look back on today's historic liftoff as we look toward every milestone in this mission. Artemis Generation, we are going.
sound suppressor water now 15. flowing under the ML. And here we go. Ten. Hydrogen burnoff igniters initiate. Seven, six, five, four stage engine start. Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. All four RS-25 engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. Hearing good, con good control on the roll from teams in Mission Control Houston. All good calls so far. Now 30 seconds into the flight of Artemis 1. First milestone will be forward the vehicle to pass through max Q at about 1 minute and 9 seconds into launch. This is the greatest period of atmospheric force on the rocket.